Volume One, Chapter One of A Strange World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Céline Major. A Strange World by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. One, four players a fair slope of land in buttercup time just when may the capricious melts into tender june a slope of fertile pasture within two miles of the city of ebersham whose cathedral towers rise tall in the blue dim distance a wealth of hedgerow flowers on every side and all the air full of their faint sweet perfume mixed with odorous breath of the fast perishing hawthorn two figures are seated in a corner of the meadow beneath the umbrage of an ancient thorn not arcadian or pastoral figures by any means not phyllis the milkmaid with sun-browned brow and carnation cheeks not corridan fluting sweetly on his tuneful pipe as he reclines at her feet but two figures which carry the unmistakable stamp of city life in every feature and every garment one is a tall slender girl of seventeen with a pale tired face and a look of having outgrown her strength shot up too swiftly from childhood to girlhood like a fast-growing weed the other is a man who may be any age from forty to sixty a man with sparse grey hair crowning a high forehead bluish grey eyes under thick dark brows a red nose a mouth that looks as if it had been made for eating and drinking rather than oratory a heavy jaw and a figure inclining to corpulence the girl's eyes are large and clear and changeful of that dark blue-grey which often looks like black the delicate young face possesses no other strong claim to be admired and would be a scarcely noticeable countenance perhaps save for those grey eyes the raiment of both man and girl is of the shabbiest his threadbare coat has become luminous with much friction a kind of phosphorescent brightness pervades the sleeves like the oleaginous scum that pollutes the surface of a city river the tall hat which lies beside him in the deep grass has a look of having been soaped his boots have obviously been soled and heeled and have arrived at that debatable period in boot life when they must either be soled again or hie them straight to the dust-hole the girl's gown is faded and too short for her long legs her mantle a flimsy silken thing of an almost forgotten fashion her hat a fabric of tawdry net and ribbon patched together by her own unskilled hands she sits with her lap full of bluebells and hawthorn looking absently at the landscape with those solemn towers rising out of the valley how grand they are father the father is agreeably occupied in filling a cutty pipe and browned by much smoking which he handles fondly as if it were a sentient thing what's grand the cathedral towers i could look at them for hours together with that wide blue sky above them and the streets and houses clustering at their feet there's a bird's nest in one of them oh so high up squeezed behind a horrid grinning face do you know father i've stood and looked at it sometimes till i've strained my eyes with looking and i've wished i was a bird in that nest and to live up there in the cool shadow of the stone no care no trouble no work and all that blue sky above me for ever and ever the sky isn't always blue stupid answered the father contemptuously your bird's nest would be a nice place in stormy weather you talk like a fool justina with your towers and nests and blue skies and you're getting a young woman now and ought to have some sense as for cathedral towns for my part i've never believed in em never saw good business for a fortnight on end in a cathedral town it's all very well for a race week or you may pull up with a military bespeak if there's a garrison but in a general way as far as the profession goes your cathedral town is a dead failure i wasn't thinking of the theatre father said the girl with a contemptuous shrug of her thin shoulders i hate the theatre and everything belonging to it there's a nice young woman to quarrel with your bread and butter bread and ashes i think father she said looking downward at the flowers with a moody face it tastes bitter enough for that did ever any one hear of such discontent ejaculated the father lifting his eyes towards the heavens as if invoking jove himself as a witness of his child's depravity to go and run down the pro hasn't the pro nourished you and brought you up and maintained you since you were no higher than that he spread his dingy hand a foot or so above the buttercups to illustrate his remark 
the pro of which she spoke with so fond an air was the calling of an actor and this elderly gentleman in threadbare raiment was mr matthew elgood a performer of that particular line of dramatic business known in his own circle as the first heavies or in less technical phrase mr elgood was the heavy man the king in hamlet iago friar lawrence the robber chief of melodrama the relentless father of the ponderous top booted and pigtailed comedy and justina elgood his seventeen-year-old daughter commonly called judy was she juliet or desdemona ophelia or imogene no miss elgood had not yet soared above the humblest drudgery her line was general utility in which she worked with the unrequited patience of an east end shirt-maker hasn't the pro supported you from the cradle growled mr elgood between short thoughtful puffs at his pipe had i ever a cradle father the girl demanded wonderingly if you were always moving about then as you are now a cradle must have been a great inconvenience i've a sort of recollection of seeing you in one for all that replied mr elgood shutting his eyes with a meditating air as if he were casting his gaze back into the past a clumsy edifice of straw bulky and awkward of shape it might have held properties pretty well but i don't remember travelling with it i dare say your mother borrowed the thing of her landlady in the days of your infancy we were at slowberry in somersetshire and the slowberry people are uncommonly friendly i make no doubt your mother borrowed it i dare say father we're great people for borrowing why not asked mr elgood lightly give and take you know judy that's a christian sentiment yes father but we always take man is the slave of circumstances my dear give to him that asketh thee and from him that would borrow of thee turn not away that's the gospel justina if i have been rather in the position of the borrower than the lender that has been my misfortune and not my fault had i been the possessor of ten thousand per annum i would have been the last of men to refuse to take a box-ticket for a fellow-creature's benefit the girl gave a faint sigh and began to arrange the bluebells and hawthorn into a nosegay somewhat listlessly as if even her natural joy in these things were clouded by a settled gloom within her mind you're in the first piece aren't you judy inquired matthew elgood after indulging himself with a snatch of slumber his elbow deep in the buttercups and his head rested on his hand yes father with a sigh the countess you know the countess in the stranger a most profitable part don't put on that hat and feather you wore last time we played the piece it made the gallery laugh i wonder whether you'll ever be fit for the juvenile lead judy he went on meditatively do you know sometimes i am afraid you never will you're so gawky and so listless the gawkiness would be nothing you'll get over that when you've done growing i dare say but your heart is not in your profession justina there's the rub my heart in it echoed the girl with a dreary laugh why i hate it father you must know that hasn't it kept me ignorant and shabby and looked down upon all the days of my life since i was two years old and went on as the child in pizarro hasn't it kept me hanging about the wings till midnight from year's end to year's end when other children were snug in bed with a mother to look after them haven't i been told often enough that i have no talents and no good looks to help me and that i must be a drudge all my life no good looks well i'm not so sure about that said the father thoughtfully talent i admit you are deficient of judy but your looks even now are by no means despicable and will improve with time you have a fine pair of eyes and a complexion that lights up uncommonly well i have seen leading ladies earning their three to four guineas a week with less personal advantages i wish i could earn a good salary father for your sake but i should never be fond of acting i've seen too much of the theatre if i'd been a young lady now shut up in a drawing-room all my life and brought to the theatre for the first time to see romeo and juliet i could fancy myself wanting to play juliet but i've seen too much of the ladder juliet stands on on the balcony scene and the dirty-looking man that holds it steady for her and the way she quarrels with mrs whoppers the nurse between the acts i've read the play often father since you've told me to study juliet and i've tried to fancy her a real living woman in verona under a cloudless sky as blue as these flowers but i can't 
i can only think of miss vilroy in her whitey brown satin and mrs whoppers in her old green and yellow brocade and the battered old garden scene and the palace flats we use so often and the scene shifters in their dirty shirt sleeves all the poetry has been taken out of it for me father that's because yours is a commonplace mind child answered mr elgood with a superior air look at me now if i feel as dull as ditchwater when i go on the stage the first hearty round of applause kindles the poetic fire and the second fans it into a blaze the divine afflatus judy that's what you want the afflatus i suppose you mean applause father i know i don't get much of that no justina i mean the breath of the gods the sacred wind which breathes from the nostrils of genius which gives life and shape to the imaginings of the dramatic poet which inspires a keen and occasionally an elgood i suppose you didn't hear of their encoring my exit in iago on tuesday night yes father i heard of it come judy we must be going said mr elgood raising himself from his luxurious repose among the buttercups after looking at a battered silver watch it's past four and we've a good two miles to walk before we get our teas oh how i wish we could stay here just as long as we like and then go quietly home in the starlight to some cottage among those trees over there cottages among trees are proverbially damp and the kind of existence you talk of mooning about a meadow and going home to a cottage would be intolerably dull for a man with any pretension to intellect oh father we might have books and music and flowers and birds and animals and a few friends perhaps who would like us and respect us if we were not on stage i don't think we need be dull the varied pages of this busy world comprise the only book i care to study justina as for birds flowers and animals i consider them alike messy and unprofitable i never knew a man who had a pet dog come to much good it's a sign of a weak mind they were both standing by this time looking across the verdant undulating landscape to the valley where nestled the city of ebersham the roofs and pinnacles did not seem far off but there was that intervening sea of meadowland about the navigation whereof these wanderers began to feel somewhat uncertain do you know your way home judy the girl looked across the meadows doubtfully i'm not quite sure father but i fancy we came across that field over there where there's such a lot of sorrel fancy be hanged exclaimed mr elgood impatiently i've got to be on the stage at half-past seven o'clock and you lead me astray in this confounded solitary place to suit your childish whims and don't know how to get me back it would be a nice thing if i were to lose a week's salary through your tomfoolery no fear of that father we shall find our way back somehow depend upon it why we can't go very far astray when we can see the cathedral towers yes and we might wander about in sight of them from now till midnight without getting any nearer to em you ought to have known better justina justina hung her head abashed by this stern reproof i dare say somebody will come by presently father and we can ask do you dare say then i don't dare say anything of the sort we've been sitting in this blessed meadow full two hours without seeing a mortal except a solitary ploughboy who went across with a can of something half an hour ago beer most likely i know the sight of it made me abominably thirsty and according to the doctrine of averages there's no chance of another human being for the next hour never you ask me to come for a walk with you again justina after being trapped in this manner look father there's some one cried justina some too said mr elgood swells by the cut of their jibs down for the races i dare say ebersham was a city which had its two brief seasons of glory every year the ebersham spring and the ebersham summer were meetings famous in the sporting world but the spring to the summer was as omega to alpha in the sidereal heavens or taking a more earthly standard of magnitude while beds for the accommodation of visitors were freely offered at half a crown during the spring meeting the poorest pallet on hire in ebersham was worth half a guinea in the summer the strangers approached at a leisurely pace two men in the springtime of their youth clothed in grey one tall strong of limb broad of chest somewhat slovenly of attire loose cravat grey felt hat stout sportsmanlike boots fishing-rod under his arm 
the other shorter slighter smaller dressed with a certain girlish prettiness and neatness that smacked of eton both were smoking as they came slowly strolling along the field path on the other side of the irregular hawthorn hedge the younger and smaller held a paper cigarette between his girlish lips the other smoked a black muzzled clay which would not have been out of keeping with the costume and bearing of an irish navvy they came to a gap in the hedge which brought them close to the strollers gentlemen can you enlighten me as to the nearest way to ebersham asked mr elgood with a grandiose air which the prolonged exercise of his avocation had made second nature the elder of the strangers stared at him blankly with that unseeing gaze of the deep thinker and went on pulling at his blackened pipe the younger smiled kindly and made haste to answer with a shy eagerness just a little stammer in his speech at first which was not unpleasing i am really at a loss to direct you he said we are strangers here ourselves only came to ebersham last night for the races i opine interrupted mr elgood not exactly for the races replied the young man doubtfully you came for the races jim said the taller stranger looking down at his companion as from an altitude of wisdom and experience i came to see that you were not fleeced there are no rogues like the rogues that haunt a race-course this with a dark glance at the actor he looks the image of a tout thought the tall stranger his fancies had been up aloft in his own particular cloudland when the wayfarers accosted him and he was slowly coming down to the level of a workaday life only this instant had he become conscious of the girl's presence justina stood in the shadow of her father's bulky figure making herself as narrow as she possibly could her detractors in the theatre found fault with that narrowness of justina's she had been disadvantageously likened to gas pipes maypoles and other unsubstantial objects and was considered a mere profile of a girl an outline sketch only worth half the salary that might have been given to a plumper damsel good heavens elgood the manager had exclaimed once when justina played a page when will your daughter begin to have legs the tall stranger's slow gaze had now descended upon justina to that bashful maiden conscious of her gawkiness the darkly bright eyes seemed awful as the front of jove himself she shrank behind her father dazzled as if by a sunburst there was such power in maurice clissold's face we came here anyhow following the windings of yonder trout stream said clissold with a backward glance at the valley i haven't the faintest notion how we are to get back except by turning our noses to the cathedral and then following them religiously we can hardly fail to get there sooner or later if we are true to our noses justina began to laugh as if it had been a green-room jokelet and then checked herself blushing vehemently she felt it was taking a liberty to be amused by this tall stranger perhaps time is no object to you sir said mr elgood not the slightest i don't think time ever has been any object to me except when i was gated at oxford replied clissold to me sir it is vital if i do not reach yon city before the clock strikes seven the prospects of a struggling commonwealth are blighted father remonstrated the girl plucking his sleeve what do these gentlemen know about commonwealths i have studied the subject but superficially in the pages of our friend cicero said clissold lightly modern scholars call him cicero but your elder erudition might hardly accept the kappa the commonwealth to which i allude sir is a company of actors now performing on their own hook at the theatre royal ebersham if i am not on the stage before eight o'clock to-night our chances in that town are gone the provincial public having paid its shillings and sixpences will not brook disappointment you will hardly credit the fact perhaps sir but there are seven places taken in the dress circle paid in advance sir further secured by a donation to the box-keeper for this evening's performance conceive the feelings of those seven dress circles sir if matthew elgood is conspicuous by his absence that must not be sir returned maurice clissold gravely pedestrian wanderings have somewhat developed my organ of locality and if you like to trust yourself to my guidance i will do my best to navigate you in the desired direction is that young lady also required by the british public yes responded elgood indifferently she's in the first piece but we might send a ballet girl on for her part if as an afterthought we had any ballet 
the numerical strength of your commonwealth is limited i infer from your remark observed clissold as the stroller stepped through the gap in the hedge and joined those other strollers in the lane well sir lead on i follow thee when a manager puts it to his company roundly that he must either make it a commonwealth or shut up shop altogether the little people are generally the first to fall away the little people yes sir second walking gentleman ditto lady second chambermaid general utility second old man proverbially duffing and ballet the little people lack that confidence in their own genius which sustains a man under the fluctuations of a commonwealth they want the afflatus and when the ghost walks not the ghost in vulgar english when there is no treasury no reliable weekly stipend the little people collapse the second walking lady and chambermaid go home to their mothers the second old man opens a sweetstuff shop they fade and vanish from a profession they did nothing to adorn what is a commonwealth asked the younger gentleman interested by this glimpse of a strange world in a theatrical sense added clissold a theatrical commonwealth is a body without a head there is no responsible lessee the weekly funds are divided into so many shares each share representing half a sovereign the actor whose nominal salary is two pound ten takes five shares the actor whose ordinary pay is fifteen shillings claims but a share and a half and has his claim allowed i have known the shares to rise to fourteen and nine pence half penny i have seen them dwindle to one and seven pence thanks for the explanation does prosperity attend you in ebersham sir our receipts heretofore have been but middling our anchor of hope is the spring meeting which begins as you are doubtless aware to-morrow do you remain here long asked mr penwin the younger pedestrian a fortnight at most our next engagement is duffield thence we proceed to humberston then slingerford after which we separate to seek fresh woods and pastures new mr penwin looked at the vagabond wonderingly the man spoke so lightly of his fortuitous life james penwin of penwin manor cornwall had been brought up like the danish princess who discovered the presence of the pea under seven feather beds and seven mattresses he had never been inconvenienced in his life and this encounter with a fellow creature who anatomically resembled himself and yet belonged to a world so wide apart from his world at once interested and amused him he pitied the stroller with a serio-comic pity as he might have compassionated an octopus in an uncomfortable position perhaps there was never in this world a better-natured youth than this james penwin he had not the knack of sending his thoughts far afield never lost himself in a tangle of speculative fancies like his dark-eyed wide-browed friend and master maurice clissold but within its somewhat narrow limit his mind was clear as a crystal streamlet his first thought in every relation of life was to do a kindness he was a man whom sponges of every order and college scouts and cabmen and tavern waiters adore and for whom the wise and prudent apprehend a youth of waste and riot and an after-life of ruin i'll tell you what said he with a friendly air we'll come to the theatre to-night and see you act and the young lady with a critical glance at justina who walked close beside her father and did her best to extinguish herself in the shadow of mr elgood's bulky form it was as much as james penwood could do to get a glimpse of the girl's face which had a pale tired look just now huh thought james fine eyes but not particularly pretty rather a washed-out look sir said mr elgood you will confer at once honour and substantial benefit upon us poor players and if you like to take a peep at life behind the scenes my position in the theatre warrants my admitting you to that exoteric region i should like it of all things and we can sup together afterwards they've a decent cook at the inn where my friend and i are staying though it's only a roadside tavern you know it perhaps the waterfowl half a mile out of the town it's my friend's fancy that we should stop there it's your friend's necessity that he should avoid costly hotels said maurice lightly they had crossed a couple of meadows where young lambs scuttled off at the sight of them bleating vehemently and now came to a green lane a long grassy gully between tall hedges where the earliest of the dog roses were budding creamy white amidst tender green leaves mr penwin took advantage of the change to slip behind mr elgood and place himself beside justina 
Maurice looked after him darkly. A too general worship of the fair sex was one of James Penwin's foibles. No, decidedly she was not pretty, thought James, after a closer inspection of the pale young face, with its somewhat pensive mouth and grayish-blue eyes. She blushed a little as he looked at her, and the delicate rose tint became the oval cheek. All the lines of her face were too sharp for want of that filling out and rounding of angles which is the ripening of beauty. She was like a pale greenish-hued peach on a wall in early June, to which July and August will bring roundness, velvety texture, and richest bloom. "'I hope you are not very tired,' said James gently. "'Not very,' answered Justina, with an involuntary sigh. "'We had a long rehearsal this morning.' "'Yes, there always must be long rehearsals "'while there are stupid people in a theatre. interjected Mr. Elgood with a sharpness "'which made the remark sound personal. "'We are getting up a burlesque for the race nights, gentlemen,' "'continued the actor. "'Faust and Marguerite, the last popular thing in London, "'and my daughter knows as much about burlesque business "'as an eating-house waiter knows of a holiday.' "'Are you fond of acting?' asked James confidentially, ignoring Mr. Elgood's remarks. "'I hate it,' answered Justina, less shyly than she had spoken before. There was something friendly in the young man's voice and manner which invited confidence, and then he was so pleasant to look at, with his small, clearly cut features, light auburn moustache, crisp auburn hair cut close to the well-shaped head, garments of rough grey tweed which looked more distinguished than any clothes Justina had ever seen before thick cable chain and pendant locket a large dull gold locket with a gothic monogram in black enamel tawny gloves upon the small hands altogether a very different person from the tall man in the shabby shooting coat leather gaiters and bulky boots who walked on the other side of mr elgood justina was young enough to be impressed by externals hate it exclaimed mr penwin i thought actresses always adored the stage and looked forward to acquiring the fame of an o'neill or a fawcett do they said justina those i know are like horses in a mill and go the same round year after year when i think that i may have to lead that kind of life till i die of old age i almost feel that i should like to drown myself if it wasn't wicked but then i haven't any talent i suppose it would all seem different if i were clever aren't you clever asked james smiling at her simplicity although not pretty she was far from unpleasing he was amused interested even but then he was always ready to interest himself in any tolerably attractive young woman maurice clissold fell away from the actor and walked beside his friend overlooking james and justina from his superior height there was plenty of space in the wide green lane for four to walk abreast no said justina confidentially not wishing her father to hear ungrateful murmurs against the art he respected i believe i'm very stupid if there is a point to be made i generally miss it speak too fast or too slow or drop my voice at the end of a speech or raise it too soon even in francois i didn't get around the other night you know francois haven't the honour of his acquaintance the page in richelieu he has a grand speech one is bound to get a tremendous round of applause but somehow i missed it father said he should like to have boxed my ears he didn't do it i hope no but it was almost as bad he said it before everybody in the green room i understand like a fellow saying something unpleasant of one at one's club they came to the end of the green lane at last it opened upon a level sweep of land across which they saw the city all its roofs and walls steeped in the westering sunlight the ground was marshy and between low rush-grown banks gently flowed the ebor a narrow river that wound its sinuous course around the outskirts of ebersham without entering the city i have not led you astray you see sir said maurice behold the cathedral yonder path by the water's edge will bring us to the lower end of the town we have to thank you for extrication from a difficulty sir replied mr elgood with dignity you have brought us a shorter way than that which my daughter and i traversed when we came out this afternoon they followed the river path a tow-path along which slow clumsy horses were wont to drag the lingering chain of a heavily laden barge the dark green rushes shivered in the west wind the slow river was gently rippled the city had a look of unspeakable stillness like a city in a picture. Halfway along the towpath they encountered some stragglers, 
a man laden with oaken mats who walked wide of his companions on the marshy ground outside the path a boy running here and there at random chasing the small yellow butterflies and shouting at them in the ardour of the chase an elderly woman of the gypsy race carrying a string of light fancy baskets across her shoulder that's the worst of a race meeting said james penwin with reference to these nomads it brings together such a lot of rabble one of the rabble stopped and blocked his pathway it was the elderly gypsy woman let me tell your fortune my pretty gentleman she said pouncing on mr penwin as if she had discovered his superior wealth at a glance cross the poor gypsy's hand with a bit of silver half a crown won't hurt you my pretty gentleman you've riches in your face you've never known what it is to want a sovereign and never will the world was made for such as you avaunt harridan cried the tragedian and suffer us to proceed what you'd like to spoil my market would you cried the sibyl vindictively no one was ever a penny the richer for your generosity and no one will be a penny the worse off when you're dead and gone except yourself let me tell your fortune pretty gentlemen she went on laying a persuasive hand on jane penwin's grey sleeve and keeping up with the pedestrians as they strove to pass her there's plenty of pleasant things the old gypsy woman can tell you you're a gentleman that likes a dark blue eye and there's an eye that looks kindly upon you now and though there's crosses for true lovers all will come out happy in the end if you'll listen to the old gypsy james laughed and flung the prophetess a florin show me your hand kind gentleman she urged after a string of thanks and benedictions your left hand yes there's the mount of venus and not an ugly line across it and you've a long thumb my pretty gentleman long between the first joint and the second that means strength of will for the thumb is jupiter and rules the house of life don't take your hand away pretty gentleman let's see the line what's the matter mother asked james as the woman stopped in the middle of a sentence still holding his hand and staring at the palm steadfastly with a scared look what's that she asked pointing to a short indented line across the palm why what keen eyes you have old lady that's the mark of a hole i dug in my palm two years ago cutting a tough bit of cavendish my scout told me i was bound to have lockjaw but i didn't realize his expectations i suppose lockjaw doesn't run in our family right across the line of life muttered the gypsy still examining the seam left by the knife upon the pinkish womanish palm does that mean anything bad that i am to die young for instance the scar of a knife can't overrule the planets replied the sibyl sententiously End of Volume 1, Chapter 1volume one chapters two and three of a strange world by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain two behind the scenes james penwin and maurice clissold went to the ebersham theatre as soon as they had eaten their dinner and smoked a single cigar apiece lounging by the open window in the gloaming talking over their afternoon's adventure what a fellow you are jim cried maurice with a half contemptuous half compassionate air as if for the foolishness of a child to hear you go on about that scarecrow of a girl one would suppose you had never seen a pretty woman in your life i never saw prettier eyes said james and she has a manner that a fellow might easily fall in love with so simple so childish so confiding which means that she gazed with undisguised admiration upon the magnificent squire penwin of penwin manor a woman need only flatter you jim for you to think her a venus that poor little thing didn't flatter me she's a great deal too innocent no she only admired you innocently opening those big blue eyes of hers to their widest in a gaze of rapture was it the locket or the studs or the moustache i wonder that struck her most don't be a fool clissold if we are to go to the theatre we'd better not waste any more time i want to see what kind of an actor our friend is student of humanity jeered maurice even a provincial player is not beneath your notice cuvier was profound upon spiders penwin has a mind of a wider range 
what is his name by the by mused james thinking of mr elgood we don't even know his name and we've asked him to supper that's rather awkward isn't it be sure he will come no doubt he has already speculated on the possibility of borrowing five pounds from you mr penwin rang the bell and gave his orders with that easy air of a man unaccustomed to count the cost the best supper the waterfowl could provide at half past eleven they walked along the lonely road into ebersham the waterfowl inn was upon one of the quietest most obscure roads leading outside the city not the great coach road to london bordered for a mile beyond the town by snug villas and bandboxical detached cottages orderly homes of retired traders but by a by-road leading to a village or two of no consequence save to the few humble folks who lived in them this road followed the wind of the river which traversed the lower end of ebersham and it was for its vicinity to the river and a something picturesque in its aspect that the two friends had chosen the waterfowl as their resting-place there was a small garden behind the inn which sloped to the edge of the stream and a rustic summer-house where the young men smoked their pipes after dinner between the waterfowl and ebersham the landscape was low and flat on one side a narrow strip of marshy ground between road and river with a scrubby brush here and there marking the boundary on the other a tall neglected hedgerow at the top of a steep bank divided by the road by a wide weedy ditch the two friends entered ebersham through a gothic archway called lowgate the old town had been a strongly fortified city famous for its walls and there were several of these stone gateways the theatre stood in the angle of a small square almost overshadowed by the mighty towers of the cathedral as if the stage had gone to the church for sanctuary and protection from the intolerance of bigots here mr penwin and mr clessold placed themselves among the select few of the dress circle a cool and airy range of seats whose sparsely scattered occupants listened with rapt attention to the gloomy prosings of the stranger james penwin was not ravished by that germanic drama even mrs howler bored him she dropped her h's and expressed the emotions of grief and remorse by spasmodic chokings and catchings of her breath but mr penwin lighted up a little when the countess appeared for the countess had the large melancholy blue eyes of the girl he had met in the meadow miss elgood did not look her best on the stage tall slim and willow-waisted sharp of elbow and angular of shoulder dressed in cheap finery soiled satin tarnished silver lace murky marabouts badly painted with two dabs of rouge that were painfully visible upon the pure pale of her young cheeks artistically justina was a failure and feeling herself a failure suffered from an inability to dispose of her arms and a lurking conviction that the audience regarded her with loathing mr clissold exchanged his front seat for a place on the hindmost bench before the stranger was halfway through his troubles and here secure in the shade slept comfortably james penwin endured two acts and a half and then remembering mr elgood's offer to show him life behind the scenes slipped quietly out of the dress circle and asked the box-keeper how he was to get to the side scenes that official sweetened by a liberal donation unlocked a little door behind the proscenium box a door sacred to the manager and let mr penwin through into the mystic world of behind the scenes he would hardly have done such a thing under a responsible lessee but in a commonwealth morals become relaxed the mystic world looked dark and dusty and smelt of gas and dirt to the unaccustomed senses of mr penwin the voices on the stage sounded loud and harsh now that they were so near his ear there was hardly room for him to move between the side scenes and the wall indeed it was only by screwing himself against this whitewashed wall that he made his way in the direction which a scene shifter had indicated as the way to the green room mr penwin's experience of life had never before led him behind the scenes he had a vague idea that a green room was a dazzling saloon lighted by crystal chandeliers lined with mirrors furnished with divans of ruby velvet an idolized copy of a clubhouse smoking-room he found himself in a small dingy chamber carpetless curtainless uncleanly provided with narrow baize covered benches and embellished with one cloudy looking-glass on either side whereof flared an unscreened gas jet here over the narrow wooden mantel-shelf hung casts of pieces in preparation jack shepherd delicate ground courier of lions box and cocks a wide range of dramatic art and calls for next day's rehearsal here in diverse attitudes of weariness lounged various members of the dramatic commonwealth 
among them mr elgood in the frogged coat crimson worsted pantaloons and hessian boots of the baron and justina seated disconsolately with her limp satin trailing over the narrow bench beside her studying her part in the piece for to-morrow night my dear sir exclaimed matthew elgood shaking hands with enthusiasm this is kind dempson this to a gentleman in mufti small sallow close-cropped and smelling of stale tobacco this is my pioneer of to-day mr dempson mr stay we did not exchange cards penwin said james smiling mr elgood stared at the speaker curiously as if he hardly believed his own ears as if this name of penwin had some strange significance for him penwin he repeated that's a cornish name isn't it by tray pole and pen you may know the cornish men there is nothing more cornish i was born and brought up near london but my race belongs to the cornish soil we were indigenous at penwin i believe the founders and earliest inhabitants of the settlement do you know cornwall not intimately merely as a traveller were you ever at penwin i don't think so i have no recollection well it's a place you might easily forget not a promising locality for the exercise of your art but you seemed struck by my name just now as if you had heard it before i think i must have heard it somewhere but i can't recall the occasion let that pass and with a majestic wave of the hand mr elgood performed the ceremony of introduction mr dempson mr penwin mr penwin mr dempson mr dempson is our sometime manager now a brother professional he has resigned the round and top of sovereignty and the carking cares of saturday's treasury mr dempson assented to this statement with a plaintive sigh a harassing profession the drama mr penwin he said the many-headed is a monster of huge ingratitudes james bowed assent the provincial stage is in its decline sir time was when this very theatre could be kept open for ten consecutive months in every year to the profit of the manager and when the good old comedies and the shakespearean drama were acted week after week to an intelligent and approving audience nowadays a man must rack his brains in order to cater for a frivolous and insatiable public which has been taught to consider a house on fire or a railway smash the end and aim of dramatic composition i speak from bitter experience my grandfather was manager of the eversham circuit and retired with a competency my father inherited the competency and lost it in the eversham circuit i have been cradled in the profession and have failed as manager with credit to my head and heart as my friends have been good enough to observe some three or four times and now hang on to dramatic art quite out of fashion like a rusty nail in monumental armour that's what i call the decline of drama mr penwin james assented and was not sorry that mr dempson having vented his woe went off to dress for the afterpiece what a melancholy person said james an excellent low comedian replied mr elgood you'll hear the people screaming at him in the spitterfield weaver by and by his business with the tea and bread and butter is the finest thing i ever saw not second to rights indeed added mr elgood as an afterthought i believe it is wright's business then it can hardly claim the merit of originality genius mr penwin finds its material where it can baron screamed a small boy putting his head in at the door my scene exclaimed mr elgood and vanished james seated himself on the narrow bench beside justina i have been in the boxes to see you act he said in that gentle winning voice which had made him a favourite among women to justina it sounded fresh as a voice from another world no one in her world spoke like that in tones so deferential with accents so pure i am very sorry for it said justina sorry but why because you must hate me the audience always do hate me i feel it in their looks feel it freezing me directly i go on the stage oh there she is again they say to themselves can't they manage to get through the piece without sending her on what a curious notion i thought actresses were conceited people yes when they are favourites i don't know about the rest of the audience miss elgood 
said james almost tenderly but i know i did not hate you my feelings leaned too much the other way justina blushed through those two dabs of rouge compliments were so new to her and a compliment from this elegant stranger was worth all the loud praises of the vulgar herd she hardly envied miss vilroy the leading lady whose chokings and sobbings in mrs howler had been applauded to the echo while the poor countess in her draggle-tailed sky-blue satin had walked on and off unnoticed so this is the way you enjoy the legitimate drama mr penwin said a sonorous voice the full rich baritone of maurice clissold and looking up james and justina beheld that gentleman watching them from the doorway i left you asleep replied james abashed by his friend's advent yes sneaked off and let me to grope my way to this abominable den as best i could i beg your pardon miss elgood but it really is a den you can't hate it worse than i do said justina or so badly i have to sit here every night poor child it's a strange life and a hard one seen from the outside there seems a not unpleasant bohemian flavour about it but when one comes behind the scenes the bohemian flavour appears to be mainly dirt i've inhaled enough dust and escaped gas within the last ten minutes to last me comfortably for my lifetime and you breathe this atmosphere for four or five hours every night poor child james sighed his benevolent heart longed to rescue the girl from such a life a girl with pensive violet eyes fringed by darkest lashes soft brown hair so luxuriant that it made a crown of plates upon the well-shaped head altogether a girl whom benevolence would fain benefit come jim said clissold who had a knack of reading his friend's thoughts you've seen enough of behind the scenes no i haven't answered james sturdily as the countess ran off to act her part in the close of the play he was wont to be plastic as wax in the hands of his guide philosopher and friend but to-night there glowed a spark of rebellion in his soul i am going to stop to see mr elgood and to ask him to bring his daughter to supper bring his daughter to visit two young men at a roadside inn honey swat said james can a girl be safer anywhere than with her father look here penwin said clissold earnestly i've made it the business of my life for the last two years to keep you in the straight path i won't have you kicking over the traces for any blue-eyed chit in the universe remember what i promised your poor mother jim that you'd act the part of an elder brother supply the balance of good sense wanting to my shallow brains that's all very well maurice i always respected my poor mother's ideas even when they took the shape of prejudices but a man must enjoy his life yes but he is bound to enjoy life with the least possible injury to other people whom am i going to injure demanded mr penwin with an impatient shrug as he moved towards the wings you are putting foolish ideas into that poor child's head what nonsense simply because i am civil to her i mean to ask her to supper whether you like it or not i hope her father will have the sense to refuse if you come to that i'll invite the whole company cried the spoiled child of fortune the curtain came down at this moment and mr elgood returned to the green room unbuckling his sword-belt as he came along i waited to remind you of your promise to sup with us to-night mr elgood said james my dear sir it is not an engagement to be forgotten i shall be there will half-past eleven be too early no the stranger has played quick to-night and the afterpiece is short i shall be there miss elgood will accompany you i hope thanks no the proprieties would be outraged by her appearance at a bachelor's table the only lady present we could easily remedy that if any other lady of the company would honour us upon my word you are very kind and i know the child would consider it a treat if you put the question in such a friendly manner i feel sure that mr and mrs dempson would be delighted to join us pray bring them is mrs dempson also dramatic you have seen her to-night in one of her greatest parts mrs haller i thought the lady was a miss vilroy her professional name merely joe dempson and miss vilroy have been united in the sacred bonds of matrimony for some years i shall be charmed to make the lady's acquaintance you know your way to the waterfowl 
it is familiar to me as the path of my infancy and you'll be sure to bring miss elgood judy shall come without fail judy the pet name chosen by affection she was christened justina pardon me if i leave you hastily i play in the next piece mr elgood hurried away james penwin glanced at his friend with a glance of triumph out of leading strings you see maurice he said maurice clissold shrugged his shoulders and turned away with a sigh james more touched by silence than reproof put his arm through his friends with a gay laugh and they went out of the green room and out of the theatre together arm in arm like brothers who loved each other three éveillons le plaisir son horreur est la nuit the supper at the waterfowl was a success every one except perhaps clissold was in the humour to be pleased with everything and even clissold could not find it in his heart to make himself vehemently disagreeable amidst mirth so harmless gaiety so childishly simple to an actor supper after the play is just the one crowning delight of life that glimpse of paradise upon earth which we all get in some shape or other a supper at a comfortable hostelry like the waterfowl where the landlord knew how to do things in good style for a customer who could pay the piper was certainly not to be despised in this northern district there was a liberal plenty a bounteous wealth of provision hardly known elsewhere tea at ebersham meant dinner and breakfast rolled into one supper at ebersham meant aldermanic barn-door fowls and a mighty home-cured ham weighing five and twenty pounds or so lobsters nestling among crisp green lettuces pigeon pie cheesecakes tarts and lest these lighter trifles should fail to satisfy the appetite a lordly cold sirloin by way of corps de reserve to come in at a critical juncture like blucher at waterloo mr dempson made himself the life of the party the small melancholy man who had bewailed the decline of the drama vanished altogether at sight of that plenteously furnished table and in his place appeared a jester of the first water so james penwin thought at any rate as he laughed with youth's gay silver-clear laughter at the low comedian's jokes even miss villeroy was sprightly though she had a worn look about the eyes as if she had aged herself prematurely with the woes of mrs howler and other heroines of tragedy justina sat next to james penwin and was supremely happy though only an hour ago she had shed tears of girlish shame at the idea of coming to a supper party in her threadbare brown merino gown last winter's gown which she was obliged to wear in the warm glad spring for want of fitter raiment no one thought of her shabby gown however when the pale young face brightened and flushed with unwonted pleasure and the large thoughtful eyes took a new light and darkened to a deeper grey james penwin did his uttermost to make her happy and at ease and succeeded only too well there is no impression so swift and so vivid as that which the first admirer makes upon a girl of seventeen the tender words the subdued tones the smiles the praises have such a freshness the adulation of caesar in after years would hardly seem so sweet as these first flatteries of commonplace youth to the girl on the threshold of womanhood mr elgood saw what was going on but was by no means alarmed by the aspect of affairs he felt himself quite able to take care of justina even if mr penwin had been a hardened libertine instead of a kind-hearted youth fresh from the university he had no desire to stifle admiration which might mean very little but which would most likely result in liberal patronage for his own benefit and a trifling present or two for justina a ring or a bracelet or a box of gloves i don't want to stand in justina's light mused mr elgood as he leaned back in his chair and sipped his last glass of champagne when the pleasures of the table had given way to an agreeable sense of repletion what did that gypsy woman mean by the line of life and the planets asked justina she had lost all sense of shyness by this time and she and james were talking to each other in lowered voices as much alone as if the rest of the party had been pictures on the wall maurice marked them as he sat a little way apart from the others smoking his black muzzled pipe pshaw only the professional jargon what does she know of the planets but she stared at your hand in such a curious way and looked so awful that she frightened me do tell me what she meant james laughed and laid his left hand in justina's palm upwards look there he said you see that line a curved channel that goes from below the first finger to the base of the thumb 
that is to say it should go to the base of the thumb but in my hand it doesn't see where the line disappears midway just by that seam left by my pocket knife you can see no line beyond that scar ergo the line never travelled further than that point justina closely scrutinized the strong unwrinkled palm what does that mean she asked i don't understand even now it means a short life and a merry one the rare bloom faded from justina's cheek you don't believe in that she said anxiously no more than i believe in gypsies or spirit wrappers or the cave of trophonius answered james gaily what a silly child you are to look so scared justina gave a little sigh and then tried to smile even this first dawn of a girlish fancy airy as a butterfly's passion for a rose brought new anxieties along with it the gypsy's cant was an evil omen that disturbed her like a shapeless fear women resemble those medieval roisterers of whom the old chronicler wrote they take their pleasure sadly the moon was at the full there she sailed a silver targe above the distant hilltops james looked up at her looked into that profound world above which draws the fancies of youth with irresistible power the room opened on the garden by two long windows and the one nearest to mr penwin's end of the table stood open let us get away from the smoke he said vexed to see clissold's eye upon him fixed and gloomy the room was tolerably full of tobacco smoke by this time and mr elgood was urging mr dempson to favour the company with his famous song the ship's carpenter come into the garden justina said james gaily flinging a look of defiance at his monitor justina blushed hesitated and obeyed him they went out into the moonlit night together and strolled side by side across the rustic garden a slope of grass on which the most ancient of apple trees and pear trees big enough to have been mistaken for small elms cast their crooked shadows it was more orchard than garden a homely useful place altogether pot herbs grew among the rose bushes on the border by the boundary hedge and on one side of the inn there was a patch of ground that grew cabbages and broad beans but all the rest was grass and apple trees at the end of that grassy slope ran the river silver shining under the moon ebersham seen across the level landscape looked a glorified city in that calm and mellow light the boy and girl walked silently down to the river's brim and looked at the distant hills and woods scattered cottages with low thatched roofs and antique chimney stacks here and there the white walls of a mansion silvered by the moon and dominating all in sublime and gloomy grandeur the mighty towers of the cathedral god's temple rising like a fortalice and sanctuary above all human habitations as of old the acropolis justina gazed and was silent it was one of those rare moments of exaltation which poets tell us are worth a lifetime of sluggish feeling the girl felt as if she had never lived till now pretty isn't it remarked james very much in the tone of brumel who after watching a splendid sunset was pleased to observe how well he does it it is too beautiful said justina why too beautiful i don't know it hurts me somehow like actual pain you are like byron's lara but a night like this a night of beauty mocked such breast as his i hope it is not a case of bad conscience with you as it was with him no it is not my conscience the worst i have ever done has been to grumble at the profession and though father says it is wicked the thought of my wickedness has never troubled me but to me there's something awful in the beauty of night and stillness a solemnity that chills me i feel as if there were some trouble hanging over me some great sorrow don't you not the least in the world i think moonlight awfully jolly would you mind much my lighting a cigar you'll hardly feel the effects of the smoke out here i never feel it anywhere answered justina frankly father hardly ever leaves off smoking there was a weeping willow at the edge of the garden a willow whose lower branches dipped into the river and just beside the willow a bench where these two seated themselves in the full glory of the moon a much better place than the dusky summer-house which might peradventure be a harbour for frogs snails or spiders they sat by the river's brim and talked talked as easily as if they had a thousand ideas in common these two who had never met until to-day and whose lives lay so far apart 
they had youth and hope in common and that bond was enough to unite them james asked justina a good many questions about stage life and was surprised to find the illusions of his boyhood vanish before stern truth i thought it was such a jolly life and the easiest in the world he said i often fancied i should like to be an actor i think i could do it pretty well i can imitate buckstone and charles matthews pray don't think of it exclaimed justina you'd be tired to death in a year i dare say i should i'm not much of a fellow for sticking to anything i got ploughed a year ago at oxford and now i've been trying to read with clissold walking through england and wales and putting up all the quietest places we can find clissold is a first-rate coach and it won't be his fault if i don't get my degree next time how do you like him i don't know i haven't thought about him answered the girl simply this younger and fairer stranger had made her oblivious of maurice clissold with his tall strong frame dark penetrating eyes and broad brow too manly a man altogether to be admired by a girl of seventeen he is as good a fellow as ever breathed a little bitter perhaps but most wholesome things are bitter said james he has his crotchets one is that i am to be a model master of penwin by and by go into parliament marry an heiress set up as a fine old english gentleman in fact rather a worrisome metier i should think the worst of it is he keeps it continually before my mind's eye is always reminding me of how much i owe to penwin manor and my race and won't let me get much enjoyment out of youth's brief holiday he's a good fellow but i might love him better if i didn't respect him so much he was a great favourite of my poor mother's a romantic story by the way she was engaged to maurice's father some years before she married mine he was a captain in the east india company's service and fell fighting the niggers at gujarat years afterwards when my father was dead and gone clissold and i met at eton my mother burst into tears when she heard my schoolfellow's name and asked me to bring him to see her of course i obeyed and from that time to the day of her death my mother had a second son in maurice i think she loved him as well as she loved me and were you never jealous no i was too fond of both of them for that and then my dear mother was all love all tenderness i could afford to share her affection with my adopted brother and now tell me something about your own life there is so little to tell answered the girl drearily ever since i can remember we have lived the same kind of life sometimes in one town sometimes in another when father could afford the money he used to send me to a day school so i've been a little educated somehow only i dare say i'm very ignorant because my education used to stop sometimes and by the time it began again i had forgotten a good deal poor child murmured james compassionately is your mother still living she died seven years ago she had had so much trouble it wore her out at last and justina paid her dead mother the tribute of a hidden tear i say jim do you know that it is half-past two o'clock and that mr elgood is waiting for his daughter asked the voice of common sense in the tones of maurice clissold the two children started up from the bench by the willow scared by the sudden question there stood mr clissold tall and straight and severe-looking i heard the cathedral clock a few minutes ago and i am quite aware of the time if mr elgood wants his daughter he can come for her himself replied james mr penwin was resolved to make a stand against his mentor and he felt that now was the time for action mr elgood and mr dempson came strolling out into the garden cigars in their mouths penwin's choicest brand had been largely sacrificed at the altar of hospitality judy have you forgotten the time asked the heavy father with accents that had a legato sound one syllable gliding gently into another a tone that was all sweetness and affection though indistinct yes father answered the girl innocently it's so beautiful out here beautiful echoed the father thickly look how the floor of heaven is thick inlaid with what's its names of bright gold come justina judy put on your bonnet and shawl mrs dampson has been fast asleep for the last half-hour but look 
the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon high eastern hill which reminds me that we have nearly a mile to walk before we get home i'll go with you said james i want to arrange about to-morrow we must make up a jolly party for the races i'll get a roomy carriage that will hold all of us i haven't seen a race in anything like comfort for the last fifteen years responded mr elgood we'll make a day of it clissold and i will come to the theatre in the evening make your own engagements if you please james and allow me to make mine said mr clissold i shall not go to the races to-morrow or if i do it will be by myself and on foot and i shall not go to the theatre in the evening please yourself answered james offended they were all ready by this time mrs dempson had been awakened and shaken out of the delusion that she had fallen asleep on the sofa in her own lodgings and somewhat harshly reminded that she had a mile or so to walk before she could obtain complete repose mr dempson had finished his cigar and accepted another as solace during the homeward walk justina had put on her shabby little bonnet and mantle every one was ready the players took their leave of maurice clissold who was but coldly civil james penwin went out with them and gave his arm to justina as if it were the most natural thing in the world these two walked on in front the other three straggling after them walked arm in arm along the lonely footpath the low murmur of the river sounded near the stream showed silvery now and again between a break in the screen of alders they talked as they had talked in the garden about each other their thoughts and fancies hopes dreams imaginings o oh, youth o oh, glamour strange world in which for the first bright years we live as in a dream sweet dawn of life when nothing in this world seems so real as the hopes that are never to know fruition end of volume one chapters two and three volume one chapters four and five of a strange world by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain four loves a mighty lord sir nugent bellingham was one of those men who are born and reared amidst pecuniary difficulties and whose existence is spent upon the verge of ruin yet it seems a tolerably comfortable kind of life notwithstanding and men of sir nugent's type hardly realize the meaning of the word deprivation sir nugent had never known what it was to be out of debt the bellingham estate was mortgaged up to the hilt when he inherited it indeed to be thus encumbered was the normal condition of all bellingham property of course sir nugent had from time to time possessed money he hardly could have drifted on so long without some amount of specie even in such an easy-going world as that patrician sphere in which he revolved he had inherited a modest fortune from his mother with which he had paid his creditors something handsome on account all round and had made them his bond slaves for all time to come since they cherished the hope of something more in the future sir nugent had received legacies from an aunt and uncle or two and these afforded further sops for his cerberus and enabled the baronet's dainty little household to sail gaily down the stream of time for some years when the amelioration of manners brought bankruptcy within the reach of any gentleman sir nugent bellingham availed himself of the new code and became insolvent in an easy gentlemanlike fashion and what with one little help and another the bijou house in mayfair where sir nugent lived with his two motherless girls was always kept up in the same good style the same dinners small and soigne the same lively receptions after the little dinners the best music the newest books the choicest hothouse flowers were always to be found at number twelve cavendish row mayfair there were only a dozen houses in cavendish row and sir nugent bellingham's was at the corner squeezed into an angle made by the lofty wall of lord loamshire's garden one of those dismal awe-inspiring london gardens grey and dull and blossomless which look like a burial ground without any graves seen from the street number twelve looked a mere doll's house but the larger rooms were behind abutting upon lord loamshire's garden it was an irregular old house full of corners but furnished after the peculiar taste of miss bellingham was one of the most charming houses in london no upholsterer had been allowed to work his will madge bellingham had chosen every item 
the chairs and tables and sofas and cabinets were the cheapest that could be had for they were all of unstained light woods made after designs from miss bellingham's own pencil the cabinets were mere frames for glass doors behind which appeared the bellingham collection of bric-a-brac upon numerous shelves covered with dark green silk madge's own clever hands had covered the deal shelves and the bronzes the venetian glass the sevres copenhagen berlin vienna and dresden porcelains looked all the better for so simple a setting there were no draperies but chintz the cheapest that could be bought but always fresh the looking-glasses had no frame save a natural garland of ivy the floors were beeswaxed only a persian carpet here and there offering accommodation for the luxurious the one costly object in the two drawing-rooms after that bric-a-brac upon which the bellingham race had squandered a small fortune was the piano a broad wood grand in a case made by a modern workman out of veritable louis seize marquetry the old ormolu mountings goat's head festoons and masks had been religiously preserved and the piano was a triumph of art it occupied the centre of the back drawing-room the largest room in the house and when madge bellingham sat before it girl and piano made a cabinet picture of the highest school people know we are out at elbows madge said to her father when they began housekeeping in cavendish row if we have expensive furniture every one will be sure we haven't paid for it but if you let me carry out my ideas the bills will be so light that you can pay them at once i can give the fellows something on account at any rate replied sir nugent lady bellingham's death which occurred soon after the birth of viola the second daughter had left sir nugent free to lead the life of a bachelor for the most part in other people's houses while his girls were in his sister's nursery or at school when they grew to womanhood and a very lovely womanhood for good looks were hereditary in the bellingham family sir nugent found it incumbent upon him to provide them with a home so he took the house in cavendish row and brought home the bellingham bric-a-brick -bric, which had been left him by the aforesaid aunts and uncles and lodged at the pentechnicon pending his settlement in life he began housekeeping at five-and-forty years of age and gave his little dinners at home henceforward instead of at one or other of his clubs and cherished high hopes of seeing his daughters splendidly established by and by i think you have seen enough of what it is to be tormented by a set of harpies to teach you the value of money madge said sir nugent one morning pointing to a small heap of letters which he had just now opened and dismissed with a glance the harpies in question were his creditors who expressed an unwarrantable eagerness for something more on account with your knowledge of life you are not likely to marry a pauper pursued sir nugent dipping into a strasburg pie no papa not with my knowledge of life answered madge with ever so slight and upward curl of the firm lip miss bellingham fondly loved her father but it is possible that the respect may have been somewhat lessened by her experience of that financial scramble in which his life was spent two or three evenings before the night which made james penwin acquainted with life behind the scenes of a small provincial theatre sir nugent bellingham gave one of his snug little dinners a dinner of eight the guest of choicest brands liked the wines lady cheshunt one of the most exalted matrons in the great world kept the miss bellinghams in countenance madge was her pet protege whose praises she was never tired of sounding among the chosen ones of the earth mr albert noyce a distinguished wit and littérateur supplied the salt of the banquet he was a small mild-looking man with a pretty unoffending wife and dined out perpetually during the london season mr shinebar the famous barrister made a fourth lord george bolrose a west of england man a gourmet and in so far as after dinner talk went a mighty hunter was the fifth and sir nugent and his two daughters completed the circle after dinner there was to be an evening party and before the small hours of the morning a great many famous people would have dropped in at the corner house in cavendish row the ladies had retired leaving sir nugent and his chosen friends to talk about law and horses and the last new burlesque actress as they drew closer into the dainty round table where the glass sparkled and the deep-hued blossoms brightened under the cluster of wax lights in the central chandelier viola and lady cheshunt went upstairs arm in arm the girl nestling affectionately against the substantial shoulder of the portly matron mrs noyce stripped lightly after these two and madge followed alone with a grave brow and that lofty air which so well became sir nugent bellingham's elder daughter 
rarely were sisters less alike than these two viola was a blonde complexion alabaster hair the colour of raw silk plenteous flaxen hair which the girl wound into a crown of pale gold upon the top of her small head eyes of turquoise blue figure a thought too slim but the perfection of grace in every movement and attitude foot and hand absolutely faultless altogether a girl to be put under a glass case i should admire the younger miss bellingham more if she were a little less like sevres china one of the magnates of society had observed madge was a brunette hair almost black and with a natural ripple complexion a rich olive eyes darkest hazel features the true bellingham type clearly cut as a profile on an old roman medal figure tall and commanding a woman born to rule one would say judging by externals a woman with the stuff in her to make a general sir nugent was wont to boast but although she was of a loftier mould than the generality of women there was no hardness about madge bellingham in love or in anger she was alike strong for hate she was too noble the rooms were deliciously cool the light somewhat subdued the windows open to the warm spring night there were flowers enough in the small front drawing-room to make it an indoor garden the dowager seated herself upon the most comfortable sofa in this room a capacious square-backed sofa in a dusky corner fenced off and sheltered by a well-filled jardinière come here madge she cried with good-natured imperiousness i want to talk to you viola child go and amuse yourself with mrs noyce show her your photograph album or parler chiffon i want madge all to myself madge obeyed without a word and squeezed herself into the corner of the sofa which lady cheshunt and lady cheshunt's dress almost filled how big you are growing child there's hardly room enough for you remarked the matron and now tell me the truth madge what is the matter with you to-night i don't think there is anything the matter more than usual lady cheshunt i know better than that you were dull and distrait all dinner-time true there was no one to talk to but two married men and that old twaddler bullrose but a young lady should be always equally agreeable that is one of the fundamental principles of good breeding if i seemed a little out of spirits you can hardly wonder papa's sadly involved state is enough to make me uneasy my dear your papa has been involved ever since my first season when my waist was only eighteen inches and madame de v made my gowns he is no worse off now than he was then and he will go on being hopelessly involved till the end of the chapter i don't see why you should be unhappy about it he will be able to give you and viola a tolerable home till you marry and make better homes for yourselves which it is actually incumbent upon you to do this was said with a touch of severity madge sighed and the slender foot in the satin shoe tapped the ground with a nervous impatient movement madge i hope there is no truth in what i hear about you and mr penwin a deep tell-tale glow burned in miss bellingham's cheek she fanned herself vehemently i cannot imagine what you have heard lady cheshunt i have heard your name coupled with mr penwin's the poor mr penwin i only know one mr penwin so much the worse for you my dear you know the wrong one there is a cousin of that young man who has a fine estate in cornwall the penwin estate you must have heard of that yes i have heard mr penwin speak of his cousin's property of course poor penniless young man very natural that he should talk of it don't suppose that i have no feeling for him he is next heir to the property but no doubt the other young man james penwin's son will marry and have a herd of children i knew james penwin this young man's father years ago there were three brothers george the eldest who was in the army and was killed in a skirmish with some wild indians in canada very sad story james who was in the church and had a living somewhere near london and balfour in the law i believe whose son you know yes sighed madge she had heard the family history from churchill penwin but the dowager liked to hear herself talk and did not like to be interrupted 
now if by any chance the present james penwin who is little more than a lad were to die unmarried churchill penwin would come into the property under his grandfather's will which left the estate to the eldest surviving son and his children after him george died unmarried james left an only son churchill is therefore heir presumptive but it's a very remote contingency my love and it would be madness for you to give it a thought with your chances madge shrugged her shoulders despondently i don't think my chances are particularly brilliant lady chess hunt nonsense madge everybody talks of the beautiful bellinghams and you refused a splendid offer only the other day that mr cardingham the great manufacturer who had only seen me four times when he had the impudence to ask me to marry him he was old and ugly too when the end is a good establishment one must not look at the means too closely poor dear cheshunt was many years my senior and no beauty even in his wig you must take a more serious view of things my dear madge it will not do for you and your sister to hang fire the handsomer girls are the more vital it is for them to go off quickly a plain little unobtrusive thing may creep through half a dozen seasons and surprise everybody by making a good match at last but a beauty who doesn't marry soon is apt to get talked about malicious people put it down to too much flirtation and then my love consider your milliner's bills what will they be at the end of a few seasons not very much lady cheshunt i cut out all my own dresses and viola's too and our maid runs them together viola and i help sometimes when we can steal an hour from society i couldn't bear to wear anything that wasn't paid for upon my word you are an exemplary girl madge exclaimed lady cheshunt astounded by such roman virtue what a wife you will make yes i think i might make a tolerable wife for a poor man don't speak of such a thing you were born for wealth and power you are bound to make a great marriage if not for your own sake for viola's see what a poor helpless child she is sadly wanting in moral stamina if you had a good establishment she would have a haven of refuge but if you were to marry badly what will become of her she would never be able to manage your papa madge sighed again and this time deeply love for her sister was madge bellingham's weakest point she positively adored the fair fragile girl who had been given into her childish arms eighteen years ago on that bitter day which made her an orphan there was only four years difference between the ages of the sisters yet madge's affection was always maternal in its protecting thoughtfulness to marry well would be to secure a home for viola sir nugent was but a feeble staff to lean upon i have no objection to marrying well whenever a fair opportunity arises lady cheshunt she said firmly but i will never marry a man whom i cannot respect and like of course not my poor pet murmured the widow soothingly but fortunately there are so many men in the world one can like and respect it is that foolish sentimental feeling called love which will only fit one person in the meantime madge take my advice and don't let people talk about you and mr penwin i don't know why they should talk about us yes you do madge in your heart of hearts you know that you have sat together in corners and that you have a knack of blushing when he comes into the room it won't do madge it won't do that young fellow has nothing except what he can earn himself i know his mother had a struggle to bring him up and if he hadn't been an only son could hardly have brought him up at all he was a blue-coat boy i believe or something equally dreadful it is not to be thought of madge i do not think of it lady cheshunt replied miss bellingham resolutely and i wish you would not worry yourself and me about imaginary dangers your visitors are beginning to come go and receive them and leave me in my corner mr penwin is to be here i've no doubt i don't know he knows that saturday is our night mr churchill penwin announced a footman at the door of the larger room i thought so said lady cheshunt and the first to arrive too 
that looks suspicious five il ne faut pas pousser au bout les malheureux churchill penwin was one of those men who are sure to obtain a certain amount of notice in whatever circle they appear a man upon whom the stamp of good blood or good breeding had been set in a distinct and palpable manner a man who had no need for self-assertion it would have been difficult for any one to state in what the distinction lay he was not particularly good-looking intellect rather than regularity of feature was the leading characteristic of his countenance already though he was still on the sunward side of his thirtieth birthday the dark brown hair grew thinly upon the broad high brow showing signs of premature baldness his features were sharply cut but by no means faultless the mouth somewhat sunken the lips thin his light grey eyes had a keen cold lustre only those who saw churchill penwin in some rare moment of softer feeling knew that those severe orbs could be beautiful mr penwin was a barrister still in the uphill stage of his career he got an occasional brief went on circuit assiduously and did a little in the literature of politics a hard dry kind of literature but fairly remunerative when he got it to do he had contributed hard-headed statistical papers to the edinburgh and the westminster and he knew a good deal about the condition of the operative classes he had lectured in some of the northern manufacturing towns and knew the black country by heart people talked of him as a young man who was sure to make his mark by and by but by and by might be a long way off he would be fifty years of age perhaps before he had worked his way to the front churchill penwin went a great deal into society when it is considered how hard and how honestly he worked but the houses in which he was to be found were always houses affected by the best people he never wasted himself among the second-rate circles he was an excellent art critic knew enough about music to talk of it cleverly though he had hardly the faculty of distinguishing one tune from another waltzed like a viennese rode like a centaur spoke three continental languages perfectly it was his theory that no man should presume to enter society who could not do everything that society could require him to do society was worth very little in itself according to churchill penwin but a man owed it to himself to be admired and respected by society i see a good many men who go into the world to stare about them through eye-glasses said churchill if i couldn't do anything more than that i should spend my evenings in my own den churchill penwin went into the gay world with a definite aim some of the people he met must needs be useful to him sooner or later on a hast on a rast without haste without rest was his motto he had it engraved on his signet ring instead of the penwin crest he was never in a hurry while striving for success he had the air of a man who had already succeeded he occupied a third floor in the temple and lived like an anchorite but his tailor and bootmaker were among the best in london and he was a member of the travellers and the garrick he was to be seen sometimes lunching at his club and occasionally entertained a friend at luncheon but he rarely dined there and was never seen to drink anything more costly than a pint of la rose or medoc no man had ever mastered the art of economy more thoroughly than churchill penwin and yet he had never laid himself open to the charge of meanness miss bellingham received him with a bright look of welcome despite the dowager's warning and their hands met with a gentle pressure on churchill's part viola was discreetly occupied in showing mrs noyce a new photograph and only gave the visitor a bow and a smile so he had a fair excuse for sitting himself next match on the divan by the fireplace where there was just room for those two i did not think you would come to-night said madge opening and shutting her large black fan with a slightly nervous movement why not i saw your name in the paper at halifax or somewhere hundreds of miles away i was at halifax the day before yesterday but i would not miss my saturday evening here you see i have come a quarter of an hour in advance of your people so that i might have you to myself for a few minutes it is so good of you faltered madge and you know i am always glad i should be wretched if i did not know it this was going further than mr penwin's usual limits the man was the very soul of prudence no sweet words no tender promises had ever passed between these two and yet they knew themselves beloved madge knew it to her sorrow for she was faint to admit the wisdom of the dowager's warning 
it would never do for her to marry churchill penwin happily for her up to this time churchill had never asked her to be his wife he is too wise she said to herself with the faintest touch of bitterness too much a man of the world but that this man of the world loved her she was very sure for just ten minutes they sat side by side talking of indifferent things but only as people talk who are not quite indifferent to each other and then more visitors were announced sir nugent and his friends came upstairs the rooms began to fill musical people arrived a german with long rough hair bony wrists and an eyeglass seated himself at the piano and began a performance of so strictly classical a character that he had the enjoyment of it all to himself for nobody else listened minor chords chased one another backwards and forwards about the middle of the piano as if they were hunting for the melody and couldn't find it little runs and arpeggio passages went under and over each other and wriggled in and out and up and down in a distracted way still searching for the subject and finally gave up the quest in utter despair appropriately expressed by vague grumblings in the bass which slowly faded into silence whereupon every one became enthusiastic in their admiration after this a young lady in pink sang an airy little chanson with elaborate variations using her bright soprano voice as freely as if she had been philomel trilling her vespers in the dusky woods of june and then madge bellingham sat down to the piano and played as few young ladies play as if her glad young soul were in the music it was only in hungarian march that she played there were no musical fireworks no difficulties conquered none of those passages which make the listeners exclaim poor girl how she must have practised it was but a national melody simple and spirit-stirring played as if the soul of a patriot were guiding those supple fingers the graceful figure was bent a little over the keyboard the dark eyes followed the swift flight of the hands over the keys she seemed to caress the notes as she struck them to play with the melody pride love hope rage every passion expressed itself by turns as she followed that wild strange music through the mazes of its variations never losing the subject it sounded like the war-cry of a free people even churchill penwin who in a general way cared so little for music listened entranced to this he could hardly have recalled the air half an hour later but for the moment he was enchanted he stood a little way from the instrument watching the player watching the beautiful head with its dark rippling hair wound into a greek knot at the back the perfect throat with its classic necklet of old wedgwood medallion set in plainest gold the drooping lashes as the downcast eyes followed the flying touch to hear madge play was delightful but to see her was still better and this man's love had all the strength of a passion repressed he had held himself in check so long and every time he saw her he found her more and more adorable the evening wore on people came in and out madge played the hostess divinely always supported by lady chesthunt who sat in the smaller drawing-room as in a temple and had all the best people brought to her some came to cavendish row on their way somewhere else and were careful to let their acquaintance know that they were due at some very grand entertainment and made rather a favour of coming to sir nugent the last of the guests went about half an hour after midnight and among the last churchill penwin may i bring you that book after church to-morrow he asked the book was a comedy of ogier's lately produced at the francais which he had been telling her about madge looked embarrassed she had a particular wish to avoid a tete-a-tete -tete with mr penwin and sunday was an awkward day sir nugent would be at hurlingham most likely and viola was such a foolish little thing almost as bad as nobody if you like she answered but why take the trouble to call on purpose you might bring it next saturday if you come to us i shall bring it you to-morrow he said as they shook hands that tiresome viola was in a hopeless state of headache and prostration next morning so madge had to go to church alone coming out of the pretty little anglican temple she found herself face to face with churchill penwin he had evidently been lying in wait for her i was so afraid i might not find you at home he said half apologetically so i thought i might as well walk this way i knew this was your church i've brought you the play we were talking about you're very kind but i hope you don't think i read french comedies on sundays of course not 
only sunday is my leisure day and i thought you would not shut your door upon me even on sunday the church was only five minutes walk from cavendish row when sir nugent's door was opened mr penwin followed miss bellingham into the house as a matter of course she had no help for it but to go quietly upstairs to her fate she almost knew what was coming there had been something in his manner last night that told her it was very near prudence courage she whispered to herself and then viola the last word was a kind of charm the rooms looked bright and gay in the noontide sunlight tempered by spanish blinds the flowers the feminine prettiness scattered about struck churchill's eye they gave such a look of home if i could afford to give her as good a home as this he thought he shut the door carefully behind him and glanced round the room to make sure they were alone and went close to madge as she stood by one of the small tables fidgeting with the clasp of her prayer-book i think you know why i came to-day he said you have told me about three times to bring me la quarantaine i have come to tell you a secret i have kept more than a year have you never guessed it madge have i been clever enough to hide the truth altogether i love you dearest i penniless churchill penwin dare to adore one of the bells of the season i who cannot for years to come offer you a house in mayfair i who at most can venture to begin married life in a bloomsbury lodging supported by the fruits of my pen it sounds like madness doesn't it it is madness she answered looking full at him with her truthful eyes the answer surprised and humiliated him he fancied she loved him would be ready to face poverty for his sake she was so young and would hardly have acquired the wisdom of her world yet a while i beg your pardon he said a curious change coming over his face a sudden coldness that made those definite features look as if they had been cut out of stone i have been deceiving myself all along it seems i did not think i was quite indifferent to you the eyelids drooped over the dark eyes for a moment and were then lifted suddenly and the eyes met churchill's that one look told all she loved him i have been learning to know the world while other girls are allowed to dream she said i know what the burden of debt means poverty brings debt as a natural sequence if you were a woodcutter and would live in a hovel and pay our way there would be nothing appalling in marriage but our world will not let us live like that we must play at being fine ladies and gentlemen while our hearts are breaking and our creditors being ruined ever so long ago i made up my mind that i must marry a rich man if i have ever seemed otherwise to you than a woman of the world bent upon worldly success i humbly beg you to forgive me madge cried churchill passionately i will forgive anything if you will only be frank were my luck to turn speedily through some unlooked-for professional success for instance would you have me then if i stood alone in the world if i had not my sister to consider i would marry you to-morrow yes though you were a beggar she answered grandly he clasped her to his breast and kissed those proud lips the first lover's kiss that had ever rested there i will be rich for your sake distinguished for your sake he said impetuously if wealth and fame are within the reach of man's effort end of volume one chapters four and five volume one chapters six and seven of a strange world by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain six there is no life on earth but being in love the first faint streak of day parted the eastern clouds when james penwin got back to the waterfowl but late as it was and though a long day's various fatigues might have invited him to repose maurice clissold had waited up for his friend he was walking up and down the inn parlour where empty bottles and glasses cigar ashes and a broken clay pipe or two bestrewed the table and gave a rakish look to the room the window stood wide open to the pale cold dawn and the air was chill not gone to bed yet maurice exclaimed james surprised and perhaps somewhat embarrassed by this unexpected encounter i was in no humour for sleep i never can sleep when i have anything on my mind i waited up to ask you a question jim 
something like defiance sparkled in mr penwin's eyes as he planted himself upon the arm of the substantial old sofa and lighted a final cigar don't restrain your eloquence he said i should hardly have considered four o'clock in the morning a time for conversation but if you think so i'm at your service i want to know in plain words what you mean by this james by what your conduct to that girl i shouldn't think anything so simple needed explanation i meet a strolling player and his daughter the strolling player is something of a character the daughter well not pretty perhaps though she has lovely eyes but interesting i offer them the small attention of a supper and seeing that my friend the player is a trifle the worse for the champagne consumed humanity urges me to escort the young lady to her own door lest her father should lead her into one of the ditches which beset the way i believe that is the sum total of my offences it sounds simple enough jim answered the other gravely but not unkindly and i dare say no harm will come of it if you let things stop exactly where they are but i watched you and that poor child to-night she is little more than a child at best and i saw that you were doing your utmost unconsciously perhaps to turn her silly head i saw you together in the moonlight afterwards if there was anything sentimental you must blame the moon not me said james lightly and now you talk of spending to-morrow with these people and taking them to the races and i mean to do it there's a freshness about them that amuses me i've been getting rather tired of nature and greek though of course we've had an uncommonly jolly time of it together dear old boy and i find a relief in a glimpse of real life when you turn mentor you make yourself intensely disagreeable do you suppose that i harbour one wicked intention about this girl no james i don't suppose you do if i thought you were a deliberate sinner i should leave you to go your own road and only try to save the girl but i know what misery has been wrought in this world by gentlemanly trifling and what still deeper wretchedness has been brought about by unequal marriages do you suppose i think of marrying mr elgood's daughter because i say a few civil words to her cried james forgetting how much earnestness there had been in those civil words only an hour ago if you have no such thought you have no right to cultivate an acquaintance that can only lead an unhappiness to her if not to yourself james answered with a sneer to which clissold replied somewhat warmly and there were angry words between the two young men before they parted in the corridor outside their bedrooms the people of the house already thinking about morning heard the raised voices and angry tones heard and remembered it was ten o'clock when james penwin went down to breakfast next morning the sun was shining in at the open windows all traces of last night's revelry were removed the room was in the nicest order the table spread for breakfast with spotless linen and shining tea service but only set for one james plucked impatiently at the bell rope it irked him not to see his friend's face on the other side of the board he had come downstairs prepared to make peace on the easiest terms ready even to own himself to blame has mr clissold breakfasted he asked the girl who answered his summons no sir he wouldn't stop for breakfast he went out soon after seven this morning with his fishing rod and he left a note please sir there it was among the shells and shepherdesses on the mantelpiece a little pencil scrawl twisted into a cocked hat dear jim since it seems that my counsel irritates and annoys you i take myself off for a day's fly-fishing you must please yourself about the races only remember that it is easy for a man to drift upon quicksands from which he can hardly extricate himself without the loss of honour or of happiness the sum total of a man's life depends very much upon what he does with the first years of his manhood i shall be back before night yours always m c james penwin read and re-read the brief epistle musing over it frowningly it was rather tiresome to have a friend who took such a serious view of trifles towards what quicksand was he drifting was it a dishonourable thing to admire beautiful eyes to wish to do some kindness to a friendless girl en passant as to the races he could not dream of disappointing the people he had invited was he to treat them cavalierly because they were poor he rang the bell again and ordered the largest landau or barouche which the waterfowl could obtain for him with a pair of good horses and get me up a picnic basket he said and plenty of champagne at two and twenty with the revenues of penwin manor at his command a man could hardly do things shabbily 
he had arranged everything with his guests the dempsons and the elgoods lodged in the same house an ancient dwelling not far from the archway at the lower end of the city mr penwin was to call for them in a carriage at twelve o'clock and they were to drive straight to the race-course james breakfasted slowly and with little appetite he missed the companion whose talk had been wont to enliven all their meals he thought it unkind of maurice to leave him was at once angry with his friend and with himself for his contemptuous speeches of last night he left his breakfast unfinished at last and went out into the garden and down by the narrow river which had a different look by day it was beautiful still the winding stream with its sedgy banks and far-off background of low hills and the grave old city in the middle distance but it lacked the magic of night the mystic charms of moonbeam and shadow the scene even without the moonlight put him painfully in mind of last night when justina and he had sat side by side on the bench by yonder willow why shouldn't i marry her if i love her he said to himself i am my own master who will ask squire penwin for his wife's pedigree it isn't as if she were vulgar or ignorant she speaks like a lady and she seems to know as much as most of the girls i have met he strolled up and down by the river smoking and musing until the carriage was ready it was a capacious vehicle of the good old baker street repository build a vehicle which looked as if it had been a family travelling carriage about the period of the bourbon restoration and had done the tour of europe and been battered and bruised a good deal between the alps and the danube there was a vast amount of leather in its composition and more iron than sticklers for absolute elegance would desire whereby it jingled considerably in its progress but it was roomy and for a race-course that was the main point james drove to the dingy old street where the players lodged an old-fashioned street with queer old houses more picturesque than clean the players lodgings were above a small shop in the chandlery line and as there was no private door james had to enter the realms of dutch cheese kippered herrings and dipped candles pendant from the low ceiling like stalactites in quest of his new acquaintance the ladies were ready but mr elgood was still in his shirt-sleeves and his countenance had a warm and shiny look as if but that moment washed justina came running down the stairs and into the shop where james welcomed her warmly she was quite a transformed and glorified justina decked in borrowed raiment which mrs dempson had good-naturedly supplied for the occasion there is no knowing what may come of to-day's outing the leading lady had remarked significantly mr penwin is young and foolish and seems actually taken with justina and it would be such a blessing if she could marry well poor child seeing that she has not a spark of talent for the profession justina wore a clean muslin dress which hardly reached her ankles a black silk jacket and a blue crape bonnet not too fresh but quite respectable a bonnet which had been pinned up in paper and carefully kept since last summer i shall trim it up with a feather or two and wear it for light comedy by and by said mrs dempson as she pulled the bonnet into shape upon justina's head the girl looked so happy that she was almost beautiful there was a soft bloom upon her cheek a tender depth in the dark blue eyes a joyous smiling look that charmed james penwin who liked people to be happy and enjoy themselves when he was in a humour for festivity how good of you to be ready cried james taking her out to the carriage and how bright and fresh and gay you look justina blushed conscious of her borrowed bonnet i've got a nice old rattle-trap to take us to the race-course oh beautiful exclaimed justina gazing at the patriarchal tub with respectful admiration are the others ready father's just putting on his coat and the dempsons are coming downstairs the dempsons appeared as she spoke mrs dempson superb in black moiré antique and the pinkest of pink bonnets and a white lace shawl which had been washed a good many times and had rather too much darning in proportion to the pattern but as mrs dempson remarked always looked graceful it was her bridal veil as pauline de chapelle she wore it as juliet and as desdemona before the senate now then cried james as mr elgood appeared still struggling with his coat the carriage was packed without further delay mrs dempson and justina in the seat of honour mr penwin and mr dempson opposite them mr elgood on the box he had declared his preference for that seat off they went oh so gaily justina thought the landlady gazing at them from her shop door and quite a cluster of small children cheering their departure 
as if it had been a wedding mrs dempson said archly away they went through the quaint old city which wore its holiday look to-day crowds were pouring in from the station coffee-houses and eating-houses had set forth a rabelaisian abundance in their shining windows taverns were decorated with flags and greenery flies driven by excited coachmen with ribbons on their whips shot up and down the streets all was life and brightness and justina who had rarely ridden in a carriage felt that just in this one brief hour she could understand how duchesses and such people must feel seven let the world slip we shall ne'er be younger they left the town behind them and rattled along the wide high road for half a mile or so before they turned off to the race-ground perhaps the ebersham course is one of the prettiest in england an oval basin of richest greensward set among low wooded hills a water-pool shining here and there in the valley where the placid kine browse in pensive solitude save during race week when the placid kine are wisely withdrawn from the dangerous neighbourhood of tramps and gipsies and the wild excitement of the turf the grandstand a permanent building of white freestone looked very grand to justina's eyes as the family ark blundered and jingled into a place exactly opposite one of the best places on that privileged piece of ground for which james paid three shining sovereigns temporary stands of woodwork bordered the course crowded with warm humanity justina wondered where so many people came from and how it was so few of them came to the theatre and sighed to think that the drama has never taken a grip upon the public mind as a thoroughly national amusement see how the people congregated to-day tier above tier on yonder fragile stages pressed together with scarce breathing room and yet there would be room to spare in the little theatre to-night justina feared despite immense attractions and an unparalleled combination of talent as advertised in the playbills but after this one sigh for the neglected drama justina abandoned herself to the delight of the hour and was supremely content james told her all about the horses how that one had done great things at newmarket how the other was winner of the chester cup he showed her the colours explained everything and the race assumed a new interest mr dempson left the carriage to stretch his legs a bit he said and see who was on the course but in reality because he was of a roving disposition and soon tired of repose mr elgood devoted himself exclusively to mrs dempson villeroy as he called her being more accustomed to her professional alias than the name she rendered illustrious in domestic life so james and justina were left to themselves and behaved very much as if they had been plighted lovers ever so long quite unconsciously upon justina's part for she knew little of real lovers and their ways presently there was a sudden stir a disbursement of pedestrians from the race-course as a policeman or two galloped up and down and the clerk of the course in his scarlet coat and buckskins cantered briskly over the grass then a dog driven past with hootings and ignominy then more ringing of bells the preliminary canter and then the race a few minutes of breathless attention a thundering rush past all the carriages and the eager atiptoe spectators and white jacket with red spots had pulled off the first stakes did you see it asked james turning to the girl's bright face glowing with excitement oh it was beautiful i don't wonder at people coming to races now i feel as if i had never been quite alive before just that one moment when the horses were tearing past it was wonderful a very fair race said james with a patronizing air but there were some wretched screws among them you'll see a better set by and by for the cup i fee anassa the oaks winner is first favourite the bookmen call her free and easy for short and now we'll have a bottle of sham not a bad move said mr elgood approvingly that kind of thing makes a fellow dryish he made himself very useful in helping to open the baskets there were two hampers one for wine and the other for comestibles the waterfowl having done things handsomely mr elgood took one of the golden-necked bottles out of the rush case found the glasses the nippers and opened the bottle as neatly as a waiter he had the lion's share of the wine for his trouble james and justina had only one glass between them they could very easily have had two but they liked this mutual goblet and sipped the bright wine gaily justina taking about as much as titania might have consumed from a chalice made of a harebell 
the champagne bottle was hardly open when a gipsy appeared at the carriage door as if attracted by the popping of the cork an elderly gipsy with an orange silk handkerchief tied across her black hair amongst which a few silver threads were visible she was the identical gipsy woman who had stopped james penwin and his companions yesterday afternoon by the river give the poor old gipsy woman a little drop of wine kind gentleman she asked insinuatingly justina drew back shuddering drew near her companion till her slight form pressed against his shoulder and he could feel that she trembled why what's the matter you timid bird he whispered tenderly drawing his arm round her by an instinctive movement they were standing up in the carriage as they had stood to see the race mrs dempson with her face towards the box whence mr elgood was pointing out features of interest on the course it's the same woman exclaimed justina in a half whisper what woman my pet it had come to this already and justina at this particular moment was too absorbed to remonstrate the woman who told you about the mark on your hand is it really i didn't notice answered james smiling at her concern the gipsy had gone to the next carriage whose occupants were in the act of discussing a bottle of sherry and a packet of appetizing sandwiches thin and daintily trimmed sandwiches made to provoke rather than appease appetite upon my word i didn't notice repeated james all gipsies are alike to my eye the same tawny skins the same shiny black hair but why should you be frightened at her pretty one she prophesied no evil about me no but she looked at you so curiously and then a line across the line of life that must mean something dreadful my dearest do you think any reasonable being believes in lines of life or any such bosh gypsies must have some kind of jargon or they could get no dupes but i think you and i are too wise to believe in their nonsense we'll give the harridan a tumbler of fizz and i'll warrant she'll prophesy smooth things hi mistress this way the gypsy having paid unfruitful homage to the carriage of sandwich consumers came quickly at james penwin's bidding let me drink your health pretty gentleman she pleaded and the health of the young lady that loves you best and i know of one that loves you well and a beautiful young lady and is well beloved by you you've courted a many young gentlemen in your time the old gypsy knows for you've a wicked eye and a wanton art but the most fickle must fix at last and may you never rove no more for you fixed upon one as can be constant to you thank you sir and here's health and happiness to you and the young lady and a short courtship and a long family and give the poor gypsy a morsel of something to eat like a dear young lady appealing to the blushing justina for fear the wine should turn acid upon my inside the picnic basket had to be opened in order to meet this judicious demand and this being done the sibyl was gratified with a handsome wedge of veal pie this partly dispatched and partly pocketed she made the familiar request for a piece of silver to cross the young lady's palm which charm being performed she could tell things that would please her james complied and justina surrendered her hand most unwillingly to the gypsy's brown claw the sibyl told the usual story happy wooing prosperous wedded life all things were to go smoothly for the blue-eyed lady and the blue-eyed gentleman but beware of a dark man said the witch who felt it necessary to introduce some shadow in her picture beware of a dark-complexioned man i won't say as he's spades better call him clubs perhaps be on your guard against a clubman my sweet young lady and gentleman for he bears a jealous heart towards you both and he stands to do you harm if he has the power that will do said james we've had enough for our money thank you old lady you can move on to the next carriage don't be offended with the poor gypsy your honour she's truth spoken and plain spoken and she sees deeper into things than some folks would give her credit for and thus after an affectionate farewell the prophetess pursued her way other prophetesses followed in her wake all begging for food and wine and james lavished more champagne in this direction than mr elgood approved but even his good nature wore out at last and he grew tired of these copper-skinned mendicants some with babies in arms for whom they begged a little drop of champagne or the claw of a lobster the races went on 
the great race was at hand now then justina we must have something on said james you don't mind me calling you justina do you i don't mind the girl answered simply if father doesn't well you see i can't ask him now but i will by and by we can let the question stand over and i may call you justina meanwhile mayn't i justina he asked softly if you like she answered almost in a whisper they stood so near together that there was no need for either of them to speak loud even amidst the noise of the race-course look here now justina i'll bet you a dozen gloves even money that free and easy doesn't win that's giving you a great advantage for they are laying three to two on the favourite i don't think i can bet said justina embarrassed if i were to lose i could not pay you ladies never pay debts come if ify and Asa wins you shall have a dozen pairs of the prettiest gloves i can buy straw-coloured pink pearl grey which is your favourite colour i like any kind of gloves answered the girl remembering two wretched pairs which had been to the cleaners so often that their insides were all over numbers like a multiplication table now came the start breathlessness attention strained almost to agony a hoarse clamour yonder in and about the ring one big man wearing a white hat with a black hat-band offering frantically to bet ten to one against anything bar one then a shout as of universal victory for free and easy has shot suddenly to the front after having been tenderly nursed during the first half-mile or so and now she comes along gallantly with a great lead and her backers tremble and now cold dews break out upon the foreheads of those eager backers for another horse almost an unknown animal creeps up to ifianassa gallops shoulder to shoulder with the oak's winner passes her and wins by a neck while a suppressed groan from the many losers mingles with the hurrahs of that miserable outside public which never stakes more than half a sovereign and is ready to cheer any horse only among the bookmen is there real rejoicing for they have been betting against the favourite you've lost your gloves justina never mind we'll have another venture on the next race it's a selling stake and we can go and see the auction afterwards such fun and now for the basket make yourself useful elgood mrs dempson you must be famishing mrs dempson upon being pressed owed to feeling a little faint a lady of mrs dempson's calibre never confesses to being hungry with her want of food only produces a genteel faintness the basket was emptied lobster chicken pie set out upon a tablecloth laid out on the front seat of the carriage then the scrambling meal began the ladies seated with plates in their laps the gentlemen standing again james and justina shared the same glass of champagne while mr elgood obligingly held on by the bottle and filled his own glass by instalments so that it was never empty and never full mr dempson was moderate but jovial mrs dempson protested vehemently every time her glass was replenished but contrived to drink the wine out of politeness james was the gayest of amphitryons he kept on declaring that he had never enjoyed himself so much never had such a jolly day i am sorry your friend is not with us remarked mr elgood with his mouth full of lobster he has lost a treat his loss is our gain observed mr dempson there'd have been less champagne for the rest of us if he'd been here my friend is an ass said james carelessly his errant fancy so easily caught was quite enchained by this time he had been growing fonder of justina all day and with the growth of his boyish passion his anger against maurice increased he had almost made up his mind to do the very thing which clissold had stigmatized as madness he had almost made up his mind to marry the actor's daughter he was in love with her and how else should his love end he came of too good a stock had too good a heart to contemplate a dishonourable ending it only remained for him to discover if he really loved her if this fancy that had but dawned upon him yesterday were indeed the beginning of his fate or that considerable part of a man's destiny which is involved in his marriage he had been very little in the society of women since his mother's death his brief harmless flirtations had been chiefly with damsels of the barmaid class and after these meretricious charmers justina with her wild rose-tinted cheeks and innocent blue eyes seemed youth and purity personified justina looked shyly up at her admirer happier than words could have told 
little had she ever tasted of pleasure's maddening cup before to-day the flavor of the wine was not stranger to her lips than the flavor of joy to her soul for her girlhood had meant hard work and deprivation since she had been young enough to play hopscotch on the doorstep with a neighbor's children and think it happiness she had hardly known what it was to be glad to-day life brimmed over with enchantment a carriage a picnic races all the glad gay world smiling at her she looked at james with a grateful smile when he asked her if she was enjoying herself how can i help enjoying myself she said i never had such a day in my life it will all be over to-night and to-morrow the world will look just as it does when one awakens from a wonderful dream i have had dreams just like to-day she added simply might we not lengthen the dream find some enjoyment for to-morrow asked james we might even come to the races again if you like we couldn't come there will be a long rehearsal to-morrow we play the new burlesque to-morrow night and i thought you were going away to-morrow your friend said so my friend would have been wiser had he spoken for himself and not for me i shall stay till the races are over longer perhaps how long do you stay till next saturday week unless the business should get too bad then i think i shall stay till next saturday week i can read a greek play at ebersham as well as anywhere else and i don't see why i should be hurried from place to place to please clissold added the young man rebelliously there had been no hurrying from place to place hitherto they had done a good deal of wales and the english lakes by easy stages stopping at quiet inns and reading hard in the intervals of their pedestrianism and james had been completely happy with the bosom friend of his youth it was only since yesterday that the bosom friend had been transformed into a tyrant clissold had warned and reproved before to-day he had spoken with a voice of wisdom when james seemed going a little too far in some village flirtation and james had listened meekly enough but this time james penwin's soul rejected counsel he was angry with his friend for not thinking it the most natural thing in the world that he squire penwin of penwin should fall head over ears in love with a country actor's daughter i may come behind the scenes to-night mayn't i justina asked james by and by when the last race was over and he and justina had seen the winner dispose of to the highest bidder and the patriarchal tub was rolling swiftly oh too swiftly back to the town back to common life and the old dull world you must ask father or mr dempson justina answered meekly sometimes they make a fuss about any one coming into the green room but i don't suppose they would about you it would be very ungrateful if they did james asked the question of mr elgood and was answered heartily he was to consider the ebersham green room an adjunct to his hotel and the ebersham theatre as open to him as his club without question of payment at the doors your name shall be left with the money-taker the heavy father said somewhat thickly mr dempson laughed our friend is a trifle screwed he said but i dare say he'll get through sir oliver pretty well the play was the school for scandal a genteel entertainment in honour of the patrons of the races the roomy travelling carriage was blundering through one of the narrower streets near the cathedral when james penwin stood up suddenly and looked behind him what's the matter asked mr dempson nothing i thought i saw a fellow i know that's all he's just gone into that public house the quiet-looking little place at the corner i fancied i saw him on the course but i don't see how it could be the man added james dubiously what should bring him down here it isn't in his line end of volume one chapter six and seven Volume One, Chapters Eight and Nine of A Strange World by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eight. Have the high gods anything left to give? Mr. Penwin set down his guests at the chandler's door and drove home to the waterfowl in solitary state, the chariot in which he sat seeming a great deal too big for one medium sized young man his ample meal on the course made dinner an impossibility so he ordered a cup of coffee to be taken to him in the garden and went out to smoke a cigar on his favourite bench by the willow the waterfowl was too far off the beaten tracks for any of the race people to come there so james had the garden all to himself even this evening 
the sun was setting beyond the bend of the river just where the shining water seemed to lose itself in a rushy basin the ruddy light shone on the windows of the town till they looked like fiery eyes gleaming through the grey evening mist while above the level landscape and the low irregular town rose the dusky bulk of the cathedral dwarfing the distant hills and standing darkly out against that changeful sky james penwin was in a meditative mood and contemplated the landscape dreamily as he smoked an excellent cigar with epicurean slowness letting pleasure last as long as it would not that his soul was interpenetrated by the subtle beauties of the scene he only thought that it was rather jolly that solemn stillness after the riot of the racecourse that lonely landscape after the movement of the crowd only last night had justina and he stood side by side in the moonlight only last night had their hands met for the first time and yet she seemed a part of his life indispensable to his happiness is it love he asked himself first love i didn't think it was in me to be such a spoon he was at the age when that idea of spooniness is to the last degree humiliating he had prided himself upon his manliness thought that he had exhausted the well-spring of sentiment in those passing flirtations the transitory loves of an undergraduate he had talked big about marrying by and by for money and position to add new lustre to the house of penwin to carry some heiress's arms on his shield upon an escutcheon of pretence was it really love love for a foolish girl of seventeen with sky-blue eyes and a look of adoration when she raised them ever so fearfully to his face justina had a pensiveness that charmed him more than other women's gaiety and till now sprightliness had been his highest quality in woman a girl who would light his cigar for him and take three or four puffs daintily before she handed him the weed a girl who was quick at retort and could chaff him this girl essayed not repartee this girl was fresh and simple as wordsworth's ideal woman and he loved her for the first time in his glad young life his heart throbbed with the love that is so near akin to pain i'll marry her he said to himself she shall be mistress of penwin manor the sun went down and left the landscape gloomy james penwin rose from the bench with a faint shiver these early summer evenings are chilly he thought as he walked back to the house he felt lonely somehow in spite of his fair new hope it was so strange to him not to have clissold at his side to reprove or warn but at worst the voice was a friendly one the silence of this garden the dusky gloom on yonder river the solemn gloom of the cathedral chilled him the great clock boomed eight and reminded him that the play had begun half an hour it would be a relief to find himself in the lighted playhouse among those rollicking actors he went down to the theatre and made his way straight to the green room there was a good house a great house mr elgood told james and the commonwealth's shares were already above par everybody was in high spirits and most people's breath was slightly flavoured with beer we have been turning away money at the gallery door said mr dempson who was dressed for moses i should think to the tune of seventeen shillings this is the right sort of thing sir it reminds me of my poor old governor's time when the drama was respected in the land and all the gentry within a twenty-mile radius used to come to his benefit justina was the maria of this piece dressed in an ancient white satin or rather an ancient satin which had once been white but which by long service and frequent cleaning had mellowed to a pleasing canary colour she had some airy puffings of muslin about her and wore a black sash in memory of her departed parents and her plenteous brown hair fell over her neck and shoulders in innocent ringlets justina had never looked prettier than she looked to-night she even had a round of applause when she made her curtsy to sir peter the actors told her that she was growing a deuced fine girl after all and that one of these days she would learn how to act was it the new joy in her soul that embellished and exalted her james thought her lovely as he stood at the wing and talked to her miss vilroy who was esteemed a beauty by her friends seemed to this uninitiated youth a painted sepulchre for she had whitened her complexion to match her powdered wig and accentuated her eyebrows and eyelids with indian ink and picked out her lips with a rose-pink saucer and incardined her cheekbones by which artistic efforts she had attained that kind of beauty to which distance lends enchantment but which seen too near is apt to repel 
miss vilroy had the house with her however she had the audience altogether with her as lady teasel and being a virtuous matron cared not to court james penwin's admiration indeed she was very glad to see that the foolish young man was taken with poor judy mrs dempson told her husband for poor dear judy wasn't everybody's money and about the worst actress the footlights ever shone upon mr elgood being in high spirits and feeling himself flush of money his share in to-night's receipts could hardly be less than fifteen shillings was moved to an act of hospitality i'll tell you what i'll do mr penwin he said the treating shan't be all on your side though you're a rich young swell and we are poor beggars of actors come home with us to-night after the last piece and i'll give you a lobster judy knows how to make a salad and if you can drink bitter you shall have enough to swim in mr penwin expressed his ability to drink bitter beer which he infinitely preferred to champagne but what would he not have drunk for the pleasure of being in justina's society it's a poor place to ask you to come to said mr elgood dempson and i go shares in the sitting-room and we don't keep it altogether as tidy as we might the womankind say but i'll take care the lobster's a good one for i'll go out and pick it myself i don't play in the last piece luckily the afterpiece was a roland for an oliver in which justina enacted a walking lady who had very little to do so there was plenty of time for james to talk to her as she stood at the wing where they were quite alone and had nobody to overhear them except a passing scene-shifter now and then this seemed to james penwin the happiest night he had ever spent in his life though he was inhaling dust and escaped gas all the time it seemed a night that flew by on golden wings he thought he must have been dreaming when the curtain fell and the lights went out and people told him it was midnight he waited amidst darkness and chaos while justina ran away to change her stage dress for the garments of common life she was not long absent and they went out together arm in arm it was only a little way from the theatre to the actor's lodgings so james persuaded her to walk round by the cathedral just to see how it looked in the moonlight your father's at half-past twelve for supper you know he pleaded and it's only just the quarter the big bell chimed at the instant in confirmation of this statement and justina who could not for her life have said no assented hesitatingly the cathedral had a colossal grandeur seen from so near every finial and water spout clearly defined in the moonlight justina looked up at it with reverent eyes isn't it grand she whispered one could fancy that god inhabits it if i were an ignorant creature from some savage land and nobody told me it was a church i think i should know that it was god's house should you said james lightly i think i should as soon take it for a corn exchange or a wild beast show oh you see i have no instinctive sense of the fitness of things you would just suit clissold he has all those queer fancies i've seen him stand and talk to himself like a lunatic sometimes among the lakes and mountains what you call the artistic faculty i suppose they walked around the cathedral square arm in arm justina charmed to silence by the solemn splendour of the scene all was quiet at this end of the city up at the subscription rooms there might be riot and confusion but here in this ancient square among these old gabled houses almost coeval with the cathedral silence reigned supreme justina james began presently you told me yesterday that you didn't care about being an actress i told you that i hated it answered the girl candidly i suppose i should like it better if i were a favourite like vilroy i prefer your acting to miss vilroy's ever so much you do it rather too quietly perhaps but that's better than yelling as she does i'm glad you like me best said justina softly but then you're not the british public yes i hate theatres i should like to live in a little cottage deep 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 down in the country where there were woods and fields and a shining blue river i could keep chickens and live upon the money i got by the new laid eggs don't you think it would be better to have a nice large house with gardens and orchards and a park in a wild hilly country beside the atlantic ocean what should i do with a big house and how should i earn money to pay for it she asked laughing suppose someone else were to find the money someone who has plenty and only wants the girl he loves to share it with him justina you and i met yesterday for the first time 
but you are the only girl i ever loved and i love you with all my heart it may seem sudden but it's as true as that i live and speak to you to-night sudden echoed justina it seems like a dream but you mustn't speak of it any more i won't believe a word you say i won't listen to a word it can't be true let's go home immediately hark there's the half-hour take me home please mr penwin not till you have answered me one question no no yes justina i must be answered i have made up my mind and i want to know yours do you think you care for me just a little i won't answer it is all more foolish than a dream it is the sweetest dream that ever was dreamed by me obstinate lips cannot i make them speak no then the eyes shall tell me what i want to know look up justina just one little look and then we'll go home the heavy lids were lifted slowly shyly and the young lover looked into the depths of those dark eyes a girl's first purest love that love which is so near religion shone there like a star james penwin needed no other answer you shall never act again unless you like darling he said i'll speak to your father to-night and we'll be married as soon as the business can be done when you leave eversham it shall be as mistress of penwin manor there is not a soul belonging to me who has the faintest right to question what i do and it is my duty to marry young the penwin race has been sorely dwindling of late if i were to die unmarried my estate would go to my cousin a fellow i don't care two straws about perhaps this was said more to himself than to justina she understood nothing about estates and heirships she to whom property was an unknown quantity she only knew that life seemed changed to a delicious dream the hard workaday world which had not been too kind to her had melted away and left her in paradise her hand trembled beneath the touch of her lover as he clasped it close upon his arm they walked slowly through the silent shadowy street so narrow that the moonlight hardly reached it and went in by the shop door which had been left ajar in a friendly way for their reception what a time you've been judy cried mr elgood standing before the table stirring a bowl of green stuff with various cruets at his elbow i've had to make the salad myself sit down and make yourself at home penwin Dempson, draw the cork of that bitter the right thing nowadays is to pour it into a jug when i was a young man we couldn't have too much froth mrs Dempson had smartened her usual toilette with a bow or two and a black lace veil which she wore gracefully festooned about her head to conceal the curl papers in which she had endued her tresses for to-morrow evening's performance she would be too tired to curl her hair by the time they got rid of this foolish young man the supper was even gayer than the luncheon on the racecourse there was a large dish of cold corned beef ready sliced from the cook's shop a cucumber a couple of lobsters and a bowl of salad crisp and oily upon which mr elgood prided himself there are not many things that this child can do he remarked but he flatters himself he can dress a salad the ale being infinitely better of its kind than the champagne provided by the waterfowl proved more exhilarating james penwin's spirits rose to their highest point he invited everybody to penwin manor promised miss vailroy a season's hunting mr Dempson any amount of sport they would all go down to cornwall together and have a jolly time of it not a word did he say about his intended marriage even though elated by beer he felt a restraining delicacy which kept him silent on this one subject justina was the quietest of the party she sat by her father's side looking her prettiest with eyes that joy had glorified and a delicate bloom upon her cheeks she neither ate nor drank but listened to her lover's careless rattle and felt more and more that life was like a dream how handsome he was how good how brave how brilliant her simplicity accepted the young man's undergraduate jocosity for wit of the purest water she laughed her gay young laugh at his jokes if you could laugh like that on the stage judy you'd make as good a comedy actress as mrs jordan said her father as if any one could laugh naturally to a cue cried justina they sat late 
almost as late as they had sat on the previous night and when james rose at last to take his leave urged thereto by the unquiet slumbers of vilroy who had fallen asleep in an uncomfortable position on the rickety old sofa and whose snores were too loud to be agreeable mr elgood had arrived at that condition of mind in which life wears its rosiest hue he was anxious to see his guest home but this favour james declined it's an commonly bad row urged the heavy father you'd bear let me see a home cut throw row which james interpreted to mean a cut-throat road don't like it to go lone justina watched her father with a troubled look it was hard that he should show himself thus degraded just now when but for this life would be all sweetness james smiled at her reassuringly undisturbed by the thought that such a man might be an undesirable father-in-law he pushed his entertainer back into his seat talk about seeing me home he said laughing why it isn't half an hour's walk good night mr dempson i'm afraid i've kept your wife up too late after her exertions and lady teasel will you open the door for me justina justina went down the narrow crooked staircase with him one of those staircases of the good old times better suited to a belfry tower than a dwelling-house they went into the dark little shop together and just at the door amidst odours of irish butter and dutch cheese scotch herrings and spanish onions james took his betrothed into his arms and kissed her fondly proudly as if he had won a princess for his helpmeet remember darling you are to be my wife if i had a hundred relations to bully me they wouldn't make me change my mind but i've no one to call me to account and you are the girl of my choice i haven't been able to speak to your father to-night but i'll talk to him to-morrow morning and settle everything good-night and god bless you my own dear love one more kiss and he was gone she stood on the doorstep watching him as he walked up the narrow street the moon was gone and only a few stars shone dimly behind the drifting clouds the night wind came coldly up from the waterside yonder and made her shiver a man crossed the street and walked briskly past her going in the same direction as james penwin she noticed absently enough that he wore a heavy overcoat and muffler for defence against that chill night air no doubt but more clothing than people generally wear in the early days of june nine other sins only speak murder shrieks out very radiant were justina's dreams during the brief hours that remained to her for slumber after that bohemian supper party dreams of her sweet new life in which all things were bright and strange she was with her lover in a garden the dream garden which those sleepers know who have seen but little of earthly gardens a garden where there were marble terraces and statues and fountains and a placid lake lying in a valley of bloom a vision made up of faint memories of pictures she had seen or poems she had read they were together and happy in the noonday sunshine and then the dream changed they were together in the moonlight again not outside the cathedral but in the long solemn nave she could see the distant altar gleaming faintly in the silver light while a solemn strain of music like the muffled chanting of a choir rolled along the echoing arches overhead then the silvery light faded the music changed to a harsh dirge-like cry and she woke to hear the raindrops pattering against her little dormer window justina's room was the worst of the three bedchambers and in the garret story and a shrill-voiced hawker bawling watercresses along the street she had the feeling of having overslept herself and not being provided with a watch had no power to ascertain the fact but was fain to dress as quickly as she could trusting to the cathedral clock to inform her of the hour to be late for rehearsal involved a good deal of snubbing from the higher powers even in a commonwealth the stage manager retained his authority and knew how to make himself disagreeable life seemed all reality again this morning as justina plaited her hair before the shabby little mirror and looked out at the dull grey sky the wet sloppy streets the general aspect of poverty and damp which pervaded the prospect she had need to ask herself if yesterday and the night before had not been all dreaming she the chosen bride of a rich young squire the mistress of penwin manor it was surely too fond a fancy she whose shabby weather-stained undergarments the green stuff-gown of two winters ago converted into a petticoat last year and worn threadbare the corset which a nursemaid might have despised 
lay yonder on the dilapidated rush-bottomed chair like the dull reality of cinderella's rags after the fairy ball had melted into air she hurried on her clothes more ashamed of their shabbiness than she had ever felt yet and ran down to the sitting-room which smelt of stale lobster and tobacco the windows not having been opened on account of the rain breakfast was laid a sloppy cup and saucer the dorsal bone of a haddock on a greasy plate indicated that some one had breakfasted the cathedral clock chimed eleven justina's rehearsal only began at half-past she had time to take her breakfast comfortably if she liked her first act was to open the window and let in the air and the rain anything was better than stale lobster then she looked into the teapot and wondered who had breakfasted and if her father were up then she poured out a cup of tea and sipped it slowly wondering if james penwin would come to the theatre while she was rehearsing he had asked her the hour of the rehearsal she thought she would see him there most likely and the dream would begin again a jug of wild flowers stood on the table by the window the flowers she had gathered two days ago before she had seen him they were a little faded wild flowers droop so early but in no wise dead and yet a passion had been born and attained its majority since those field flowers were plucked could she believe in it could she trust in it her heart sank at the thought that her lover was trifling with her that there was nothing but foolishness in this first love dream her father had not yet left his room justina saw his one presentable pair of boots waiting for him outside his door as she went by on her way downstairs she found mr and mrs dempson at rehearsal both with a faded and washed-out appearance as if the excitement of the previous day had taken all the colour out of them the rehearsal went forward in a straggling way that good house of last night seemed to have demoralised the commonwealth or perhaps the scene of dissipation going on out of doors the races and the holiday-makers and bustle of the town may have had a disturbing influence the stage manager lost his temper and said business was business and he didn't want the burlesque to be a munge a word borrowed from some unknown tongue which evidently made an impression upon the actors justina had been in the theatre for a little more than an hour when mr elgood burst suddenly into the green room pale as a sheet of letter-paper and wearing his hat anyhow has anybody heard of it he asked looking round at the assembly mrs dempson was sitting in a corner covering a satin shoe justina stood by the window studying her part in the burlesque mr dempson with three or four kindred spirits was smoking on some stone steps just outside the green room everybody looked round at this sudden appeal wondering at the actor's scared expression of countenance why what's up mate asked mr dempson is the cathedral on fire bear up under the affliction i dare say it's insured nobody has heard then heard what of the murder what murder who's murdered cried every one at once except justina her thoughts were slower than the rest perhaps she stood looking at her father fixed as a marble that poor young fellow that good-hearted young fellow who stood treat yesterday did you ever know such a blackguard thing dents shot from behind a hedge on the road between lowgate and the waterfowl only found this morning between five and six by some labourers going to their work dead and cold shot through the heart he's lying at the lowgate arms just inside the archway and there's to be a coroner's inquest at two o'clock this afternoon great heaven how awful cried dempson what was the motive robbery i suppose so it was thought at first for his pockets were empty turned inside out but the police searched the ditch for the weapon which they didn't find but found his watch and purse and pocket-book half an hour ago buried in the mud as if they had been rammed down with a stick so there must have been revenge at the bottom of the business unless it was that the fellows who did it i dare say there was more than one took the alarm and hid the plunder with the intention of fishing it up again on the quiet afterwards it looks more like that said mr dempson the haymakers are beginning to be about a bad lot any scoundrel can use a scythe don't cry old woman this to his wife who was sobbing hysterically over the satin shoe he was a nice young fellow and we're all very sorry for him but crying won't bring him back such a happy day as we had with him sobbed the leading lady i never enjoyed myself so much and to think that he should be m murdered 
it's too dreadful nobody noticed justina till the thin straight figure suddenly swayed like a slender sapling in a high wind when matthew elgood darted forward and caught her in his arms just as she was falling her face lay on his shoulder white and set i'm blessed if she hasn't fainted cried her father poor judy i forgot that he was rather sweet upon her you didn't ought to have blurted it out like that exclaimed mrs dempson more sympathetic than grammatical run and get a glass of water dempson don't you fuss with her to the father i'll bring her to and take her home and get her to lie down a bit she shan't go on with rehearsal whatever pycroft says pycroft was the stage manager she'll be all right at night justina after having water splashed over her poor pale face recovered consciousness stared with a blank awful look at her father and the rest and then went home to her lodgings meekly leaning on mrs dempson's arm a bleak awakening from her dream yes it was all true the gay light-hearted lad the prosperous lord of penwin manor had been taken away from the fair fresh world from the life which for his unsated spirit meant happiness slain by a secret assassin's hand he lay in the darkened club-room of the lowgate arms awaiting the inquest the eversham police were hard at work but not alone the case was felt to be an important one a gentleman of property was not to be murdered with impunity had the victim been some agricultural labourer slain in a drunken fray some turnpike man murdered for plunder the eversham constabulary would have felt itself able to cope with the difficulties of the case but this was a darker business a crime which was likely to be heard of throughout the length and breadth of the land and the eversham constable felt that the eyes of europe were upon him he knew that his own men were slow and blundering and doubtful of their power to get at the bottom of the mystery telegraphed to spinnersbury for a couple of skilled detectives who came swift as an express train could carry them business is business said the eversham constable whatever reward may be offered by and by there's a hundred already by our own magistrates we work together as between man and man and share it honourably that's understood replied the gentleman from spinnersbury the chief centre of that northern district and affairs being thus established on an agreeable footing the skilled detectives went to work the watch and purse had been found by the local police before the arrival of these spinnersbury men the purse was empty so it still remained an open question whether plunder had not been the motive the man who took the money might have been afraid to take the watch as a compromising bit of property likely to bring him into trouble higlet one of the spinnersbury men went straight to the waterfowl to hunt up the surroundings of the dead man smelt his companion remained in eversham where he made a round of the low-class public houses with a view of discovering what doubtful characters had been hanging about the town during the last day or two a race meeting is an occasion when doubtful characters are apt to be abundant yet it seemed a curious thing that mr penwin whom nobody supposed to be a winner of money should have been waylaid on his return from the town rather than one of those numerous gentlemen who had gone home from the rooms that night with full pockets and wine bemused heads mr higlet found the waterfowl people as communicative as he could desire they had done nothing but talk about the murder all the morning with a ghoulish gusto and could talk of nothing else from them mr higlet heard a good deal that set his sapient mind working in what he considered a happy direction smelt may do all he can in the town he thought but i'm not sorry i came here the landlady who was dolefully loquacious took mr higlet aside having ascertained that he was a detective officer from spinnersbury and informed him that there were circumstances about the case she didn't like not that she wished to throw out anything against anybody and it would weigh heavy on her mind if she suspected them that were innocent still thought was free and she had her thoughts pressed home by the detective she went a little further and said she didn't like the look of things about mr clissold who is mr clissold asked higlet mr penwin's friend they came here together three days ago and seemed as comfortable as possible together like brothers and they went out fishing together the day before yesterday and then in the evening they brought home some of the play-actors to supper the best of everything and going up to bed they had high words me and my good man heard them for the loud talking wakened us and it was all along of some girl 
and they were both very much excited and mr penwin banged his door that violent as to shake the house being an old house as you may see a girl said mr higlet that sometimes means mischief but there's not much in a few high words between two young gentlemen after supper even if it's about a girl they were all right and friendly again next morning i suppose i dare say they would have been replied the hostess only mr glissold went out early next morning with his fishing-rod leaving a bit of a note for mr penwin and didn't come back till twelve o'clock to-day curious said mr higlet that's what struck me mr penwin expected him back yesterday evening and left word to say where he'd gone if his friend came in of course mr clissold was awfully shocked when he came in to-day and heard of the murder i don't think i ever saw a man turn so white but it did strike me as strange that he should be out all night just that very night did he tell you where he had been no he went out of the house again directly with the police he was going to telegraph to mr penwin's lawyer and some of his relations i think ready to make himself useful muttered mr higlet i should like to have a look round these gentlemen's rooms being duly armed with authority this privilege was allowed mr higlet he examined bedchambers and sitting-room looked at the few and simple belongings of the travellers who were naturally not encumbered with much luggage finding little to employ him here mr higlet took a snack of lunch in the public parlour heard the gossip of the loungers at the bar through the half-open door meditated smoked a pipe and went out into the high road he met smelt who seemed dispirited nothing turned up asked higlet less than half nothing how's yourself well i think i'm on the right lay but it's rather dark at present they went back to the inn together conferring in half whispers a quarter of an hour later maurice clissold returned from his mission he looked pale and wearied and hardly saw the two men whom he passed in the porch he had scarcely entered the house when these two men came close up to him one on each side i arrest you on suspicion of being concerned in the murder of james penwin said higlet and bear in mind that anything you say now will be used against you by and by remarked smelt End of Volume 1, Chapters 8 and 9volume one chapters ten and eleven of a strange world by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain ten nothing comes amiss so money comes with all the inquest was held at two o'clock and adjourned few facts were elicited beyond those which had been in everybody's mouth that morning when matthew elgood heard of the murder at the bar of that tavern where he took his noontide dram the three penn'orth of gin and bitters which revivified him after last night's orgies james penwin had been shot through the heart by a hidden assassin it seemed tolerably clear that the murderer had taken aim from behind the ragged bushes which divided the low-lying land by the river from the road just at this point there were footprints on the marshy turf not the prints of a clodhopper's bulky boots the line of footsteps indicated that the murderer had entered the field by a gate a hundred yards nearer the city and had afterwards gone across the grass to the towpath here on harder ground the footsteps ceased altogether they were the impressions of a gentleman's soul or so thought the detectives who were anxious to find a correspondence between these footprints and the boots of maurice clissold here however they were somewhat at fault maurice's stout shooting-boot made a wider and longer print on the sward he may have worn a smaller boot last night said smelt but they say up at the inn that he has only two pairs one off one on both the same make i looked at those he's wearing and they are just as big as these this was a slight check to the chain which had run out pretty freely till now true that there seemed little or no motive for the crime but the one fact of the quarrel was something to go upon and the curious absence of maurice clissold on that particular night was a circumstance that would have to be accounted for who could tell how serious that quarrel might have been perhaps the last outbreak of a long smouldering flame perhaps a dispute involving deepest interests further evidence would come out by degrees at any rate they had got their man maurice was present at the inquest very calm and quiet he made no statement whatever by the advice of the local solicitor mr brent whose aid he had not rejected he would have been more agitated perhaps by the fact of his friend's untimely death but for this monstrous accusation 
that made him iron the inquest was adjourned the facts being so few and mr clissold was taken to ebersham castle a medieval fortress which our modern civilization had converted into the county jail here he was comfortable enough so far as surroundings went for he was a young man of adventurous mind and tastes so simple that a hard bed and a carpetless room were no afflictions to him mr brent the solicitor visited him in his confinement and discussed the facts of the case it's hard upon you both ways said the lawyer hard to lose your friend and still harder to find yourself exposed to this monstrous suspicion i don't care two straws for the suspicion answered maurice but i do care very much for the loss of my friend he was one of the best fellows that ever lived so bright so brimming over with freshness and vitality if i had not seen him lying in that tavern stark and cold i couldn't bring myself to believe in his death it's hard to believe in it even with the memory of that poor murdered clay fresh in my mind poor james i loved him like a younger brother you have no knowledge of any circumstances in his life that can help us to find the murderer asked mr brent i know of nothing he had picked up some people i didn't care about his being intimate with strolling players who are acting at the theatre in this place but my worst fear was that he might be trapped into some promise of marriage i can hardly fancy these people concerned in a crime no they are for the most part harmless vagabonds replied the lawyer do you know where mr penwin spent last night with these people no doubt a man called elgood and his daughter the man ought to be called as a witness i should think unquestionably we'll have him before the coroner next saturday and we'll keep an eye upon him meanwhile the inquest had been adjourned for three days to give time for new facts to be elicited your friend had no enemies you say not one answered clissold he was one of those men who never make an enemy he hadn't the strength of mind to refuse a favour to the veriest blackguard it was my knowledge of his character that made me anxious about this elgood's acquaintance i saw that he was fascinated by the girl and feared he might be lured into some false position that was the sole cause of our dispute the other night why did you leave him because i saw that my interference irritated him and was likely to arouse a lurking obstinacy which i knew to be in his nature he was such a spoiled child of fortune that i fancied if i left him alone to take his own way his passion would cool opposition fired him there is only one awkward circumstance in the whole case as regards yourself i mean what is that asked clissold your objection to state where you spent last night i should be sorry if i were driven to so poor a defence as an alibi i don't think there's any fear of that the evidence against you amounts to so little but why not simplify matters by accounting for your time up to your return to-day you only came back to ebersham by the twelve o'clock train from spinnersbury you say i came by that train do you think any of the porters or ticket collectors would remember seeing you not likely the train was crowded with people coming to the races it was as much as i could do to get a seat i had to scramble into a third-class compartment as the train began to move but why not refer to someone at spinnersbury to prove your absence from ebersham last night when my neck is in danger i may do that in the meantime you may as well let the matter drop i have my own reasons for not saying where i was last night unless i am very hard pushed mr brent was obliged to be satisfied the case against his client was of the weakest as yet but it was curious that this young man should so resolutely refuse to give a straightforward account of himself mr brent had felt positive of his client's innocence up to this point but this refusal disturbed him he went home with an uncomfortable feeling that there was something wrong somewhere messrs higlet and smelt were not idle during the interval higlet lodged at the waterfowl and heard all the gossip of the house where the one absorbing topic was the murder of james penwin among other details the spinnersbury detective heard mrs marport the landlady speak of a certain letter which the morning's post brought mr clissold the day he went away it came by the first delivery which was before eight o'clock jane the housemaid took it up to mr clissold's room with his boots and shaving water i never set eyes upon such a letter said mrs marport it seemed to have been all round the world for sport as the saying is 
it had been to some address in london and to wales and to cumberland and was all over postmarks i suppose it must have been something rather particular to have been sent after him so a bill i dare say or a lawyer's letter perhaps oh no it wasn't it was a lady's handwriting i took particular notice of that any cress or monogram asked higlet no there was nothing on the envelope but the paper was as thick as parchment whoever wrote that letter was quite the lady ah said higlet mr clissold's sweetheart very likely that's what i've been thinking and that it was that letter perhaps that took him off so suddenly and that he really may have been far away from eversham on the night of the murder if he was he'll be able to prove it replied mr higlet who was not inclined to entertain the idea of mr clissold's innocence to earn his share of the reward he must find the murderer and it mattered very little to higlet where he found him in the afternoon of the day succeeding the inquest two persons of some importance to the case arrived at eversham they came by the same train and had travelled together from london one was churchill penwin the inheritor of the penwin estate the other was mr pergament the family solicitor chief partner in the firm of pergament and pergament new square lincoln's inn churchill penwin and the solicitor met at king's cross station five minutes before the starting of the ten o'clock express for eversham they were very well acquainted with each other churchill's meagre portion inherited under the will of old mrs penwin his grandmother who had been an heiress in a small way having passed through mr pergament's hands nicholas penwin's will which disposed of penwin manor for two generations had been drawn up by mr pergament's father and all business connected with the penwin's estate had been transacted in mr pergament's office for the last hundred years pergaments had been born and died during the century but the office was the same as in the time of penruddock penwin who inheriting a farm of a hundred and fifty acres or so had made a fortune in the east indies and extended the estate by various important additions to its present dimensions for before the days of penruddock the race of penwin had declined in splendour though it was always known and acknowledged that the penwins were one of the oldest families in cornwall of course mr pergament knowing nicholas penwin's will by heart was perfectly aware of the alteration which this awful event of the murder made in churchill's circumstances churchill had been a cadet of the house heretofore though his cousin james senior by nearly ten years a person of no importance whatever mr pergament had treated him with a free and easy friendliness was always ready to do him a good turn sent him a brief now and then and so on to-day mr pergament was deferential the old friendliness was toned down to a subdued respect it seemed as if mr pergament's eye respectfully raised to churchill's broad pale brow in imagination beheld above it the round and top of sovereignty the lordship of penwin manor very distressing event murmured the lawyer as they seated themselves opposite each other in the first-class carriage this was a comfortable train to travel by not arriving at eversham till three the race traffic had been cleared off by a special at an earlier hour very returned churchill gravely of course i cannot be expected to be acutely grieved by an event which raises me from a working man's career to affluence especially as i knew so little of my cousin but i was profoundly shocked at the circumstances of his death a commonplace vulgar murder for gain i apprehend committed by some rustic ruffian i doubt if that class of man thinks much more of murder than of sparrow shooting i hope they'll get him whoever he is said the lawyer if the acuteness of the police can be stimulated by the hope of reward that motive shall not be wanting returned churchill i shall offer a couple of hundred pounds for the conviction of the murderer very proper murmured mr pergament approvingly no you had seen very little of poor james i apprehend he went on in a conversational tone i doubt if he and i met half a dozen times i saw him once at eton soon after my father's death when i was spending a day or two at a shooting-box near bracknell and walked over to have a look at the college he was a little curly-headed chap playing cricket and i remember tipping him ill as i could afford the half-sovereign one can't see a schoolboy without tipping him i dare say the young rascal ran off and spent my hard-earned shillings on strawberry ices and pound cake as soon as my back was turned i saw him a few years afterwards in his mother's house somewhere near baker street 
she asked me to a dinner party and as she made rather a point of it i went a slowish business as women's dinners generally are all the delicacies that were just going out of season and some elderly ladies to adorn the board i asked james to breakfast at my club put him up for the garrick and i think that's about the last time i ever saw him poor lad sighed the family solicitor such a promising young fellow but i doubt if he would have kept the property together there was very little of his grandfather old squire penwin about him a wonderful man that vigorous in body and mind to the last year of his life i spent a week at penwin about seventeen years ago just before your poor uncle was killed by those abominable redskins in canada i can see the squire before me now a hale old country gentleman always dressed in a lincoln green coat with basket buttons bedford cords and vinegar tops hunted three times a week every season after he was seventy years of age the asherton smith stamp of man the rising generation will never ripen into that kind of thing mr penwin the stuff isn't in em i never saw much of my grandfather said churchill in his grave quiet voice which expressed so little emotion save when deepest passion warmed his spirit to eloquence my father's marriage offended him as i dare say you heard at the time mr pergament nodded assent prejudice prejudice he murmured blandly elderly gentlemen who live on their estates are prone to that sort of thing he did my mother the honour to call her a shopkeeper's daughter her father was a brewer at exeter in a very fair way of business upon which my father who had some self-respect and a great deal of respect for his wife told the squire that he should take care not to intrude the shopkeeper's daughter upon his notice if i hadn't made my will said my grandfather it might be the worse for you but i have made my will as you all know i made it six years ago and i don't mean to budge from it when i do a thing it's done when i say a thing it's said i never undo or unsay the estate will be kept together for the next half century i think come what may just like him said mr pergament chuckling the man to the life how well you hit him off i've heard my father repeat that speech a good many times answered churchill then you never saw the old squire once only i was a day-boy at westminster and one afternoon when i was playing ball in the quadrangle a curious-looking elderly gentleman with a drab overcoat and a broad-brimmed white hat breeches and top boots a bunch of seals at his fob and a gold-headed hunting crop in his hand came into the court and looked about him he looked like a figure out of a sporting print yet he looked like a gentleman all the same can anybody tell me where to find a boy called penwin he inquired i ran forward what you're churchill penwin are you youngster he asked with his hands upon my shoulders looking at me straight from under his bushy grey eyebrows yes you're a genuine penwin none of the brewer here it's a pity your father was a younger son you wouldn't have made a bad squire i dare say you've heard of your grandfather yes sir very often i said are you he i am i'm up in london for a week and i took it into my head i should like to have a look at you it isn't likely the estate will ever come to you but if by any chance it should come your way i hope you'll think of the old squire sometimes when he lies under the sod and try and keep things together in my way he tipped me a five-pound note shook hands and walked out of the quad and that's the only time i ever saw nicholas penwin curious said mr pergament by the way talking of estates what is penwin worth my inheritance seems so remote a contingency that i have never taken the trouble to ask the question the estate is a fine one replied the lawyer joining the tips of his fat fingers and speaking with unction as of a favourite and familiar subject but land in cornwall as you are doubtless aware is not the most remunerative investment the farm lands of penwin produce on an average a bare three per cent on their value that is to say about three pounds an acre there are eleven hundred acres of farm land and thus we have three thousand three hundred pounds but continued the lawyer swelling with importance 
the more remunerative portion of the estate consists of mines which after lying idle for more than a quarter of a century were reopened at the latter end of the squire's life and are now being worked by a company who pay a royalty upon their profits which royalty in the aggregate amounts to something between two and four thousand a year and is likely to increase as they have lately opened a new tin mine and come upon a promising load my grandfather risked nothing in the working of these mines i suppose no exclaimed the lawyer with tremendous emphasis squire penwin was much too wise for that he let other people take the risks and only stood in for the profits they talked about the estate for some little time after this and then churchill threw himself back into his corner opened a newspaper and appeared to read appeared only for his eyes were fixed upon one particular bit of the column before him in that steady gaze which betokens deepest thought in sooth he had enough to think of the revolution which james penwin's death had wrought in his fate was a change to set most men thinking from a struggling man just beginning to make a little way in an arduous profession he found himself all at once worth something like seven thousand a year master of an estate which would bring with it the respect of his fellow-men position and power the means of climbing higher than any penwin had yet risen on the ladder of life i shall not bury myself in a stupid old manor-house he thought like my grandfather and yet it will be rather a pleasant thing playing at being a country squire most of all he thought of her who was to share his fortunes the new bright life they could lead together of her beauty which had an imperial grandeur that needed a splendid setting of her power to charm which would be an influence to help his aggrandizement he fancied himself member for penwin making his mark in the house as he had already begun to make it at the bar literature and statecraft should combine to help him on he saw himself far away in the fair prosperous future leader of his party he thought that when he first crossed the threshold of the senate house as a member he should say to himself almost involuntarily some day i shall enter this door as prime minister he was not a man whose desires were bounded by the idea of a handsome house and gardens a good stable wine cellar and cook he asked fortune for something more than these if not for his own sake for his betrothed he would wish to be something more than a prosperous country gentleman madge would expect him to be famous madge would be disappointed if he failed to make his mark in the world he fell to calculating how long it would have been in the common course of things plodding on at literature and his profession before he would have won a position to justify his marrying madge bellingham far away to the extreme point in perspective stretched the distance he gave a short bitter sigh of very weariness it would have been ten or fifteen years before i could have given her as good a home as her father's he said to himself why fatigue one's brain by such profitless speculations she would never have been my wife she is a girl who must have made a great marriage she might be true as steel but everybody else would have been against me her father and her sister would have worried her almost to death and some morning when i was marching bravely on towards the distant goal i should have received a letter tear-blotted remorseful telling me that she had yielded to the persuasions of her father and had consented to marry the millionaire stockbroker or the wealthy lordling as the case might be who is this mr clissold churchill asked by and by throwing aside his unread paper and emerging from that brown study in which he had been absorbed for the last hour or so a college friend of poor james his senior by some years they had been reading together in the north you must have met clissold in axminster square i should think when you dined with your aunt he and james were inseparable i have some recollection of a tall dark brown youth who seemed one of the family that was young clissold no doubt civil of him to telegraph to me said churchill and there the subject dropped the two gentlemen yawned a little churchill looked out of the window and relapsed into thoughtfulness and so the time went on and the journey came to an end churchill and the lawyer drove straight to the police station to inquire if the murderer had been found there they heard what had befallen maurice clissold absurd exclaimed the solicitor no possible motive the official in charge shook his head sagely there appears to have been a quarrel he said in his slow ponderous way 
between the two young gents the night previous high words was overheard at the inn and on the night of the murder mr clissel was absent which he is unwilling to account for his time mr pergament looked at churchill as much as to say this is serious young men do not murder each other on account of a few high words said mr penwin i dare say mr clissold will give a satisfactory account of himself when the proper time comes no one in their right senses could suspect a gentleman of such a crime a common robbery with violence on the high road in the race week too when a place is always running over with ruffians of every kind i beg your pardon sir said the superintendent but that's the curious part of the case the footsteps of the murderer have been traced mr penwin was shot at from behind a hedge you see and the print of the sole looks like the print of a gentleman's boot narrow and a small heel nothing of the clodhopper about it the ground's a bit of marshy clay just there and the impression was uncommonly clear churchill penwin looked at the man thoughtfully for a moment with that penetrating glance of his which was wont to survey an adverse witness in order to see what might be made of him the glance of a man familiar with the study of his fellow-men there are vagabonds enough in the world who wear decently made boots he said especially your racing vagabonds he made all necessary inquiries about the inquest and then adjourned to one of the chief hotels crowded with racing men though not to suffocation as at the summer meeting you'll watch the case in the interests of the family of course he said to mr pergament i should like you to do what you can for this mr clissold too there can be no ground for his arrest i should suppose not he and james were such friends and then the empty purse shows that the murder was done for gain my cousin may have won money or have been supposed to have won on the race-course and may have been watched and followed by some prowling ruffian tout or tramp or gypsy it's odd that mr clissold refused to account for his time last night yes that is curious but i feel pretty sure the explanation will come when he's pressed and then the gentlemen dined together comfortably a little later on mr pergament got up to go out there are the last melancholy details to be arranged he said have you any wish on that point as his nearest relation only that his own wishes should be respected his father and mother are buried at kensal green i dare say he would rather be there than at penwin one would suppose so then i'll go and see about the removal and so on said mr pergament taking up his hat by the way perhaps before it is too late you would like to see your cousin churchill gave a little start almost a shudder no he said i never went in for that kind of thing eleven what then you knew not this red work indeed justina lived through the day and acted at night pretty much as she had been accustomed to act but she saw her audience dimly through a heavy blinding cloud and the glare of the footlights seemed to her hideous as the fires of pandemonium people spoke to her in the dressing-room where she dragged on her shabby finery and dabbed a little rouge on her pale wan face and she answered them somehow mechanically she had lived that kind of life among the same people so long that the mere business of existence went on without any effort of her own she felt like a clock had been wound and must go its appointed time she sat in a corner of the green room looking straight before her and thought how her bright new world had melted away and no one took any particular notice of her mrs dempson had been kind and compassionate and after justina's fainting fit had dabbed her forehead with vinegar and water and sat with her arm round the girl's waist consoling her and reasoning with her reminding her that they had only known poor mr penwin a day and a half and that it was against nature to lament him as if he had been a near relation or an old friend who in sober middle age when the sordid cares of everyday life are paramount who when youth's morning is past can comprehend the young heart's passionate mystery the love which like some bright tropical flower buds and blooms in a single day the love which is more than half fancy the love of a lover of no common clay but the fair incarnation of girlhood's poetic dream 
love wherein the senses have no more part than the phosphor lights of a rank marsh in the clear splendor of the stars justina kept the secret of her brief dream she thought mrs dempson and even her father would have laughed her to scorn had she told them that the generous young stranger had asked her to be his wife she held her peace and shut herself in her garret chamber and flung her weary head face downward on the flock pillow and thought of her murdered lover thought of the bright handsome face fixed in death's marble stillness and cursed the wretch who had slain him mr elgood and his daughter were both subpoenaed for the adjourned inquest the actor who rather rejoiced in the opportunity of exhibiting his powers in a new arena and seeing his name in the papers appeared in grand form on the morning of the examination he had brushed his coat sported a clean white waistcoat and a smart blue necktie wore a pair of somewhat ancient buff leather gloves and carried the cane which he was wont to flourish as the exasperated father of old-fashioned comedy justina entered the room pale as a sheet and sat by her father's side with her large dark eyes fixed on the coroner as if from his lips could issue the secret of her lover's doom she had the most imperfect idea of the nature of an inquest and the coroner's power the jury were seated round the coroner at the upper end of the room mr pergament the solicitor stood at the end of the table ready to put any questions he might desire to have answered by the witnesses on the right of the coroner a little way from the jury sat maurice clissold with a constable at his side nearly opposite him and next to the lawyer stood the new master of penwin manor ready to prompt a question if he saw his solicitor at fault churchill and mr pergament had gone into the case thoroughly together with the spinnersbury detectives and the local constabulary and had their facts pretty well in hand the jury answered to their names and the inquiry began mr pergament interrogating the coroner taking notes of the evidence mr elgood was one of the first witnesses sworn i believe you were in the company of the deceased on the night or rather morning of the murder said the coroner yes he supped at my lodging on that night alone with you no mr dempson and his wife and my daughter were of the party at what hour did mr penwin leave you the actor's countenance assumed a look of perplexity it was half-past twelve before we sat down to supper he said but i can't exactly say how long we sat afterwards we smoked a few cigars and to be candid were somewhat convivial i haven't any clear idea as to the time my daughter may know why your daughter and not you she let him out through the shop when he went away our apartments are respectable but humble over a chandler's and your daughter was more temperate than you and may have some idea as to the time we'll ask her the question presently do you know if mr penwin had any considerable sum of money about him at the time he left you i don't know he had entertained us handsomely at the waterfowl on the previous night and he stood a carriage and any quantity of champagne to the races that day but i did not see him pay away any money except for the standing place for his carriage did you see him receive any money on the race-course no was he with you all day from twelve o'clock till half-past six in the evening and in that time you had no knowledge of his winning or receiving any sum of money no do you know of his being associated with disreputable people of any kind betting men for instance i know next to nothing of his associations there was an old gypsy woman who pretended to tell his fortune by the riverside the day before the races when he and the rest of us happened to be walking together he gave her money then and he gave her money on the race day when she was hanging about the carriage begging for drink churchill penwin who had been looking at the ground in a listening attitude hitherto raised his eyes at this juncture half in interrogation half in surprise is that all you know about the deceased continued mr pergament about all i had only enjoyed his acquaintance six-and-thirty hours at the time of the murder you can sit down said mr pergament justina elgood cried the summoning officer and justina stood up in the crowded room pale to the lips but unfaltering again churchill penwin raised those thoughtful eyes of his and looked at the girl's pallid face not a common type of girl 
he said to himself end of volume one chapters ten and eleven volume one chapters twelve and thirteen of a strange world by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain twelve brave spirits are a balsam to themselves maurice clissold also looked at the girl as she stood up at the end of the table in the little bit of clear space left for the witnesses a shaft of sunshine slanted from the skylight the room was built out from the house and lighted from the top an apartment usually devoted to masonic meetings and public dinners in that clear radiance the girl's face was wondrously spiritualized easy to fancy that some being not quite of this common earth stood there and that from those pale lips the awful truth would speak as if by the voice of revelation so maurice clissold thought as he looked at her never till this moment had she appeared to him beautiful and now it was no common beauty which he beheld in her but a strange and spiritual charm impossible of definition you were the last person who saw mr penwin alive except his murderer said mr pergament interrogatively after the usual formula had been gone through i opened the door for him when he went out after supper at what o'clock half past two was he perfectly sober at that time oh yes with an indignant look was he going back to the waterfowl alone quite alone did he say anything particular to you just at last anything that it might be important for us to know a faint colour flushed the pale face at the question nothing is that all you can tell us there is only one thing more the girl answered calmly i stood at the door a few minutes to watch mr penwin walking up the street and just as he turned the corner a man passed on the opposite side of the way in the same direction towards lowgate yes what kind of a man he was rather tall and wore an overcoat and a thick scarf around his neck as if it had been winter did you see his face no or notice anything else about him anything besides the overcoat and the muffler nothing you say he was tall was he as tall as that gentleman do you suppose stand up for a moment if you please mr clissold clissold stood up he was above the average height of tall men well over six feet no he was not so tall as that are you sure of that a man would look taller in this room than in the street do you allow for that difference inquired mr pergament i do not believe that the man i saw that night was so tall as mr clissold nor so broad across the shoulders that will do the chief constable next gave evidence as to the finding of the body the watch buried in the ditch the empty purse then came the landlady of the waterfowl with an account of the high words between the two gentlemen and mr clissold's abrupt departure on the following morning the spinnersbury detectives followed and described mr clissold's arrest the tracing of footsteps behind the hedge and down to the towpath and how they had compared mr clissold's boot with the footprints without being able to arrive at any positive conclusion it might very easily be the print of the same foot in a different boot said higlet it isn't so much the difference between the size of the feet as the shape and cut of the boot the man must have been tall the length of his stride shows that there was no further evidence the coroner addressed the jury after a few minutes consultation they returned their verdict that the deceased had been murdered by some person or persons unknown thus maurice clissold found himself a free man again but with the uncomfortable feeling of having been for a few days supposed the murderer of his bosom friend it seemed to him that a stigma would attach to his name henceforward he would be spoken of as the man who had been suspected and who was in all probability guilty but who had been let slip because the chain of evidence was not quite strong enough to hang him i suppose if i had been tried in scotland the verdict would have been non-proven he thought one only means of self-justification remained open to him to find the real murderer he fancied that higlet and smelt looked at him with unfriendly eyes they were aggravated by the loss of the reward they would turn their attention in a new direction no doubt but considerable time had been lost while they were on the wrong scent 
maurice clissold could not quite make up his mind about those bohemians of the ebersham theatre whether this vagabond heavy father might not know something more than he cared to reveal about james penwin's fate he had given his evidence with a sufficiently straightforward air and the girl was above doubt truth was stamped on the pale sorrowful face truth and a silent grief could that grief have its root in some fatal secret did she know her father guilty of this crime and shield him with heroic falsehoods only less sublime than truth she stood by her father's side a little way apart from the crowd as she had stood throughout the inquiry intently watchful while maurice lingered debating whether he should follow up the strolling players churchill penwin came straight across the room towards him before the undispersed assembly i congratulate you on your release mr clissold he said offering his hand with a friendly air and permit me to assure you that i for one have been fully assured of your innocence throughout this melancholy business i thank you for doing me justice mr penwin i was very fond of your cousin i liked him as well as if he had been my brother and if the question had been put to me whether harm should come to him or me i believe i should have chosen the evil lot for myself his mother was a second mother to me god bless her she asked me to take care of him a few hours before her death and i felt from that time as if i were responsible for his future he was little more than a boy when his poor mother died he was little more than a boy the last time i saw him alive the night we had our first quarrel what was the quarrel about mr clissold shrugged his shoulders and glanced round the room which was clearing by degrees but not yet empty it's too long a story to enter upon here he said come and dine with me at the castle at eight o'clock and tell me all about it said churchill you're very good no i can't manage that i have something to do what is that to begin a business day that may take a long time to finish may i ask the nature of that business i want to find james penwin's murderer churchill shrugged his shoulders and smiled a half compassionate smile my dear sir he said do you think that the murderers ever found in such a case as this given a delay of three days and nights ample time for him to ship himself for any port in the known world a low clod-hopping assassin no doubt in no way distinguishable from other clod-hoppers find him did you say i can conceive no endeavour more hopeless it is the fashion to rail at our police because they find it a little difficult to put their hands upon every delinquent who may be wanted but it is hardly the simplest business in the world to pick the right man out of ten or fifteen millions maurice clissold heard him with a troubled look and a short impatient sigh i dare say you are right he said but i shall do my best to unravel the mystery even if i am doomed to fail he asked some questions about his friend's funeral it was to be at three o'clock on the following day and churchill was going back to london by an early train in order to attend as chief mourner i shall be there said maurice clissold and they parted with a friendly handshake clissold was touched by mr penwin's friendliness that stigma of non-proven had not affected churchill's opinion at any rate he followed matthew elgood and his daughter into the street and joined them as they walked slowly homeward the girl's face half hidden by her veil i want to have a talk with you mr elgood if you've no objection said maurice unless you consider me tainted by the suspicion that has hung over me for the last three days and object to hold any intercourse with me no sir i suspect no man answered the actor with dignity although you were pleased to object to your lamented friend's inclination for my society i bear no malice and i do you the justice to believe you had no part in his untimely end i thank you mr elgood for your confidence since i have been in that abominable jail i feel as if there were some odour of felony hanging about me with regard to the objections of which you speak i can assure you that they were founded upon no personal dislike but upon prudential reasons which i need not enlarge upon enough mr clissold it boots not now if you will follow to our humble abode and share the meal our modest means provide i will enlighten you upon this theme so far as my scant knowledge serve with all said the actor unconsciously lapsing into blank verse maurice accepted the invitation he had a curious desire to see more of that girl whose pale face had assumed a kind of sublimity just now in the crowded court 
could she really have cared for his murdered friend she who had but known him two days or was there some dark secret which moved her thus deeply the man seemed frank and open enough hard to believe that villainy lurked beneath the bohemian's rough kindliness they went straight to the lodging in the narrow street leading down to the river here all seemed comfortable enough the evening meal half tea half dinner was ready laid when mr elgood and his visitor went in and mr and mrs dempson were waiting with some impatience for their refreshment they looked somewhat surprised at the appearance of clissold and mrs dempson returned his greeting with a certain stiffness it isn't the pleasantest thing in the world to sit down to table with a suspected murderer she remarked afterwards to which justina replied with a sudden flash of anger do you suppose i would sit in the same room with him if i thought him guilty the low comedian took things more easily than his wife well matt he said i thought you were never coming i've been down at the arms and heard the inquest glad to see you at liberty again mr clissold a most preposterous business your arrest i heard all the evidence i think those spinnersbury detectives ought to get it hot i dare say the press will slang em pretty tolerably well done judy he went on with a friendly slap on justina's shoulder you spoke up like a good one if you spoke as well as that on the stage you'd soon be fit for the juvenile lead justina spoke no word but took her place quietly at the table where mrs dempson was pouring out the tea while mr elgood dispensed a juicy rump steak i went to the butcher's for it myself he said there's nothing like personal influence in these things they wouldn't dare give me a slice of some superannuated cow they know when they've got to deal with a judge that's beef said the butcher as he slapped his knife across the loin and beef it is do you like it with the gravy in it mr clissold there was a dish of steaming potatoes and a bowl of lettuces which greenstuff mrs dempson champed as industrially as if she had been a blood relation of nebuchadnezzar's never had maurice clissold seen any one so silent or so self-sustained as this pale thin shadowy-looking girl whom her friends called judy she interested him strangely and he did sorry justice to mr elgood's ideal stake while watching her she herself hardly ate anything but the others were too deeply absorbed in their own meal to be concerned about her she sat by her father and drank a little tea sat motionless for the most part with her dark thoughtful eyes looking far away looking into some world that was not for the rest so soon as the pangs of hunger were appeased and the pleasures of the table in some measure exhausted mr elgood became loquacious again he gave a detailed description of that last day on the race-course the supper all that james fenwin had said or done within his knowledge and then came a discussion as to who could have done the deed he was in the theatre all the evening you say said maurice is it possible that any of the scene-shifters or workmen of any kind may have observed him seen him open a well-filled purse perhaps and followed him after he left this house it was one of his foolish habits to carry too much money about him from twenty to fifty pounds for instance he used to say it was a bore to sit down and write a cheque for every trifle he wanted and of course in our travels ready money was a necessity could it have been one of your people do you think no sir replied mr elgood the stage has contributed nothing to the records of crime from the highest genius who has ever adorned the drama to the lowest functionary employed in the working of its machinery there has been no such thing as a felon i am glad to hear you say so mr elgood yet it is clear to me that this crime must have been committed by some one who watched and followed my poor friend some one who knew enough of him to know that he had money about him i grant you sir replied the actor it was now time for these thespians to repair to the theatre all but justina who for a wonder was not in the first piece maurice took notice of this fact and after walking to the theatre with mr elgood went back to that gentleman's lodgings to have a few words alone with his daughter he passed through the shop unchallenged visitors for the lodgers being accustomed to pass in and out in a free and easy manner he went quietly upstairs the sitting-room door stood ajar he pushed it open and went in thirteen my love my love and no love for me justina was leaning before an old easy-chair her face buried in the faded chintz cushions sobbing vehemently 
curiously changed from the silent impassable thing maurice had taken leave of ten minutes earlier the sight of her sorrow touched him whatever it meant this was real grief at any rate forgive me for this intrusion miss elgood he said gently remaining near the door lest he should startle her by his abrupt approach i am very anxious to talk to you alone and ventured to return she started up hastily wiping away her tears i am sorry to see you in such deep grief he said you must have a tender heart to feel my poor friend's sad fate so acutely the pallid face crimsoned as if this had been a reproof i have no right to be so sorry i dare say faltered justina but he was very kind to me kinder than any one ever was before and it is hard that he should be taken away so cruelly just when life seemed to be all new and different because of his goodness poor child you must have a grateful nature i am grateful to him i can understand that just at first you may feel his death as if it were a personal loss but that cannot last long you had known him so short a time granted that he admired you and paid you pretty compliments and attentions which may be new to one so young if he had lived to bid you good-bye to-morrow and pass on his way you would hardly have remembered him a week i should have remembered him all my life said justina firmly he had made a deep impression upon your mind or your fancy then in those two days he loved me the girl answered with a little burst of passion and i gave him back love for love with all my heart with all my strength as they tell us we ought to love god why do you come here to torment me about him you cannot bring him back to life god will not i would spend all my life upon my knees if he could be raised up again like lazarus i meant never to have spoken of this i have kept it even from my father he told me that he loved me and that i was to be his wife and that all our lives to come were to be spent together think what it is to have been so happy and to have lost all poor child repeated clissold laying his hand gently as priest or father might have laid it on the soft brown hair thrust back in a tangled mass from the hot brow poor children children both it would have been a foolish marriage at best my dear girl if he had lived and kept in the same mind unequal marriages bring remorse and misery for the most part james penwin was not a hard-working wayfarer like me who may choose my wife at any turn on the world's high road he was the owner of a good old estate and the happiness of his future depended on his making a suitable marriage his wife must have been somebody before she was his wife she must have had her own race to refer to something to boast of on her own side so that when their children grew up they should be able to give a satisfactory account of their maternal uncles and aunts i dare say you think me worldly-minded poor child but i am only worldly wise if it were a question of personal merit you might have made the best of wives the girl heard this long speech with an absent air her tearful eyes fixed on vacancy her restless hands clasped tightly as if she would fain have restrained her grief by that muscular grip i don't know whether it was wise or foolish she said but i know we loved each other i loved him too justina said maurice using her christian name involuntarily she was not the kind of person to be called miss elgood as well as one man can love another i take his death quietly enough you see but i would give ten years of my life to find his murderer i would give all my life said justina with a look that made him think she would verily have done it you know nothing more than you told at the inquest this afternoon nothing that could throw any light upon his death nothing you ought to know much more about it than i how so you know all that went before that time his circumstances his associates i have lain awake thinking of this thing from night till morning until i believe that every idea that could be thought about it has come into my head there must have been some motive for his murder the motive seems obvious enough highway robbery yet his watch was found in the ditch his murderer may naturally have feared to take anything likely to lead to detection his money was taken yes it may have been for that yet it seems strange that he should have been chosen out of so many that he should have been the only victim murdered for the sake of a few pounds unhappily 
sordid as the motive is that is a common kind of murder replied maurice but might not some one have a stronger motive than that i can imagine none james never in his life made an enemy are you quite sure of that as sure as i can be of anything about a young man whom i knew as well as if he had been my brother replied maurice wondering at the girl's calm clear tone at this moment she seemed older than her years his equal or more than his equal in shrewdness and judgment is there any one who would be a gainer by his death naturally the next heir to the penwin estate is a very considerable gainer for him james penwin's death means the difference between a hard-working life like mine and a splendid future could he have anything to do with the crime he churchill penwin well no it would be about as hard to suspect him as it was to suspect me churchill penwin is a gentleman and i conclude a man of honour his conduct towards me to-day showed him a man of kind feeling no i suppose gentlemen do not commit such crimes mused justina and we shall never know who killed him that seems hardest of all that bright young life taken and the wretch who took it left to go free tears filled her eyes as she turned away from clissold ashamed of her grief tears which should have been shed in secret but which she could not keep back when she thought of her young lover's doom clissold tried to soothe her assured her of his friendship his help should she ever need it i shall always be interested in you he said i shall think of you as my poor lad's first and last love he had had his foolish boyish flirtations before but i have reason to know that he never asked any other woman to be his wife and he was too staunch and true to make such an offer unless he meant it justina gave him a grateful look it was the first time he had seen her face light up with anything like pleasure that day you do believe that he loved me then she exclaimed eagerly it was not all my own foolish dream he was not the next words came slowly as if it hurt her to speak them amusing himself at my expense i have no doubt of his truth i never knew him to tell a lie i do not say that his fancy would have lasted it may have been too ardent too sudden to stand wear and tear but be assured for the moment he was true would have wrecked his life perhaps to keep true to the love of a day this time the girl looked at him angrily why do you tell me he must have changed if god had spared him she added why do you find it so hard to imagine that he might have gone on loving me am i so degraded a creature in your eyes i am quite ready to believe that you are a very noble girl answered maurice worthy a better lover than my poor friend but you are miss elgood of the theatre royal ebersham and he was squire penwin of penwin time would not have changed those two facts and might have altered his way of looking at them don't tell me that he would have changed she cried passionately let me think that i have lost all love happiness home wealth all that any woman ever hoped to win it cannot add to my grief for him it would not take away from my love for him even to know that he was fickle and would have grown tired of me those two days were the only happy days of my life they will dwell in my mind for ever a changeless memory i shall never see the sunshine without thinking how it shone upon us two on ebersham racecourse i shall never see the moonlight without remembering how we two sat side by side watching the willow branches dipping into the river a childish love thought maurice a young heart's first fancy a fabric that would wear out in six months or so happy days will come again he said gently you will go on acting and succeed in your profession you are just the kind of girl to whom genius will come in a flash like inspiration you will succeed and be famous by and by and look back with a sad pitying smile at james penswin's love and say to yourself with a half regretful sigh that was youth you will be loved some day by a man who will prove to you that true love is not the growth of a few summer hours i should like to be famous some day the girl answered proudly just to show you that i might have been worthy of your friend's love i fear i have offended you by my plain speaking miss elgood returned maurice but if ever you need a friend and will honour me with your confidence you shall not find me unworthy of your trust i have not a very important position in the world 
but i am a gentleman by birth and education and not wanting in some of those commonplace qualities which help a man on the road of life such as patience and perseverance industry and strength of purpose i have chosen literature as my profession for that calling gives me the privilege i should be least inclined to forego liberty my income is happily just large enough to make me independent of earning so that i can afford to write as the birds sing without cutting my coat according to any other man's cloth if ever you and your father are in london miss elgood and inclined to test my sincerity you may find me at this address he gave justina his card mr maurice clissold hogarth place bloomsbury not a fashionable locality by any means he said but central and near the british museum where i generally spend my mornings when i am in london justina took the card listlessly enough not as if she had any intention of taxing mr clissold's friendship in the future he saw how far her thoughts were from him and from all common things she rose with a startled look as the cathedral clock chimed the three quarters after seven i shall be late for the peace she exclaimed with alarm i forget everything it is my fault for detaining you said maurice concerned to see her look of distress let me walk to the theatre with you but i've some things to carry she answered hurriedly rolling up some finery which had bestrewed a side table veil shoes ribbons feathers a dilapidated fan i am not afraid of carrying a parcel they went out together justina breathless and hurried to the stage door maurice penetrated some dark passages and stumbled up some breakneck stairs in his anxiety to learn if his companion were really late the band was grinding away at an overture the second piece had not begun is it all right asked maurice just as the light figure that had sped on before him was disappearing behind a dusky door yes cried justina i don't go on till the second scene i shall have just time to dress so mr glissold groped his way to the outer air relieved in mind it was a still summer evening and this part of the city had a quiet forgotten air as of a spot from which busy life had drifted away the theatre did not create any circle of animation and bustle in these degenerate days and seen from the outside might have been mistaken for a chapel there were a few small boys hanging about near the stage door as mr clissold emerged and these he perceived looked at him with interest and spoke to one another about him he was evidently known even to these street boys as the man who had been suspected of his friend's murder he walked round to the quiet little square in front of the theatre lighted his pipe and took a turn up and down the empty pavement meditating what he should do with himself for the rest of the evening last night he had slept placidly enough in the medieval jail worn out with the saddest thoughts to-night there was nothing for him to do but go back to the waterfowl where the rooms would seem haunted put his few belongings together and get ready for going back to london his holiday was over and how sad the end he had been very fond of james penwin only now when they two were parted for ever did he know how strong that attachment had been the bright young face the fresh gay voice all gone i am not quick at making friendships thought maurice i feel as if his death had left me alone in the world his life had been unusually lonely save for this one strong friendship he had lost his father in childhood and his mother a few years later happily captain clissold although a younger son had inherited a small estate in devonshire from his mother this gave his orphan son four hundred a year an income which permitted his education at eton and oxford and which made him thoroughly independent as a young man to whom the idea of matrimony and its obligations seemed far off his uncle sir henry clissold was a gentleman of some standing in the political world a county member a man who was chairman of innumerable committees and never had a leisure moment this gentleman's ideas of the fitness of things were outraged by his nephew's refusal to adopt any profession i could have pushed you forward in almost any career you had chosen he said indignantly i have friends i can command in all the professions or if you had cared to go to india you might have been a judge in the sutter before you were five-and-thirty thanks my dear uncle i shouldn't care about being broiled alive or having to learn from twenty to thirty dialects before i could understand plaintiff or defendant maurice replied coolly give me my crust of bread and liberty fortunate for you that you have your crust of bread growled sir henry 
but at the rate you are going you will never provide yourself with a slice of world cheese to-night perhaps for the first time maurice clissold felt that life was a mistake his friend and comrade had been more necessary to him than he could have believed for he had never quite accepted james as his equal in intellect he had had his own world of thought which the careless lad never entered but now that the boy was gone he felt that shadowy world darkened by his loss would to heaven i could stand face to face with his murderer he said to himself one of us two should go down never to rise again End of Volume 1, Chapters 12 and 13volume one chapters fourteen and fifteen of a strange world by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain fourteen truth is truth to the end of time mr pergament went back to london by a train which left ebersham at half-past five in the afternoon half an hour after the termination of the inquest churchill went to the station with his solicitor saw him into the railway carriage and only left the platform when the train had carried mr pergament on his road to london it was an understood thing that pergament and pergament were to keep the penwin estate in their hands and that churchill's interests were henceforward to be their interests to pergament and pergament indeed it was as if james penwin had never existed so completely did they transfer their allegiance to his successor churchill walked slowly away from the station seemingly somewhat at a loss how to dispose of his time he might have gone back to london with mr pergament certainly for he had no further business in the city of ebersham but for some sufficient reason of his own he had chosen to remain although he was not a little anxious to see madge bellingham whom he had not met since the change in his fortunes he had written to her before he left london to announce that fact but briefly feeling that any expression of pleasure in the altered circumstances of his life would show badly in black and white he had expressed himself properly grieved at his cousin's sad death but had affected no exaggerated affliction those clear dark eyes of madge's seemed to be looking through him as he wrote i wonder if it is possible to keep a secret from her he thought she has a look that pierces my soul such utter truthfulness he had ordered his dinner for eight and it was not yet six so he had ample leisure for loitering he went back to lowgate and out through the bar to the dull quiet road where james met his death churchill penwin wanted to see the spot where the murder had been committed he had heard it described so often that it was easy enough for him to find it a few ragged bushes of elder and blackberry divided the low marshy ground from the road just at this point from behind these bushes the murderer had taken his aim at least that was the theory of the police between the road and the river the herbage was sour and scant and the cattle that browsed thereon had a solitary and dejected look as if they knew they were shut out from the good things of this life they seemed to be the odds and ends of the animal creation and to have come there accidentally a misanthropical donkey a lean cow or two some gaunt ragged-looking horses a bony pig scattered wide apart over the narrow tract of sward along the low bank of the river mr penwin contemplated the spot thoughtfully for a little while as if he would fain have made out something which the police had failed to discover and then strolled across the grass to the river bank the gloomy solitude of the scene seemed to please him for he walked on for some distance meditative and even moody fortune brings its own responsibilities and a man who finds himself suddenly exalted from poverty to wealth is not always gay he was strolling quietly along the bank his eyes bent upon the river with that dreaming gaze which sees not the thing it seems to contemplate when he was startled from his reverie by the sound of voices near at hand and looking away from the water perceived that he had stumbled upon a gipsy encampment there were the low arched tents more kennels under canvas where the dusky tribe burrowed at night or in foul weather the wood-fire the ever-simmering pot the litter of ashes and dirty straw and bones and a broken bottle or two the sinister-browed vagabond lying on his stomach like the serpent smoking his grimy pipe and scowling at any chance passer-by the half-naked children playing among the rubbish the women sitting on the ground plaiting rushes into a doormat all these churchill's eye took in at a glance something more too perhaps for he looked at one of the women curiously for a moment and slackened his leisurely pace she put down her mat rose and walked beside him let me tell your fortune pretty gentleman she began with the same professional sing-song in which she had addressed james penwin a few days before 
it was the same woman who stopped the late squire of penwin lower down the river bank i don't want my fortune told thank you i know what it is pretty well replied churchill in his cold calm voice don't say that pretty gentleman no one can look into the urn of fate and yet you and your tribe pretend to do it said churchill we study the stars more than others do and learn to read em my noble gentleman i've read something in the stars about you since the night your cousin was murdered and pray what do the stars say of me inquired churchill with a scornful laugh they say that you're a kind-hearted gentleman at bottom and will befriend a poor gypsy i'm afraid they're out in their reckoning for once in a way perhaps it was mercury you got the information from he's a notorious trickster and now pray my good woman turning to see that they were beyond the ken of the rest what did you mean by sending me a letter to say you could tell me something about my cousin's death if you really have any information to give your wisest course is to carry it directly to the police and if your information should lead to the discovery of the murderer you may earn a reward that will provide for you for the rest of your life his eyes were on the woman's face as he spoke with that intent look with which he was accustomed to read the human countenance i've thought of that answered the gypsy and i was very near going and telling all i knew to the police the morning after the murder but i changed my mind about it when i heard you were here i thought it might be better for me to see you first i can't quite fathom your motive however as i am willing to give two hundred pounds reward for such information as may lead to the apprehension and conviction of the murderer you may have come to the right person in coming to me only i tell you frankly that deeply as i am interested in the punishment of my cousin's assassin i had rather not be troubled about details i won't even ask the nature of your information take my advice my good soul and carry it to the police they are the people to profit by it they are the people to act upon it yes and cheat me of the reward after all choke me off with a five-pound note perhaps i know too much of the police to be over inclined to trust them is your information conclusive asked churchill certain to lead to the conviction of the murderer i won't say so much as that but i know it's worth hearing and worth paying for you may as well tell me all about it if you don't like to tell the police what without being paid for my secret no my pretty gentleman i'm not such a fool as that come said churchill with a laugh what does your knowledge amount to nothing i dare say that every one else in ebersham doesn't share you know that my cousin has been murdered and that i am anxious to find the murderer i know more than that my noble gentleman what then i know who did it churchill turned his quick glance upon her again searching incredulous derisive come he said you don't expect to make me believe that you know the criminal and let him slip and lose your chance of the reward you are not that kind of woman i don't say that i've let him slip or lost my chance of profiting by what i know suppose the criminal was someone i'm interested in someone i shouldn't like to see come to harm in that case you shouldn't come to me about it you don't imagine that i am going to condone my cousin's murder but i believe your story is all a fable it's as true as the planets we have been encamped here for the last week and on the night of the murder we'd all been at the races folks are always kind to gypsies upon a race course and there was plenty to eat and drink for all of us perhaps a little too much drink and when the races were over i fell asleep in one of the booths among some straw in a corner where no one took any notice of me my son reuben him as you saw yonder just now was in the town up to very little good i dare say and left me to take care of myself and when i woke it was late at night and the place was all dark and quiet i didn't know how late it was till i came through the town and found all the lights out and the streets empty and heard the cathedral clock strike two i walked slow and the clock had struck the half hour before i got through the bar i was dead tired standing and walking about the race-course all day and as i came along this road i saw someone walking a little way ahead of me 
he walked on and i walked after him keeping on the other side of the way and in the shadow of the hedge about a hundred yards behind him and all at once i heard a shot fired and saw him drop down there was no one to give the alarm to and no good in giving it if he was dead i kept on in the shadow till i came nearly opposite where he lay and then i slipped down into the ditch there was no water in it nothing but mud and slime and duckweed and such like and i squatted there in the shadow and watched like some toad in its hole said churchill common humanity would have urged you to try to help the fallen man he was past help kind gentleman he dropped without a groan never so much as moaned as he lay there and it was wiser for me to watch the murderer so as to be able to bear witness against him when the right time came than to scare him away by squeaking out like a raven well woman you watched and saw what i saw a man stooping over the murdered gentleman a tall man in a loose overcoat with a scarf muffled round his neck he put his hand in the other one's bosom to feel if his heart had left off beating i suppose and drew it out again bloody i could see that even in the dim light betwixt night and morning for i've something of a cat's eye your honour and i'm pretty well used to seeing in the dark candles ain't ever plentiful with our people he held up his hand dripping with blood and pulled a white handkerchief out of his pocket with the other hand to wipe the blood off churchill turned and looked her in the face for the first time since she had begun her narrative come he said you're overdoing the details your story would sound more like the truth if it were less elaborate i can't help the sound of it sir there's not a word i'm saying that i wouldn't swear by to-morrow in a court of justice you've kept your evidence back too long i'm afraid you ought to have given this information at the inquest a jury would hardly believe your story now what not if i had proof of what i say what proof woman the handkerchief with which the murderer wiped those blood-stains off his hands pshaw exclaimed churchill contemptuously there are a hundred ways in which you might come possessed of a man's handkerchief your tribe lives by such petty plunder do you suppose that you a gypsy and a vagabond would ever persuade a british jury to believe your evidence against a gentleman what cried the woman eagerly then you know it was a gentleman who murdered your cousin didn't you say so just this minute not i my noble gentleman i told you he was tall and wore an overcoat that's all i told you about him well what next he wiped the blood off his hand then put the handkerchief back in his pocket as he thought but i suppose he wasn't quite used to the work he was doing for in his confusion he missed the pocket and let the handkerchief fall into the road i didn't give him time to find out his mistake for while he was stooping over the dead man emptying his pockets i crept across the road got hold of the handkerchief and slipped back to my hiding-place in the ditch again i'm light of foot you see your honour though an old woman what next he opened the dead man's purse emptied it and put the contents in his own waistcoat pocket then he crammed watch and purse down into the ditch the same ditch where i was hiding but a little way off took a stick which he had broken off the hedge and thrust it down into the mud under the weeds making sure i suppose that no one could ever find it there when he had done this he pulled himself together as you may say and hurried off as fast as he could go panting like a hunted deer across the swampy ground and towards the river where they found his footsteps afterwards i think it would have been cleverer of him if he'd left his victim's pockets alone and let those that found the body rub it as they'd have been pretty sure to do yet it was artful of him to clean the pockets out so as to make it seem a common case of highway robbery with violence what did you do with the handkerchief took it home with me to that tent yonder that's what we call home and lighted an end of candle and smoothed out the handkerchief to see if there was any mark upon it gentlemen are so particular about their things you see and don't like to get em changed at the wash yes there the mark was sure enough the name in full christian and surname it was as much as i could do to read em for the blood-stains what was the name that's my secret 
every secret has its price and i've put a price on mine if i was sure of getting the reward and not having the police turn against me i might be more ready to tell what i know you're a curious woman said churchill after a longish pause but i suppose you've some plan of your own yes your honour i have my views as to this story of yours even supported by the evidence of this handkerchief which you pretend to have found i doubt very much if it would have the smallest weight with a jury i do not therefore press you to bring forward your information though as my cousin's next of kin it is of course my duty to do my best to bring his assassin to justice that's just what i thought your honour precisely and you did quite right in bringing the subject before me it will be necessary for me to know when and where i can find you in future so that when the right time comes you may be at hand to make your statement we are but wanderers on the face of the earth kind gentlemen whined the gypsy it isn't very easy to find us when you want us that's what i've been thinking returned churchill musingly if you had some settled home now you're getting old and must be tired of roving i fancy sleeping under straw under canvas in a climate in which east winds are the rule rather than the exception that sort of thing must be rather trying at your time of life i should imagine trying i'm racked with the rheumatics every winter your honour my bones are not so much bones as gnawing wolves they torment me so sometimes i feel as if i could chop off my limbs willingly to be quit of the pain in them a settled home a warm bed a fireside that would be heaven to me well i'll think about it and see what can be done for you in the meantime i'll give you a trifle to ward off the rheumatism he opened his purse and gave the woman a banknote part of an advance made him by mr pergament that morning the gypsy uttered her usual torrent of blessings the gratitude wherewith she was wont to salute her benefactors have you ever been in cornwall asked churchill lord love your honour there isn't a nook or a corner in all england where i haven't been good if you happen to be in cornwall any time during the next three months you may look me up at penwin manor bless you my generous gentleman it won't be very long before you see me whenever you please returned churchill with that air of well-bred indifference which he wore as a badge of his class good afternoon he turned to go back to the city leaving the woman standing alone by the river brink looking after him lost in thought or lost in wonder fifteen they shall pass and their places be taken the letter which told miss bellingham that her lover was master of penwin seemed to her almost like the end of a fairy tale lady cheshunt had dropped in to afternoon tea only a quarter of an hour before the letter arrived and madge was busy with the old battersea cups and saucers and the quaint little wedgwood teapot when the accomplished serving-man who never abated one iota of his professional solemnity because his wages were doubtful presented churchill's letter on an antique salver put it on the table please said madge busy with the tea-service and painfully conscious that the dowager's eye was upon her she had recognized churchill's hand at a glance and thought how daring nay even impudent it was of him to write to her it was mean of him to take such advantage of her weakness that sunday morning she thought true that in one fatal moment she had let him discover the secret she was most anxious to hide but she had given him no right over her she had made him no promise her love had been admitted hypothetically if we lived in a different world if i had myself only to consider she had said to him which meant that she would have nothing to do with him under existing circumstances she glanced at viola that fragile sevres china beauty with her air of being unfitted for the vulgar uses of life poor child for her sake i ought to marry mr balecroft that pompous manchester merchant or that vapid young fop sir henry featherstone she thought with a sigh read your letter my dear love said lady cheshunt leaning over the tray to put an extra lump of sugar into her cup and scrutinizing the address of that epistle which had brought the warm crimson blood to match bellingham's cheeks and brow the good-natured dowager permitted herself this breach of good breeding in the warmth of her affection for madge the handwriting was masculine evidently that was all lady cheshunt could discover 
miss bellingham broke the seal trying to look composed and indifferent but after hurriedly reading churchill's brief letter gave a little cry of horror good heavens it is too dreadful she exclaimed what is too dreadful child you remember what we were talking about last saturday night when you took so much trouble to warn me against allowing myself to-to entangle myself i think that's what you called it with mr penwin with the poor mr penwin i remember perfectly and that letter is from him the man has had the audacity to propose to you you may well say it is too dreadful his cousin has been murdered lady cheshunt his cousin mr james penwin and your man comes into the penwin estate cried the energetic dowager my dearest madge i congratulate you poor young penwin a boy at school or a lad at the university i believe nobody seems to know much about him he has been murdered shot from behind a hedge by some midnight assassin isn't that dreadful said madge too much shocked by the tidings in her lover's letter to consider the difference this event might make in her own fortunes she could not be glad all at once though that one man whom her heart had chosen for its master was raised from poverty to opulence for a little while at least she could only think of the victim very dreadful echoed lady cheshunt the police ought to prevent such things one pays highway rates and sewer rates and so forth till one is positively ruined and yet one can be murdered on the very high road one pays for with impunity there must be something wrong in the legislature i hope things will be better when our party comes in look at that child viola she's as white as a sheet of paper just as if she were going to faint you shouldn't blurt out your blunders in that abrupt way madge viola gave a little hysterical sob and promised not to faint this time she was but a fragile piece of human porcelain given to swooning at the slightest provocation she went round to madge and knelt down by her and kissed her fondly knowing enough of her sister's feelings to comprehend that this fatal event was likely to benefit madge odd that i did not see anything of this business in the papers exclaimed lady cheshunt but then i only read the post and that does not make a feature of murders papa is at newmarket said viola and madge and i never look at the papers or hear any news while he is away madge sat silent looking at churchill's letter till every word seemed to burn itself into her brain the firm straight hand the letters long and narrow and a little pointed something like that wonderful writing of joseph addison's how well she knew it and yet he must have been agitated thought madge even his quiet force of character could not stand against such a shock as this after what he said to me too last sunday to think that wealth and position should have come to him so suddenly there seems something awful in it lady cheshunt had quite recovered her habitual gaiety by this time and dismissed jane penwin's death as a subject that was done with for the moment merely expressing her intention of reading the details of the event in the newspapers at her leisure and so my dear madge mr penwin wrote to you immediately she said doesn't that look rather as if there were some kind of understanding between you there was no understanding between us lady cheshunt except that i could never be mr penwin's wife while he was a poor man he understood that perfectly i told him in the plainest hardest words like a woman of the world as i am you needn't say that so contemptuously madge i'm a woman of the world and i own it without a blush what's the use of living in the world if you don't acquire worldly wisdom it's like living ever so long in a foreign country without learning the language and implies egregious stupidity and so you told churchill penwin that you couldn't marry him on account of his poverty and you pledged yourself to wait ten or twenty years for him i suppose and refuse every decent offer for his sake no lady cheshunt i promised nothing well my dear providence has been very good to you for no doubt if mr penwin had remained poor you'd have made a fool of yourself sooner or later for his sake and gone to live in bloomsbury where even i couldn't have visited you on account of my servants one might get over that sort of thing oneself but coachmen are so particular where they wait her ladyship rattled on for another quarter of an hour promised madge to come and stay at penwin manor with her by and by 
congratulated viola on her sister's good fortune hoped that her dear madge would make a point of spending the season in london when she became mrs penwin while madge sat unresponsive hardly listening to this flow of commonplace but thinking how awful fortune was when it came thus suddenly and had death for its herald she felt relieved when lady cheshunt gathered up her silken train for the last time and went rustling downstairs to the elegant victoria which appeared far too fairy-like a vehicle to contain that bulky matron thank heaven she's gone cried madge how she does talk yes dear but she is always kind pleaded viola and so fond of you madge put her arms round the girl and kissed her passionately that sisterly love of hers was almost the strongest feeling in her breast and all madge's affections were strong she had no milk and water love dearest she said softly how happy we can be now i hope it isn't wicked to be happy when fortune comes to us in such a dreadful manner you do care a little for mr penwin then dear said viola without entering upon this somewhat obscure question i love him with all my heart and soul oh madge and you never told me why tell you something that might make you unhappy i should never have dreamt of marrying churchill but for this turn in fortune's wheel i wanted to make what is called a good marriage for your sake darling more than for my own i wanted to win a happy home for you so that when your time came to marry you might not be pressed or harassed by worldly people as i have been and might follow the dictates of your own heart oh madge you are quite too good cried viola with enthusiasm and we may be very happy mayn't we my pet continued the elder living together at a picturesque old place in cornwall with the great waves of the atlantic rolling up to the edge of our grounds and in london sometimes if churchill likes and knowing no more of debt and difficulty or cutting and contriving so as to look like ladies upon the income of ladies maids life will begin afresh for us viola poor papa sighed viola you'll be kind to him won't you madge my dearest you know that i love him papa will be very glad depend upon it and he will like to go back to his old bachelor ways i dare say now that he will not be burdened with two marriageable daughters when will you be married madge oh not for ever so long dear not for a twelve month i should think churchill will be in mourning for his cousin and it wouldn't look well for him to marry soon after such a dreadful event i suppose not are you to see him soon very soon love here is his postscript madge read the last lines of her lover's letter i shall come back to town directly the inquest is over and all arrangements made and my first visit shall be to you of course and you really really love him madge asked viola anxiously really really but why ask that question viola after what i told you just now only because you've taken me by surprise dear and don't be angry with me madge because churchill penwin has never been a favourite of mine but of course now i shall begin to like him immensely you're so much a better judge of character than i am you see madge and if you think him good and true i have never thought of his goodness or his truth said madge with a rather gloomy look i only know that i love him End of volume one chapters fourteen and fifteen Volume One, Chapter Sixteen and Seventeen of A Strange World by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sixteen. There is a history in all men's lives. Upon his return to London, Churchill lost very little time before presenting himself in Cavendish Row. He did not go there on the day of his cousin's funeral. That gloomy ceremonial had unfitted him for social pleasures, above all for commune with so bright a spirit as Madge Bellingham. He felt as if to go to her straight from that place of tombs would be to carry the atmosphere of the grave into her home. The funeral seemed to affect him more than such a solemnity might have been supposed to affect a man of his philosophical temper. But then these quiet reserved men, men who hold themselves in check as it were, are sometimes men of deepest feeling so mr pergament thought as he stood opposite the new master of penwin in the vault at kensal green and observed his pallid face and the settled gloom of his brow 
churchill drove straight back to the temple with mr pergament for his companion that gentleman being anxious to return to new square for his afternoon letters before going down to his luxurious villa at beckingham where he lived sumptuously or as his enemies averred battened ghoul-like on the rotten carcasses of the defunct chancery suits which he had lost from kensal green to fleet street seemed an interminable pilgrimage in that gloomy vehicle mr pergament and his client had exhausted their conversational powers on the way to the cemetery and now on the return home had but little to say for themselves it was a blazing summer afternoon an august day which had slipped unawares into june through an error in the calendar the morning coach was like a locomotive oven the shabby suburban thoroughfare seemed baking under the pitiless sky never had the harrow road looked dustier never had the edgware road looked untidier or more out at elbows than to-day how i detest the ragged fringe of shabby suburbs that hangs round london said mr penwin it was the first remark he had made after half an hour's thoughtful silence his only reply from the solicitor was a gentle snore a snore which sounded full of placid enjoyment perhaps there is nothing more dreamily delightful than a stolen doze on a sultry afternoon lulled by the movement of wheels how the fellow sleeps muttered mr benwin almost savagely i wish i had the knack of sleeping like that it is the curse of these hyperactive intellects to be strangers to rest the carriage drew up at one of the temple gates at last and mr pergament woke with a start jerking into the waking world again by that sudden pull-up bless my soul exclaimed the lawyer i was asleep didn't you know it asked churchill rather fretfully not the least idea whether very oppressive here we are at your place dear me by the way when do you think of going down to penwin the day after to-morrow i should like you to go with me and put me in formal possession and you may as well take the title deeds down with you i like to have those things in my own possession the leases you can of course retain mr pergament hardly quite awake as yet was somewhat taken aback by this request the title deeds of the penwin estate had been in the offices of pergament and pergament for half a century this new lord of the manor promised to be sharper even than the old squire nicholas penwin who among some ribald tenants of the estate had been known as old nick if you wish it of course yes assuredly said mr pergament and on this with a curt good day from churchill they parted how property changes a man thought the solicitor as the coach carried him to new square that young man looks as if he had the cares of a nation on his shoulders already odd notion his wanting to keep the title deeds in his own custody however i suppose he won't take his business out of our hands and if he should we can do without it churchill went up to his chambers on a third floor they had a sombre and chilly look in their spotless propriety even on this warm summer afternoon the rooms were on the shady side of the way and saw not the sun after nine o'clock in the morning very neatly kept and furnished were those bachelor apartments the sitting-room at once office and living-room the goods and chattels in it perhaps worth five and twenty pounds an ancient and faded turkey carpet carefully darned by the deft fingers of a jobbing upholsteress whom churchill sometimes employed to keep things in order faded green cloth curtains an old oak knee-hole desk solid substantial shabby with all the papers upon it neatly sorted the inkstand stainless and well supplied a horsehair covered armchair high-backed square brass-nailed of a remote era but comfortable withal armless chairs of the same period with an unknown crest emblazoned on their mahogany backs a battered old bookcase filled with law books only one shelf reserved for that lighter literature which soothes the weariness of the student every object as bright as labour and furniture polish could make it everything in its place a room in which no ancient spinster skilled in the government of her one domestic could have discovered ground for a complaint churchill looked round the room with a thoughtful smile not altogether joyous as he seated himself in his armchair and opened a neat cigar-box on the table at his side how plain the stamp of poverty shows upon everything he said to himself the furniture the mere refuse of an auction-room furbished and polished into decency the faded curtains where there is hardly any colour visible except the neutral tints of decay the darned carpet premeditated poverty as sheridan calls it the mark of the beast shows itself on all 
and yet i have known some not all unhappy hours in this room patient nights of study the fire of ambition the sunlight of hope hours in which i deemed that fame and fortune were waiting for me down the long vista of industrious years hours when i felt myself strong in patience and resolve i shall think of these rooms sometimes in my new life dream of them perhaps fancy myself back again he sat musing for a long time so lost in thought that he forgot to light the cigar which he had taken from his case just now he woke from that long reverie with a sigh gave his shoulders an impatient shrug as if he would have shaken off ideas that troubled him and took a volume at random from a neat little bookstand on his table where about half a dozen favourite volumes stood ranged all of the cynical school rabelais stern goethe's faust a volume of voltaire not books that make a man better if one accepts goethe whose masterwork is the gospel of a great teacher under that outer husk of bitterness how much sweetness with that cynicism what depth of tenderness churchill's hand lighted unawares upon faust he opened the volume at the opening of that mightiest drama and read on read until the wearied student stood before him tempting destiny with his discontent read until the book dropped from his hand and he sat fixed as a statue staring at the ground in a gloomy reverie after all discontent is your true tempter the fiend whose whisper for ever assails man's ear who could be wiser than faust and yet how easy a dupe well i have my margaret at least and neither man nor any evil spirit that walks the earth in shape and palpable to man shall ever come between us two churchill lighted his cigar and left his quiet room which seemed to him just now to be unpleasantly occupied by that uncanny poodle which the german doctor brought home with him he went to the temple gardens and walked up and down by the cool river over which the mists of evening were gently creeping like a veil of faintest grey it was before the days of the embankment and the templars still possessed their peaceful walk on the brink of the river here churchill walked till late thinking always thinking property has so many cares and then when other people were meditating supper went out into fleet street to a restaurant that was just about closing and ordered his tardy dinner even when it came he seemed to have but a sorry appetite and only took his pint of claret with relish he was looking forward eagerly to the morrow when he should see madge bellingham and verily begin his new life hitherto he had known only the disagreeables of his position the inquest the funeral to-morrow he was to taste the sweets of prosperity seventeen death could not sever my soul and you churchill penwin lost little of that morrow to which he had looked forward so eagerly he was in cavendish row at eleven o'clock in the pretty drawing-room among brightly bound books and music and flowers surrounded by colour life and sunshine and with madge bellingham in his arms for the first few moments neither of them could speak they stood silent the girl's dark head upon her lover's breast her cheek pale with deepest feeling his strong arms encircling her my own dear love he murmured after a kiss that brought the warm blood back to that pale cheek my very own at last who would have thought when we parted that i should come back to you so soon with altered fortunes so strangely soon said madge oh churchill there is something awful in it destiny is always awful dearest she is that goddess who ever was and ever will be and whose veil no man's hand has ever lifted we are blind worshippers in her temple and must take the lot she deals from her inscrutable hand we are among her favoured children dearest for she has given us happiness i refused to be your wife churchill because you were poor can you quite forgive that must i not seem to you selfish and mercenary almost contemptible if i accept you now my beloved you are truth itself be as nobly frank to-day as you were that day i promised to win fame and fortune for your sake fortune has come without labour of mine it shall go hard with me if fame does not follow in the future only tell me once more that you love me that you rejoice in my good fortune and will share it and bless it he made a little pause before the last two words as if some passing thought had troubled him you know that i love you churchill she answered shyly i could not keep that secret from you the other day though i would have given so much to hide the truth 
and you will be my wife darling the fair young mistress of penwin by and by churchill it seems almost wrong to talk of our marriage yet awhile that poor young fellow your cousin he may have been asking some happy girl to share his fortune and his home to be mistress of penwin only a little while ago very sad said churchill but the natural law you remember what the father of poets has said the race of man is like the leaves on the trees yes churchill but the leaves fall in their season this poor young fellow has been snatched away in the blossom of his youth and by a murderer's hand i have heard a good deal of that sort of talk since his death remarked mr penwin with a cloudy look i thought you would have a warmer greeting for me than lamentations about my cousin but for his death i should not have the right to hold you in my arms to claim you for my wife you rejected me on account of my poverty yet you bewail the event that has made me rich miss bellingham withdrew herself from her lover's arms with an offended look i would rather have waited for you ten years than that fortune should have come to you under such painful circumstances she said yes you think so i dare say but i know what a woman's waiting generally comes to above all when she is one of the most beautiful women in london madge don't sting me with cold words or cold looks you do not know how i have yearned for this hour she had seated herself by one of the little tables and was idly turning the leaves of an ivory-bound volume churchill knelt down beside her and took the white-ringed hand away from the book and covered it with kisses and put his arm round her as she sat leaning his head against her shoulder as if he had found rest there after long weariness have some compassion upon me darling he pleaded pity nerves that have been strained a mind that has been overtaxed do not think that i have not felt this business i have felt it god alone knows how intensely but i come here for happiness time enough for troublous thoughts when you and i are apart here i would remember nothing know nothing but the joy of being with you to touch your hand to hear your voice to look into those deep dark eyes there was nothing but love in the eyes that met his gaze now love unquestioning and unmeasured dearest i will never speak of your cousin again if it pains you madge said earnestly i ought to have been more considerate she pushed back a loose lock from the broad forehead where the hair grew thinly with a gentle caressing hand timidly for it was the first time she had touched her lover's brow and there was something of a wife's tenderness in the action churchill she exclaimed your forehead burns as if you were in a fever you are not ill i hope no dear not ill but i have been over anxious over excited perhaps i am calm now happy now madge when shall i speak to your father i want to feel myself your acknowledged lover you can speak to papa whenever you like churchill he came home last night from newmarket i know he will be glad to see you either here or at his club and our marriage madge how soon shall that be oh churchill you cannot wish it to be soon after but i do wish it to be soon as soon as it may be with decency i am not going to pretend exaggerated grief for the death of a kinsman of whom i hardly knew anything i am not going to sit in sackcloth and ashes because i have inherited an estate i never expected to own in order that the world may look on approvingly and say what fine feelings what tenderness of heart society offers a premium for hypocrisy no madge i will wear crape on my hat for just three months and wait just three months for the crowning happiness of my life and then we will be married as quietly as you please and slip away by some untrodden track to a paradise of our own some one fair scene among the many lovely spots of earth which has not yet come into fashion for honeymoons you do not ask my terms but dictate your own said madge smiling dear love are we not one in heart and hope from this hour and must we not have the same wishes the same thoughts you have no trousseau to think about churchill no a man hardly considers matrimony an occasion for laying in an unlimited stock of clothes though i may indulge in a new suit or two in honour of my promotion seriously dearest do not trouble yourself to provide a mountain of millinery mrs penwin shall have an open account with as many milliners and silk mercers as she pleases 
you may be sure that i shall not have too expensive a trousseau and that i shall not run into debt said madge blushing and so it was settled between them that they were to be married before the end of september in time to begin their new life in some romantic corner of italy and to establish themselves at penwin before christmas and the hunting season churchill had boasted friends innumerable as a penniless barrister and this circle was hardly likely to become contracted by the change in his fortunes everybody would want to visit him during that first winter at penwin the lovers sat together for hours talking of their future opening their hearts to each other as they had never dared to do before that day they sat hand clasped in hand on that very sofa which lady cheshunt's portly form had occupied when she read madge her lecture viola was out riding with some good-natured friends who had a large stable and gave the miss bellinghams a mount as often as they chose to accept that favour it was much too early for callers sir nugent never came upstairs in the morning so madge and her lover had the cool shadowy rooms to themselves and sat amidst the perfume of flowers talking of their happy life to come all the small talk of days gone by those many conversations at evening parties flower shows picture galleries seemed as nothing compared with these hours of earnest talk heart to heart soul to soul on one side at least without a thought of reserve time flew on his swiftest wing for these two madge started up with a little cry of surprise when viola dashed into the room looking like a lovely piece of waxwork in a riding habit and chimney-pot hat oh madge we have had such a round ealing wilsden hendon and home by finchley i beg your pardon mr penwin i didn't see you till this moment this room is so dark after the blazing sunshine aren't you coming down to luncheon the bell rang half an hour ago and poor rickson looks the picture of gloom i dare say he wants to clear the table and compose himself for his afternoon siesta madge blushed conscious of having been too deep in bliss for life's common sounds to penetrate her paradise in a region where luncheon bells are not you'll stay to luncheon churchill won't you she said and viola knew it was all settled miss bellingham would not have called a gentleman by his christian name unless she had been engaged to be married to him viola got hold of her sister's hand as they went downstairs and squeezed it tremendously i shall sit down to luncheon in my habit she said if you don't mind for i'm absolutely famishing that luncheon was the pleasantest meal churchill penwin had eaten for a long time not an aldermanic banquet by any means for sir nugent seldom lunched at home and the young ladies fared simply in his absence there was a cold chicken left from yesterday's dinner minus the liver wing a tongue also cut a salad a jar of apricot jam some dainty little loaves from a german bakery and a small glass dish of roquefort cheese the wines were medoc and cherry the three sat a long time over this simple feast still talking of their future the future which viola was to share with the married couple have you ever seen penwin manor she asked after having declared her acceptance of the destiny that had been arranged for her never answered churchill it was always a sore subject with my father his father had not treated him well you see he married when he was little more than a boy and was supposed to have married badly though my mother was as good a woman as ever bore the name of penwin my grandfather chose to take offence at the marriage and my father resented the slight put upon his wife so deeply that he never crossed the threshold of penwin manor house again thus it happened that i was brought up with very little knowledge of my kindred or the birthplace of my ancestors i have often thought of going down to cornwall to have a look at the old place without letting anybody know who i was but i have been too busy to put the idea into execution how different you will feel going there as master said viola yes it will be a more agreeable sensation no doubt it was between three and four o'clock when churchill left that snug little dining-room to go down to sir nugent's club in st james street in the hope of seeing that gentleman and making all things straight without delay come back to afternoon tea if you can said viola who appeared particularly friendly to her future brother-in-law if possible my dear viola i may call you viola i suppose now of course are we not brother and sister henceforward well dear have you been trying to like him asked madge when her lover had departed yes and i found it quite easy you darling madge he seemed to me much nicer to-day 
perhaps it was because i could see how he worships you i never saw two people so intensely devoted prosperity suits him wonderfully though that cloudy look which i have often noticed in him still comes over his face by fits and starts he feels his cousin's awful death very deeply does he that's very good of him when he profits so largely by the calamity well dearest i mean to like him very much to be as fond of him as if he really were my brother and he will be all that a brother could be to you dear i don't quite know that i should care about that returned viola doubtfully brothers are sometimes nuisances a brother-in-law would be more likely to be on his good behaviour for fear of offending his wife churchill succeeded in lighting upon sir nugent at his club he was yawning behind an evening paper in the reading-room when mr penwin found him his greeting was just a shade more cordial than it always had been but only a shade for it was sir nugent's rule to be civil to everybody one never knows when a man may get a step he said and in a world largely composed of younger sons and heirs presumptive this was a golden rule sir nugent expressed himself profoundly sympathetic upon the subject of james penwin's death he was perfectly aware of churchill's business with him that afternoon but affected the most arcadian innocence happily churchill came speedily to the point sir nugent he began gravely while i was a struggling man i felt it would be at once presumption and folly to aspire to your daughter's hand but to be her husband has been my secret hope ever since i first knew her my cousin's death has made a total change in my fortune of course my dear fellow it has transformed you from a briefless barrister into a prosperous country gentleman pardon me if i remark that i might look higher for my eldest daughter than that madge is a woman in a thousand if it had been her sister now a good little thing and uncommonly pretty but i have no lofty aspirations for her unhappily for your ambitious dreams sir nugent madge is the lady of my choice and we love each other i do not think you ought to object to my present position the penwin estate is worth seven thousand a year not bad said the baronet blandly for a commoner but madge could win a coronet if she chose and i confess that i have looked forward to seeing her take her place in the peerage however if she really likes you and has made up her mind about it any objections of mine would be useless no doubt and as far as personal feeling goes there is no one i should like better for a son-in-law than yourself the two gentlemen shook hands upon this and sir nugent felt that he had not let his handsome daughter go too cheap and had paved the way for a liberal settlement he asked his future son-in-law to dinner and churchill who would not have forgone that promised afternoon tea for worlds chartered the swiftest hansom he could find drove back to cavendish row spent an hour with the two girls and a little bevy of feminine droppers in then drove to the temple to dress and reappeared at sir nugent's street door just as the neighbouring clocks chimed the first stroke of eight bless the young man how he do come backwards and forwards since he come into his estates said the butler who had read all about james penwin's death in the papers i always suspected that he had a sneaking kindness for our eldest young lady and now it's clear they're going to keep company if he's coming in and out like this every day i hope he'll have consideration enough to make it worth my while to open the door for him i hope you are not angry with me papa said madge by and by after her lover had bid them good-night and departed and when father and daughter were alone together angry with you no my love but just a trifle disappointed this seems to me quite a poor match for a girl with your advantages oh papa churchill has seven thousand a year and think of our income my love that is not the question in point what i have to think of is the match you might have made had it not been for this unlucky infatuation there is mr balecroft with his palace in belgravia a picture gallery worth a quarter of a million and a superb place at windermere a man who drops his h's papa complains of being ought or sir henry featherstone one of the oldest families in yorkshire with twelve thousand a year and not an idea which he has not learnt from his trainer or his jockey oh papa don't forget tennyson's noble line cursed be the gold that gilds the straitened forehead of the fool all very well for poets to write that sort of stuff but a man in my position doesn't like to see his daughter throw away her chances 
however i suppose i mustn't complain penwin manor is a nice enough place i dare say you must come to stay with me papa every year my love that kind of place would be the death of me except for a week in october i suppose there are plenty of pheasants i dare say papa if not we'll order some well it might have been worse sighed sir nugent you'll let viola live with me when i am married papa won't you pleaded madge coaxingly as if she were asking a tremendous favour my dear child with all my heart replied her father with amiable promptitude where could she be so well off in that case i shall give up housekeeping as soon as you are married this house has always been a plague to me taxes repairs no end of worry i used to pay a hundred and fifty pounds a year for my rooms in jermyn street and the business was settled bless you my darling you have always been a comfort to your poor old father and thus blandly with an air of self-sacrifice did sir nugent bellingham wash his hands of his two daughters end of volume one chapter sixteen and seventeen volume one chapters eighteen and nineteen of a strange world by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain eighteen what great ones do the less will prattle of a year had gone by since james penwin met his death by the lonely river at eversham and again maurice clissold spent his summer holiday in a walking tour this time he was quite alone pleasant and social though he was he did not make friendships lightly or quickly in the year that was gone he had found no friend to replace james penwin he had plenty of agreeable acquaintances knew plenty of men who were glad to dine with him or to give him a dinner he was famous already in a small way at the literary club where he spent many of his evenings when he was in london and men liked to hear him talk and prophesied fair things for his future as a man of letters all the more surely because he was not called upon to write for bread but could follow the impulse that moved him and wait were it ever so long for the moment of inspiration never forced to spur the jaded steed or work the too willing horse to death not one among the comrades he liked well enough for a jovial evening or a cosy dinner had crept into his heart like the lad he had sworn to cherish in the ears of a dying woman five years ago so when the roses were in bloom and london began to look warm and dusty and the parks had faded a little from their vernal green maurice clissold set forth alone upon a voyage of adventure with a pocket shakespeare and a choir or so of paper in his battered old leather knapsack and just so much clothing and linen as might serve him for his travels needless to say that he avoided that northern city of ebersham where such sudden grief had come upon him and all that route which he had trodden only a year ago with the light-hearted hopeful lad who now slept his sweetest sleep in one of the vaults at kensal green beside the mother he had loved and mourned instead of northward to the land of lakes and mountains maurice went due west many a time had he and james talked of the days they were to spend together down at the old place in cornwall and behold that visit to penwin manor deferred in order that james should see the lake country was destined never to be paid never were those two to walk together by the atlantic never to scale tintagel's rugged height or ramble among the rocks of bood maurice had a curious fancy for seeing the old home from which death had ousted james penwin he might have gone as a visitor to the manor house had he pleased for churchill had been extremely civil to him when they last met at the funeral and had promised him a hearty welcome to penwin whenever he liked to come there but mr clissold infinitely preferred to go as an unknown pedestrian knapsack on shoulder having first taken the trouble to ascertain that churchill penwin and his beautiful young wife were in london where they had for this season a furnished house in upper brook street he saw their names in the list of guests at a fashionable reception and knew that the coast would be clear and that he could roam about the neighbourhood of his dead friend's ancestral home without let or hindrance he went straight to plymouth by an express train crossed the tamar and pursued his journey on foot at a leisurely pace lingering at all the prettiest spots now spending a day or two at some rustic wayside inn sketching a little reading a little writing a little thinking and dreaming a great deal it was an idle fancy that had brought him here and he gave a free rein to all other idle fancies that seized him by the way 
it was a morbid fancy perhaps for it must needs be but a melancholy pleasure at best to visit the domain which his friend had never enjoyed to remember so many boyish schemes unfulfilled so many bright hopes snapped short off by the shears of atropos the long blue line of sea and the wide moorland were steeped in the golden light of a midsummer afternoon when maurice drew near penwin manor the scene was far more lonely than he had imagined it measureless ocean stretched before him melting into the hazy summer sky sea and heaven so near of a colour that it was hard to tell where the water ended and the sky began measureless hills around him and except the white sheep yonder making fleecy dots upon the side of the topmost hill no sign of life he had left the village of penwin behind him by a good two miles but had not yet come in sight of the manor-house though he had religiously followed the track pointed out to him by the hostess of the little inn a mere cottage where he left his knapsack and where he had been respectfully informed that he could not have a bed at the worst i can sleep on the lee side of one of these hills he said to himself it can hardly be very cold even at night in this western climate he walked a little further on upon a narrow footpath high above the sea level on his right hand there were wide cornfields with here and there an open track of turnip or mangold on his left only the wild moorland pastures undulating like a sea of verdure the ground had dipped a little while ago and as it rose again with a gentle ascent maurice clissold saw the chimney stacks of the manor-house between him and the sea it was a substantial-looking house built of greyish stone a long low building with grounds that stretched to the edge of the cliff sheltered by a belt of fir and evergreen oak the blue sea showed in little patches of gleaming colour through the dark foliage and the spicy odour of the pines perfumed the warm still air in its utter loneliness the house had a gloomy look despite the grandeur of its situation on this bold height above the sea the grounds were extensive but to maurice clissold they seemed somewhat barren orderly beyond doubt and well timbered but lacking the smiling fertility the richness of ornament which a student of horace and pliny desired in his ideal garden but mr clissold did not make acquaintance with the inside of the shrubbery or gardens without some little difficulty his footpath led him ultimately into a villainous high road just in front of the gates of penwin so the landlady of the village inn had not sent him astray there was a lodge beside the gate a square stone cottage covered with myrtle honeysuckle and roses from which emerged an elderly female swarthy of aspect her strongly marked countenance framed in a frill cap which gave an almost grotesque look to that tawny visage can i see the house and grounds ma'am asked maurice approaching this somewhat grim-looking personage with infinite civility he had a vague idea that he must have seen that face before or imagined it in a dream so curiously did it remind him of some past occasion in his life what he knew not the house is never shown to strangers answered the woman i know mr penwin and will leave my card for him you'd better apply to the housekeeper as to the grounds my granddaughter will take you round if you like elspeth called the woman and a black-eyed girl of twelve appeared at the cottage door like a sprite at a witch's summons take this gentleman round the gardens said the old woman and vanished before maurice could quite make up his mind as to whether he had seen a face like that in actual flesh and blood or only on a painter's canvas the girl who had an impish look he thought with her loose black locks scarlet petticoat and a scanty scarlet shawl pinned tightly across her bony shoulders led the way through a wild-looking shrubbery where huge blocks of granite lay among the ferns which grew with rank luxuriance between the straight pine stems a sandy path wound in and out among the trees and shrubs till maurice and his guide emerged upon a spacious lawn at the back of the house whose many windows blinked at them shining in the western sun there were no flower-beds on the lawn but there was a small square garden in the dutch style on one side of the house and a bowling green on the other a terraced walk stretched in front of the windows raised three or four feet above the level of the lawn and guarded by a stone balustrade somewhat defaced by time a fine old sundial marked the centre of the dutch garden where the geometrical flower-beds were neatly kept and where maurice found a couple of gardeners elderly men both at work weeding and watering in a comfortable leisurely manner what a paradise for the aged thought maurice the woman at the lodge was old the gardeners are old 
everything about the place is old except this impish girl who looks the oldest of all with her evil black eyes and vinegar voice mr clissold had not come so far without entering into conversation with the damsel he had asked her a good many questions about the place and the people to whom it belonged but her answers were of the briefest and she affected the profoundest ignorance about everything and everybody you've not been here very long i suppose my girl he said at last with some slight sense of irritation or you'd know a little more about the place i haven't been here much above six months oh but your grandmother has lived here all her life i dare say no she hasn't grandmother came when i did and where did you both come from foreign parts answered the girl indeed you both speak very good english for people who come from abroad i didn't say we were foreigners did i asked the girl pertly if you want to ask any more questions about the place or the people you'd better ask em of the housekeeper mrs darvis and if you want to see the house you must ask leave of her and this is the door you'd better ring at if you want to see her they were at one end of the terrace and opposite a half-glass door which opened into a small and darksome lobby where the effigies of a couple of ill-used ancestors frowned from the dusky walls as if indignant at being placed in so obscure a corner maurice rang the bell and after repeating that operation more than once and waiting with consummate patience for the result he was rewarded by the appearance of an elderly female homely fresh-coloured comfortable-looking affording altogether an agreeable contrast to the tawny visage of the lodge-keeper whose countenance had given the traveller an unpleasant feeling about penwin manor mr clissold stated his business and after spelling over his card and deliberating a little mrs darvis consented to admit him and to show him the house we used to show it to strangers pretty freely till the new squire came into possession she said but he's rather particular however if you're a friend of his i know him very well and poor james penwin was my most intimate friend poor mr james i never saw him but once when he came down to see the place soon after the old squire's death such a frank open-hearted young gentleman and so free-spoken it was a terrible blow to all of us down here when we read about the murder not but what the present mr penwin is a liberal master and a kind landlord and a good friend to the poor there couldn't be a better gentleman for penwin i am glad to hear you give him so good a character said maurice the girl elspeth had followed him into the house uninvited and stood in the background open-eyed with her thin lips drawn tightly together listening intently as for mrs penwin said the housekeeper why she's a lady in a thousand she might be a queen there's something so grand about her yet she's so affable that she couldn't pass one of the little children at the poor school without saying a kind word and so thoughtful for the poor that they've no need to tell her their wants she provides for them beforehand a model lady bountiful exclaimed maurice you may run home to your grandmother elspeth said mrs darvis i was to show the gentleman the grounds answered the damsel he hasn't half seen em yet in her devotion to the service she had undertaken the girl followed at their heels through the house absorbing every word that was said by mrs darvis or the stranger the house was old and somewhat gloomy belonging to the tudor school of architecture the heavy stonework of the window frames the lozenge-shaped mullions the massive crossbars were eminently adapted to exclude light even what light the windows did admit was in many places tempered by stained glass emblazoned with the arms and mottoes of the penwin family in all its ramifications showing how it had become entangled with other families and bore the arms of heiresses on its shield until that original badge which sir thomas penwin the crusader had first carried atop of his helmet was almost lost among the various devices in a berry of eight the rooms were spacious but far from lofty the chimney-pieces of carved oak and elaborate workmanship the panelling between mantel-board and ceiling richly embellished and over all the principal chimney-pieces appeared the penwin's arms and motto jaton there was much old tapestry considerably the worse for wear for the house had been sorely neglected during that dreary interval between the revolution and the days of george the third when the penwin family had fallen into comparative poverty and the fine old mansion had been little better than a farmhouse 
indeed brawny agricultural labourers had eaten their bacon and beans and potato pasty in the banqueting hall now the state dining-room handsomely furnished with plain and massive oaken furniture by the old squire churchill's grandfather this room was one of the largest in the house and looked towards the sea drawing-room music-room library and boudoir were on the garden side with windows opening on the terrace the drawing-room and boudoir had been refurbished by churchill since his marriage the old squire kept very little company and hardly ever went inside any of those rooms said mrs darvis in summer he used to sit in the yew tree bower on the bowling green after dinner and in winter he used to smoke his pipe in the steward's room mostly and talk to his bailiff the dining-room was the only large room he ever used so when mr churchill penwin came he found the drawing-room very bare of furniture and what there was was too shabby for his taste so he had that and the boudoir furnished after the old style by a london upholsterer and put a grand piano and a harmonium in the music-room and the drawing-room tapestry is all new made by the goblins mrs penwin told me which i suppose was only her fanciful way of putting it the dame opened the door as she spoke and admitted maurice into this sacred apartment where the chairs and sofas were shrouded with holland the tapestry was an exquisite specimen of that patient art its subject was the story of orion the friendly dolphin and the blue summer sea the greek sailors periander's white-walled palace lived upon the work triangular cabinets of carved ebony adorned the corners of the room and were richly furnished with a bellingham bric-a-brac the only dower sir nugent had been able to give his daughter the chairs and sofas from which mrs darvis lifted a corner of the holland covering for the visitor's gratification were of the same dark wood upholstered with richest olive-green damask of medieval diaper pattern window curtains of the same sombre hue harmonized admirably with the brighter colours of the tapestry the floor was darkest oak only covered in the centre with a persian carpet the boudoir which opened out of the drawing-room was furnished in exactly the same style only here the tapestried walls told the story of hero and leander i believe it was all mrs penwin's taste said the housekeeper when maurice had admired everything her rooms upstairs are a picture nothing out of character with the house the head upholsterer said there's so few ladies have got any notion of character he says they'll furnish an old manor-house with flimsy white and gold of the lewis Kent style only fit for a drawing-room in the champs elisa and if you ask them why they'll say because it's fashionable and they like it mrs penwin is an artist says the upholterer's foreman maurice did not hurry his inspection finding the housekeeper communicative and the place full of interest he heard a great deal about the old squire nicholas penwin who had reigned for forty years and for whom his dependents had evidently felt a curious mixture of fear respect and affection he was a just man said mrs darvis but stern and it was but rarely he forgave any one that once offended him it took a good deal to offend him you know sir but when he did take offence the wound rankled deep i've heard our old doctor say the squire had bad flesh for healing he never got on very well with his eldest son mr george though he was the handsomest of the three brothers and the best of them too to my mind what made them disagree asked maurice they had made the round of the house by this time and the traveller had seated himself comfortably on a broad window-seat in the entrance hall a window through which the setting sun shone bright and warm mrs darvis sat on a carved oak bench by the fireplace resting after her unwanted exertions elspeth stood at a respectful distance her arms folded demurely in her little red shawl listening to the housekeeper's discourse well you see sir returned mrs darvis in her slow methodical way the old squire would have liked mr george to stop at home and take an interest in the estate for he was always adding something to the property and his heart and mind were wrapped up in it as you may say folks might call him a miser but it was not money he cared for it was land and to add to the importance of the family and to bring the estate back to what it had been when this house was built now mr george didn't care about staying at home it was a lazy sleepy kind of life he said and he had set his heart upon going into the army the squire gave way at last and bought mr george a commission but it was in a foot regiment and that went rather against the grain with the young gentleman 
for he wanted to go into the cavalry so they did in part quite so cordial like as they might have done when mr george joined his regiment and went out to india you were here at the time i suppose lord love you sir i was almost born here my mother was housekeeper before me she was the widow of a tradesman in truro very respectably connected mrs penwin the squire's lady took me for her own maid when i was only sixteen years of age and i nursed her all through her last illness twelve years afterwards and when my poor mother died i succeeded her as housekeeper and i look forward to dying in the same room where she died and where i've slept for the last twenty years when my own time comes please god so the squire and his eldest son parted bad friends not exactly bad friends sir but there was a coolness between them anybody could see that mr george or the captain as we used generally to call him after he went into the army hadn't been gone a twelve month before there was a quarrel between the squire and his second son mr balfour on account of the young gentleman marrying beneath him according to his father's ideas the lady was a brewer's daughter and the squire said mr balfour was the first penwin who had ever degraded himself by marrying trade mr balfour was not much above twenty at the time but he took a high hand about the matter and never came to penwin manor after his marriage how was it that the eldest son never married asked maurice ah sir thereby hangs a tale as the saying is mr george came home from india after he'd been away above ten years and had distinguished himself by his good conduct and his courage people told me who had read his name in the papers during the war he looked handsomer than ever i thought when he came home though he was browned by the sun and he was just as kind and pleasant in his manner as he had been when he was only a lad well sir the squire seemed delighted to have him back again and made a great deal of him they were always together about the place and the squire would lean on his son's arm sometimes when he had walked a long way and was a trifle tired it was the first time any one had ever seen him accept anybody's support they used to sit over their wine together of an evening talking and laughing and as happy as father and son could be together all of us we were all old servants felt pleased to see it for we were all fond of mr george and looked to him as our master in days to come and pray how long did this pleasant state of things endure two or three months sir and then all at once we saw a cloud mr george began to go out shooting early in the morning it was the autumn season just then and seldom came home till dark and the squire seemed silent and grumpy of an evening none of us could guess what it all meant for we had heard no high words between the two gentlemen till all at once by some roundabout way which i can't call to mind now the mystery came out there was an elderly gentleman living at Morgrave park a fine old place on the other side of penwin village with an only daughter an heiress and very much thought of mr Morgrave and his daughter had been over to luncheon two or three times since mr george came home and he and the squire had dined at Morgrave park more than once and i suppose miss Morgrave and our mr george had met at other places for they seemed quite friendly and intimate she was a fine-looking young lady but rather masculine in her ways very fond of dogs and horses and such like and riding to hounds all the season through but whatever she did was right according to people's notions on account of her being an heiress and george penwin had fallen in love with this dashing young lady not a bit of it sir it came to our knowledge somehow that the squire wanted mr george to marry her and had some reason to believe that the young lady would say yes if he asked her but mr george didn't like her she wasn't his style he said at which the squire was desperately angry join penwin and morgrave and you'll have the finest estate in the county he said an estate fit for a nobleman a finer property than the penwins owned in the days of james the first mr george wouldn't listen i see what it is the squire cried in a rage 
you want to disgrace me by some low marriage to marry a shopkeeper's daughter like your brother balfour but by heavens if you do i'll alter my will and leave the estate away from my race it didn't matter so much in balfour's case neither he nor his are ever likely to be masters here but i won't stand rebellion from you i won't have a pack of kennel-born mongrels rioting here when i'm mouldering in my grave what a sweet old gentleman mr george swore that he had no thought of making a low marriage no thought of marrying at all yet a while he was happy enough as he was he said but he wouldn't marry a woman he didn't like even to please his father so they went on pretty quietly together for a little while after this the squire grumpy but not saying much and then mr george went up to london and from there he went to join his regiment in ireland where they were stationed after they came from india and he was about at different places for two or three years during which time miss morgrave got married to a nobleman much to the squire's vexation but i'm afraid i'm tiring you sir with such a long story not at all i like to hear it well mr george came back one summer he was home on leave for a little while before he went on foreign service and he and the squire were pretty friendly again it was a very hot summer and mr george used to spend most of his time out of doors fishing or idling away the day somehow the squire had a bad attack of gout that year and was kept pretty close in his room you couldn't expect a young man to sit indoors all day of course but i've often wondered what master george could find to amuse him among those solitary hills of ours or down among the rocks by the sea he stayed all through the summer however and seemed happy enough and at the beginning of the winter he went away to join his regiment which was ordered off to canada i was thankful to remember afterwards that he and the squire parted good friends why asked maurice because they were never to meet again mr george was killed in a fight with the savages six months after he went away i remember the letter coming that brought news one fine summer evening the squire was standing in this hall just by that window when miles the old butler gave him the letter he just read the beginning of it and fell down as if he had been struck dead it was his first stroke of apoplexy and he was never quite the same afterwards though he was a wonderful old gentleman to the last nineteen farewell quoth she and come again to-morrow the old housekeeper's eyes were dim as she finished her story of the heir of penwin he was the best of all she said mr balfour we saw very little of after he grew up being the youngest to marry and leave home mr james was a kind easy-going young fellow enough but mr george was everybody's favourite and there wasn't a dry eye among us when the squire called us together after his illness and told us how his son had died he died like a gentleman upholding the honour of his queen and his country and the name of penwin said the master without a tremble in his voice though it was feebler than before the stroke and i am proud to think of him lying in his far-off grave and if i were not so old i would go over the sea to kneel beside my poor boy's resting-place before i die he displeased me once but we are good friends now and there will be no cloud between us when we meet in another world here mrs darvis was fairly overcome much to the astonishment of the girl elspeth whose uncanny black eyes regarded her with a scornful wonder maurice noticed that look sweet child he said to himself what a charming helpmeet you will make for some honest peasant in days to come with your amiable disposition he had taken his time looking at the old house and listening to the housekeeper's story the sun was low and he had yet to find a lodging for the night he had walked far since morning and was not disposed to retrace his steps to the nearest town a place called seacombe consisting of a long straggling street with various lateral courts and alleys a market-place paris church lock-up and five dissenting chapels of various denominations this seacomb was a good nine miles from penwin manor perhaps you'd like to see the young squire's portrait 
said mrs darvis when she had dried those tributary tears the young squire mr george we used to call him the young squire sometimes yes i should like to have a look at the poor fellow now you've told me his history it hangs in the old squire's study it's a bit of a room and i forgot to show it to you just now maurice followed her across the hall to a small door in a corner deeply recessed and low but solid enough to have guarded the toll-booth one would suppose it opened into a narrow room with one window looking towards the sea the wainscot was almost black with age the furniture old walnut wood of the same time darkened hue there was a heavy old bureau brass-handled and brass-clamped a bookcase a ponderous writing-desk and one capacious armchair covered with black leather the high narrow chimney-piece was in an angle of the room and above this hung the portrait of george penwin it was a kit-cat picture of a lad in undress uniform the face a long oval fair of complexion and somewhat feminine in delicacy of feature the eyes dark blue the rest of the features though sufficiently regular were commonplace enough but the eyes beautiful alike in shape and colour impressed maurice clissold they were eyes which might have haunted the fancy of girlhood with the dream of an ideal lover eyes in whose somewhat melancholy sweetness a poet would have read some strange life history the hair a pale auburn hung in a loosely waving mass over the high narrow brow and helped to give a picturesque cast to the patrician-looking head a nice face said maurice critically there is a little look of my poor friend james penwin but not much poor jim had a gayer brighter expression and had not those fine blue-gray eyes i fancy churchill penwin must be a plain likeness of his uncle george not so handsome but more intellectual looking yes sir assented mrs darvis the present squire is something like his uncle but there's a harder look in his face all the features seem cut out sharper and then his eyes are quite different mr george had his mother's eyes she was a trevilian and one of the handsomest women in cornwall i've seen a face somewhere which that picture reminds me of but i haven't the faintest notion where said maurice in another picture perhaps half one's memories of faces are derived from pictures and they flash across the mind suddenly like a recollection of another world however i mustn't stand prosing here while the sun goes down yonder i have to find a lodging before nightfall what is the nearest place village or farmhouse where i can get a bed do you think mrs darvis there's the bell in penwin village no good i've tried there already the landlady's married daughter is home on a visit and they haven't a bed to give me for love or money mrs darvis lapsed into meditation the nearest farmhouse is trevenard's at borsell end they might give you a bed there for the place is large enough for a barrack but they are not the most obliging people in the world and they are too well off to care about the money you may pay them for the accommodation how far is borsell end between two and three miles then i'll try my luck there mrs darvis said maurice cheerily it lies between that and sleeping under the open sky i wish i could offer you a bed sir but in my position as custodian such an offer would be a breach of good faith to your employers i quite understand that mrs darvis i came here as a stranger to you and i thank you kindly for having been so obliging as to show me the house he dropped a couple of half-crowns into her hand as he spoke but these mrs darvis rejected most decidedly ours has never been what you can call a show-place sir and i've never looked for that kind of perquisite come young one said maurice after taking leave of the friendly old housekeeper you can put me into the right road to borsell end and you shall have one of these for your reward elspeth's black eyes had watched the rejection of the half-crowns with unmistakable greed her sharp face brightened at maurice's promise i'll show you the way sir she said i know every step of it yes the lass is always roaming about like a wild creature over the hills and down by the sea said mrs darvis with a disapproving air i don't think she knows how to read or write or has as much christian knowledge as the old jackdaw in the servants hall i know things that are better than reading and writing said elspeth with a grin what kind of things may those be asked maurice things that other people don't know well my lass i won't trouble you by sounding the obscure depths of your wisdom i only want the straightest road to trevenard's farm 
He is a tenant of this estate, I suppose, Mrs. Darvis? Yes, sir. Michael Trevenard's father was a tenant of the old squire's before my time. Old Mrs. Trevenard is still living, though stone blind, and hardly right in her head, I believe. They had reached the lobby door by this time, the chief hall door being kept religiously bolted and barred during the absence of the family. I shall come and see you again, Mrs. Darvis, most likely, before I leave this part of the country, said Maurice as he crossed the threshold. Good evening. You'll be welcome at any time, sir. Good evening. Elspeth led the way across the lawn with a step so light and swift that it was as much as Maurice could do to keep pace with her, tired as he was, after a long day afoot. He followed her into the pine wood. The trees were not thickly planted, but they were old and fine, and their dense foliage looked inky black against a primrose-colored sky. A narrow footpath wound among the tall black trunks only a few yards from the edge of the cliff which was poorly guarded by a roughly fashioned timber railing the stakes wide apart. The vast Atlantic lay below them, a translucent green in the clear evening light, melting into purple far away on the horizon. Maurice paused to look back at Penwin Manor House, the grave, substantial old dwelling-house which had seen so little change since the days of the Tudors. High gable ends, latticed windows gleaming in the last rays of the setting sun, stone walls moss-darkened and ivy-shrouded, massive porch with deep recesses and roomy enough for a small congregation, mighty chimney-stacks, and a quaint old iron weathercock with a marvellous specimen of the ornithological race pointing its gilded beak due west. Poor old James! What good days we might have had here! sighed Maurice as he looked back at the fair domain. It seemed a place saved out of the good old world and was very pleasant to contemplate after the gym crack palaces of the age we live in, in which all that architecture can conjure from the splendor of the past is more or less disfigured by the tinsel of the present. Dear old James! To think that he wanted to marry that poor little actress girl and bring her to reign down here! in the glow and glory of those stained-glass windows, gorgeous with the armorial devices of a line of county families. Innocent, simple-hearted lad, wandering about like a prince in a fairy tale, trying to fall in love with the first pretty girl he saw by the roadside, and to take her back to his kingdom. "'If you want to see Trevenard's farm before dark, you must come on, sir,' said Elspeth. Maurice took the hint and followed at his briskest pace. They were soon out of the pine grove, which they left by a little wooden gate, and on the wild, wide hills where the distant sheep bell had an eerie sound in the still evening air. Even the gables of the manor house disappeared presently as they went down a dip in the hills. Far off, in a green hollow, Maurice saw some white buildings, scattered untidily near a patch of water which reflected the saffron-hued evening sky. "'That's Trevenard's,' said Elspeth, pointing to this spot. "'I thought as much.' said maurice then you need go no further you fairly earned your fee he gave her the half-crown the girl turned the coin over with a delighted look before she put it in her pocket i'll go to borsal end with you she said i'd as leave beyond the hills as at home sooner for grandmother is not over pleasant company but you better go back now my girl or it'll be dark long before you reach home Elspeth laughed, a queer impish cachination, which made Maurice feel rather uncomfortable. "'You don't suppose I'm afraid of the dark?' she said in her shrill young voice, so young and yet so old in tone. "'I know every star in the sky. Besides, it's never dark at this time of year. I'll go on to Borsal End with you. Maybe you mayn't get accommodated there, and then I can show you a near way across the hills to Penwin Village. You might get shelter at one of the cottages anyhow.' "'Upon my word, you are very obliging,' said Maurice, surprised by this show of benevolence upon the damsel's part. "'Do you know anything about this borsal end?' he asked presently when they were going down into the valley. "'I've never been inside it,' answered Elspeth glibly, more communicative now than she had been an hour or two ago when Churchill questioned her about the house of Penwin. "'Mrs. Trevenard isn't one to encourage a poor girl like me about her place.' She's a rare hard one, they say, and would pinch and scrape for a sixpence. Yet dresses fine on Sundays and lives well. There's always good eating and drinking at Borsal End, folks say. I've heard tell it was a gentleman's house once, before old Squire Penwin bought it, and that there was a fine park round the house. 
there's plenty of trees now and a garden that has all gone to ruin the gentleman that owned borsell spent all his money people say and old squire penwin bought the place cheap and turned it into a farm and it's been in the hands of the trevenards ever since and they're rich enough to buy the place three times over people say if squire penwin would sell it i don't suppose i shall get a very warm welcome if this mrs trevenard is such a disagreeable person said maurice beginning to feel doubtful as to the wisdom of asking hospitality at borsell end oh i don't know about that she's civil enough to gentlefolks i've heard say it's only her servants and such like she's so stiff with you can but try they were at the farm by this time the old house stood before them a broad stretch of greensward in front of it with a pool of blackish-looking water in the middle on which several broods of juvenile ducks were swimming gaily the house was large the walls rough cast with massive timber framework there was a roomy central porch also of plaster and timber and this and a projecting wing at each end of the house gave a certain importance to the building some relics of its ancient gentility still remained to show that borsell end had not always been the house of a tenant farmer a coat of arms roughly cut on a stone tablet over the front door testified to its former owner's pride of birth and the quadrangular range of stables stone built and more important than the house indicated those sporting tastes which might have helped to dissipate the fortunes of a banished and half-forgotten race but borsell end in its brightest day had never been such a mansion as the old tudor manor house of penwin there was a homeliness in the architecture which aspired to neither dignity nor beauty low ceilings square latticed windows dormers in the roof and heavy chimney stacks the only beauty which the place could have possessed at its best was the charm of rusticity an honest simple english home to-day however borsell end was no longer at its best the stone quadrangle where the finest stud of hunters in the country had been lodged was now a straw-yard for cattle one side of the house was overshadowed by a huge barn built out of the debris of the park wall a colony of jovial pigs disported themselves in a small enclosure which had once been a maze a remnant of hedgerow densest yew still marked the boundary of this ancient pleasance but all the rest had vanished beneath the cloven hoof of the unclean animal though the farmyard showed on every side the tokens of agricultural prosperity the house itself had a neglected air the plaster walls green and weather-stained presented the curious blended hues of a stilton cheese in prime condition the timber seemed perishing for want of a good coat of paint poultry were pecking about close under the latticed windows and even in the porch and a vagabond pigling was thrusting his black nose in among the roots of one solitary rose-bush which still lingered on the barren turf borsell end seen in this fading light was hardly a homestead to attract the traveller i don't think much of your borsell end said maurice with a disparaging air however here goes for a fair trial of west country hospitality End of Volume 1, Chapters 18 and 19volume 1 chapters 20 and 21 of a strange world by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain 20 o'er all there hung a shadow and a fear mr clissold entered the porch scattering the affrighted fowls right and left as they sped cackling away the house door which had stood ajar was opened wider by a middle-aged woman who looked at the intruder frowningly we never buy anything of peddlers she said sharply it's no use coming here i'm not a peddler and i haven't anything to sell i am going through cornwall on a walking tour and i want to find a place where i could stop for a week or so and look about the country i am prepared to pay a fair price for a clean homely lodging the housekeeper at penwin manor told me to try here then she sent you on a fool's errand replied the woman we don't take lodgers not as a rule perhaps but you might strain a point in my favour i dare say maurice clissold had a pleasant voice and a pleasant smile mrs trevenard looked at him doubtfully softened in spite of herself by his manner and then no trevenard was ever above earning an honest penny they had not grown rich by refusing chances of small profits come mother cried a cheery voice from within while she was hesitating you can ask the gentleman to come in and sit down a bit anyhow that won't make us nor break us you can walk in and sit down sir if you like 
said Mrs. Trevenard with a somewhat unwilling air. Maurice crossed the threshold and found himself in a large stone-paved room which had once been the hall and was now the living room. The staircase, with its clumsy black-painted balustrades shaped like gouty legs, occupied one side of the room. On the other yawned the mighty chimney with a settle on each side of the wide hearth, a cosy retreat on winter's nights. The glow of the fire had a comfortable look even on this midsummer evening. A young man, tall, broad-shouldered, good-looking, clad in a suit of velveteen which gave him something the air of a gamekeeper, stood near the hearth cleaning a gun. He it was who had spoken just now, Martin Trevenard, the only son of the house, and about the only living creature who had any influence with his mother. Pride ruled her, religion, or bigotry had power over her, gold was the strongest influence of all. But of all the mass of humanity there was but one unit she cared for besides herself, and that one was Martin. "'Sit down and make yourself at home, sir,' said the young man heartily. "'You've walked far, I dare say.' "'I have,' answered Maurice, "'but I don't want to rest anywhere until I am sure that I can get a night's shelter. There was no room for me at the bell at Penwyn, but I left my knapsack there, thinking I should be forced to go back to the village anyhow. It was an afterthought coming on here. "'Oh, by the way, there's a girl outside, the lodgekeeper's daughter who has been my guide so far and wants to know my fate before she goes home. "'What can you do with me, Mrs. Trevenard? I'm not particular. "'Give me a truss of clean hay in one of your barns if you're afraid to have me in the house.' "'Don't be ill-natured, old lady,' said the young man. "'The gentleman is a gentleman. One can see that with half an eye. "'That's all very well, Martin.' but what will your father say to our taking in a stranger without so much as knowing his name? My name is Clissold, said the applicant, taking a card out of his pocket-book and throwing it on the polished beechwood table, the only handsome piece of furniture in the room. A massive oblong table big enough for twelve or fourteen people to sit at. There are my name and address, and so far as payment in advance goes, he put a sovereign down beside the card. "'There's for my night's accommodation and refreshment. "'Put your money in your pocket, sir. "'You're a friend of Mr. Penwin's, I suppose?' "'asked Mrs. Trevenard, still doubtful. "'I know the present Mr. Penwin, "'but I cannot call myself his friend. "'The poor young fellow who was murdered, "'James Penwin, was my nearest and dearest friend, "'my adopted brother. "'Let the gentleman stop, mother. "'We've rooms enough and to spare "'in this gloomy old barrack.' A fresh face always brightens us up a little, and it's nice to hear how the world goes on. Father's always satisfied when you are. You can put the gentleman in that old room at the end of the corridor. You needn't be frightened, sir. There are no ghosts at Borsal End, added Martin Trevenard, laughing. His mother still hesitated, but after a pause she said, Very well, sir. You can stop to-night, and as long as you please afterwards at a fair price— "'Say a guinea a week for eating, drinking, and sleeping, "'and a trifle for the servant when you go away.' "'Even in consenting, the woman seemed to have a lingering reluctance "'as if she were giving assent to something which she felt should have been refused. "'Your terms are moderation itself, madam, and I thank you. "'I'll send away my small guide.' "'He went out to the porch where Elspeth sat waiting, "'no doubt a listener to the conversation.' Maurice rewarded her devotion with an extra sixpence and dismissed her. Away she sped through the gathering gloom, light of foot as a young fawn. Maurice felt considerably relieved by the comfortable adjustment of the lodging question. He seated himself in an armchair by the hearth and stretched out his legs in the ruddy glow with a blissful sense of repose. Is there such a thing as a lad about the place who would go to the bell at Penwin to fetch my knapsack for consideration? he asked. There was a cowboy who would perform that service, it seemed. Martin went out himself to look for the rustic Mercury. "'He's a good-natured lad, my son,' said Mrs. Trevenard, "'but full of fancies. That comes of idleness and too much education, his father says. His grandmother yonder never learned to read or write, and twas she and her husband made Borsal end what it is.' Following the turn of Mrs. Trevenard's head, Maurice perceived that an object which in the obscurity of the room he had taken for a piece of furniture was in reality a piece of humanity. A very old woman dressed in dark garments with only a narrow white border peeping from under a cowl-shaped black silk cap, 
a dingy red handkerchief pinned across her shoulders and two bony hands whose shrivelled fingers moved with a mechanical regularity in the process of stocking knitting ay said a quivering voice i can't read or write that's to say i couldn't even when i had my sight but between us michael and i made borsal what it is young people don't understand the old ways they have servants to wait upon em and play the harpsichord but little good comes of it is she blind asked maurice of the younger mrs trevenard in a whisper the old woman's quick ear caught the question stone blind sir for the last eighteen years but the lord has been good to me i've a comfortable home and kind children and they don't turn me out of doors though i'm such a useless creature a gloomy figure in that dark corner beyond the glow of the fire maurice felt that the room was less comfortable somehow since he had discovered the presence of this old woman with her sightless orbs and never resting fingers long and lean weaving her endless web gloomy as clotho herself a plump ruddy-cheeked maid-servant came bustling in with preparations for supper making an agreeable diversion over this sad little episode she lighted a pair of tall tallow candles and tall brass candlesticks which feebly illumined the large low room the wainscoted walls were blackened by smoke and time and from the cross-beams that sustained the low ceiling hung a grove of hams while flitches of bacon adorned the corners where there was less need of headway every object in the room belonged to the useful rather than the beautiful yet there was something pleasant to maurice's unaccustomed eye in the homely old-world comfort of the place he took advantage of the light to steal a glance at the face of his hostess as she helped the servant to lay the cloth and place the viands on the table bridget trevenard was about fifty years of age but there were a few wrinkles on the square brow or about the eyes and mouth she was tall buxom and broad-shouldered a woman who looks as if she had few feminine weaknesses either moral or physical the muscular arm and broad open chest betokened an almost virile strength her skin was bright and clear her nose broad and thick but fairly mottled of its kind her underlip full and firm as if wrought in iron the upper lip long straight and thin her eyes were dark brown bright and hard with that sharp penetrating look which is popularly supposed to see through deal boards and even stone walls on occasion so at least thought the servants at borsal end a model farmer's wife this mrs trevenard a severe mistress yet not unjust or unkind a proud woman and in her own particular creed something of a zealot a woman who loved money not so much for its own sake as because it served the only ambition she had ever cherished namely to be more respectable than her neighbours wealth went a long way towards this superior respectability therefore did mrs trevenard toil and spin and never cease from labour in the pursuit of gain she was the motive power of borsal end her superlative energy kept michael trevenard a somewhat lazy man by nature a patient slave at the mill martin was the only creature at borsal who escaped her influence for him life meant the indulgence of his own fancies with just so much work as gave him an appetite for his meals he would drive the wagon to the mill or superintend the men at haymaking and harvest he rather liked attending market and was a good hand at a bargain but to the patient drudgery of everyday cares young trevenard had a rooted objection he was good-looking good-natured walked well sang well whistled better than any other man in the district and was a general favourite people said that the good blood of the old trevenard showed in young martin twenty one he cometh not she said when the supper-table was ready the servant-girl ran to the porch and rang a large bell which was kept under one of the benches a bell that pealed out shrilly over the silent fields this summons brought home michael trevenard who appeared in about five minutes pulling down his shirt-sleeves and carrying his coat over his arm while some stray wisps of hay which hung about his hair and clothes indicated that he had but that moment left the yard where they were building a huge stack which maurice had seen looming large through the dusk as he approached borsal we've stacked the fourteen-acre piece mother said the farmer as he pulled out his coat and a fine stack it is too as sweet as a hazelnut no fear of mildew this year and now i'll give myself a wash he stopped surprised at beholding a stranger standing by his hearth 
Maurice had risen to receive the master of the house. Martin explained the traveller's presence. "'We've taken to lodging letting since you've been out, father,' he said in his easy way. "'This gentleman wants to stay here and to look about the country round for a few days, and as mother thought he'd be company for me and knew you wouldn't have any objection, she said yes. "'Mr. Clissold, that's the gentleman's name, is a friend of the family up yonder.' An upward jerk of Martin's head indicated the manor house. "'Any friend of the squire's, or any one your mother thinks proper to accommodate, my lad, she's missus here,' answered Mr. Trevenard. "'You're kindly welcome, sir.' The farmer went out to some back region whence was immediately heard an energetic pumping and splashing, and a noise as of a horse being rubbed down, after which Mr. Trevenard reappeared, lobster-like of complexion and breathing hard after his rapid exertions. He was a fine-looking man with a face which might fairly be supposed to show the blood of the Trevenards, for the features were of a patrician type, and the broad open brow inspired at once respect and confidence. That candid countenance belonged to a man too incapable of deceit to be capable of suspicion, a man whom an artful child might cheat with impunity, a man who could never have grown rich unaided. Mr. and Mrs. Trevenard, their son and their guest, sat down to supper without delay but the old blind mother still kept her seat in the shadowy corner and ate her supper apart it consisted only of a basin of broth sprinkled with chopped parsley which the old woman sipped slowly while the rest were eating their substantial meal maurice had eaten nothing since noon and did ample justice to the lordly round of corned beef and home-cured chine the freshly gathered lettuces and even the gooseberry pie and clotted cream he and Martin talked all supper-time, while the house-mother carved, and the farmer abandoned himself to the pleasures of the table, and drank strong cider with easy enjoyment after the toilsome day. "'There's no place like a hay-field for making a man thirsty,' he said by way of apology after one of his deep draughts, "'and I can't drink the cat-lap mother sends to the men.' Martin talked of field-sports and boating. He had a little craft of his own, four or five tons burden, and was passionately fond of the water. By and by the conversation drifted round to the squire of Penwin. "'He rides well,' said Martin. "'But I don't believe he's over-fond of hunting, though he subscribes handsomely to the hounds. I never knew such a fellow for doing everything liberally. He's bound to be popular, for he's the best master they ever had at the manor.' "'And is he popular?' asked Maurice. "'Well, I hardly know what to say about that. "'I only know that he ought to be. "'People are so hard to please. "'There are some say they liked the old squire best, "'though he wasn't half so generous, "'and didn't keep any company worth speaking of. "'He had a knack of talking to people "'and making himself one of them that went a long way. "'And then some people remember Mr. George "'and seem to have a notion that this man is an interloper. "'He oughtn't to have come into the property, they say.' providence never could have meant the son of the youngest son to have penwin they're as full of fancies as an egg is full of meat in our parts so it seems mrs penwin is liked i suppose yes she made friends with the poor people in no time and then she's a great beauty people go miles to see her when she rides to covert with her husband there's a sister too still prettier to my mind Martin promised to show his new friend all that was worth seeing for twenty miles round Borsal. He would have the dog-cart ready early next morning directly after breakfast, in fact, and six o'clock was breakfast time at the farm. Maurice was delighted with the friendly young fellow and thought that he had stumbled upon a very agreeable household. Mrs. Trevenard was somewhat stern and repellent in manner, no doubt, but she was not absolutely uncivil, and Mr. Clissold felt that he should be able to get on with her pretty well. She had said grace before meat, and she stopped the two young men in their talk presently and offered a thanksgiving after the meal. It was a long grace, methodistical in tone, with an allusion to Esau's mess of pottage, which was brought in as a dreadful example of gluttony. After this ceremonial, Mrs. Trevenard went upstairs to superintend the preparation of the stranger's apartment. The grandmother vanished at the same time, spirited away by the serving wench, who led her out by a little door that opened near her corner and the three men drew round the hearth, lighted their pipes and smoked and talked in a very friendly fashion for the next half-hour or so. They were talking merrily enough when Mrs. Trevenard came downstairs again, candle in hand. 
she had taken out one of the old silver candlesticks which had been part of her dower in order to impress the visitor with a proper notion of her respectability your room's ready mr clissold she said and here's your bedroom candle maurice took the hint and bade his new friends good night he followed mrs trevenard up the broad bulky old staircase and to the end of the corridor the room into which she led him was large and had once been handsome but some barbarian had painted the oak panelling pink and the wood carving over the fireplace had been defaced by the industrious knives of several generations of schoolboys there was a good deal of broken glass in the lattices and a general air of dilapidude a fire burned briskly in the wide basket-shaped grate and though it brightened the room made these traces of decay all the more visible it's a room we never use said mrs trevenard so we haven't cared to spend money upon it there's always enough money wanted for repairs and we haven't need to waste any upon fanciful improvements the place is dry enough for i take care to open the windows on sunny days and there's nothing better than air and sun to keep a room dry i had the fire lighted to-night for cheerfulness sake you are very kind replied maurice pleased to see his knapsack on a chair by the bed and the room will do admirably it looks the pink of cleanliness i don't harbour dirt even in unused rooms answered mrs trevenard it needs a mistress's eye to keep away cobwebs and vermin but i've never spared myself trouble that way good night sir good night mrs trevenard by the way you've no ghosts here i think your son said i hope both you and he know better than to believe in any such rubbish sir of course only this room looks the very picture of a haunted chamber and if i were capable of believing in ghosts i should certainly lie awake on the lookout for one to-night those whose faith is surely grounded have no such fancies sir replied mrs trevenard severely and closed the door without another word the rooms look haunted for all that muttered maurice and then involuntarily repeated those famous lines of hoods for all there hung a shadow and a fear a sense of mystery the spirit daunted and said as plain as whisper in the ear the place is haunted the bedstead was a four-poster with tall spirally twisted posts and some dark drapery shrunken with age and too small for the wooden framework there was an old-fashioned press or wardrobe of black wood whose polished surface reflected the firelight a three-cornered wash-hand stand and a clumsy-looking chest of drawers between the windows surmounted by a cracked looking-glass completed the furniture of the room the boards were uncarpeted and showed knots and dark patches in the warm-eaten wood which a morbid fancy might have taken for the traces of some half-forgotten murder not a cheerful-looking room by any means even with the aid of that blazing fire thought maurice he opened one of the casements and looked out the night air was soft and balmy perfumed with odours of clover and the newly stacked hay the atlantic lay before him shining under the great red moon which had but just risen a pleasanter prospect this than the bare walls of faded dirty pink the black clothes-press and funereal four-poster maurice lingered at the window his arms folded on the broad ledge his thoughts wandering idly wandering back to last year and the moonlight that had shone upon the cathedral towers of ebersham the garden of the waterfowl inn and the winding river poor james he mused how happy that light-hearted fellow might have been at penwin manor how happy and how popular he would have had the knack of pleasing people with that frank easy kindness of his and would have made friends of half the county and if he had married that actress girl a folly no doubt but who knows if it all might not have ended happily there was nothing vulgar or low about that girl indeed she had the air of one of nature's gentlewomen it would have been a little difficult for her to learn all the duties of a chatelaine perhaps how to order a dinner and whom to invite the laws of precedence the science of morning calls but if james loved her and chose her from all other women for his wife why should he not have been happy with her i was a fool to oppose his fancy still more a fool for leaving him he might be alive now perhaps but for that wild goose journey of mine here his thoughts took another turn they went back to that train of circumstances which had brought about his absence from ebersham on the night of james penwin's murder 
it was past midnight when maurice clissold roused himself from that long reverie and prepared for peaceful slumber in the funereal bed his fire had burned low by this time and the red glow of the expiring embers was drowned in the full splendour of the risen moon whose light silvered the bare boards and brought into strong relief those stains and blotches upon the wood which looked so like the traces of ancient murder the bed was luxurious for there was no stint of feathers at borsal end yet maurice wooed the god of sleep in vain he began to think that there must be some plumage of game birds mingled with the stuffing of his couch and that soft and deep as it was this was one of those beds upon which a man could neither sleep nor die comfortably i ought to be tired enough to sleep on a harder bed than this considering the miles i've walked to-day he thought it may have been that he was overtired or it may have been that flood of silver light streaming through the diamond panes of yonder lattice whatever might be the reason of his restlessness sleep came not to straighten his unquiet limbs or to steep his wandering thoughts in her cool waters of forgetfulness he heard a distant clock in the hall where he had supped most likely strike two and just at this time a gentle drowsiness began to steal over him he was just falling deep down into some sleepy hollow soft as a bed of poppies when his door was opened by a cautious hand and a light footstep sounded on the floor he was wide awake in a minute and without moving from his recumbent position drew the dark curtain back a little way and looked towards the door the shadow of the curtain fell upon him as he lay and the bedstead looked unoccupied the ghost he said to himself with rather an awful feeling i knew there must be one in such a room or perhaps the house is on fire and someone has come to warn me no that wanderer through the deep of night had evidently no business with mr clissold nay was unconscious of or indifferent to the fact of his existence the figure slowly crossed the floor with a light step but a little sliding noise as of a foot ill shod a slipper down at heel it came full into the moonlight presently between the bedstead and the two windows ay verily a ghost thought maurice with a feeling like ice-cold water circulating slowly through every artery in his body never had he seen or conceived within his mind a figure more spectral yet with a certain wild beauty in its ghastliness he raised himself in his bed still keeping well within the shadow of the curtains and watched the spectre with eyes which seemed endowed with a double power of vision in the thrilling intensity of that moment the spectre was a woman's form tall slender nay so wasted that it seemed almost unnaturally tall the face was death pale in that solemn light the eyes large and dark the hair ebony black and falling in long loose masses over the white garment whose folds were straight as those of a winding sheet so might the dead risen from a new-made grave have looked the figure went straight to one of the casements that furthest from the bed and at right angles with it unfastened the hasp and flung the window wide open she drew a chair close to the open window and kneeled upon it resting her arms on the sill and leaning out of the window as if watching for some one to come thought maurice that frozen blood of his beginning to thaw a little those actions seem too deliberate and real for a ghost he told himself phantoms must surely be soundless now i heard the slipshod feet upon the floor i heard the scrooping of the chair i can see a gentle heaving of the breast under that shroud-like garment ergo my visitor is not a ghost who can she be not mrs trevenard assuredly nor the old blind grandmother nor the buxom lass who waited on us at supper i thought those were all the womankind in the house a heavy sigh from that unearthly-looking intruder startled him a sigh so long so full of anguish so like the utterance of some lost soul in pain difficult not to yield to superstitious fear as he gazed at that kneeling figure with its long dark hair and delicate profile sharply outlined against the black shadow of the deep-sunk casement again came the sigh despairing desolate oh my love my love why don't you come back to me the words broke like a cry of despair from those pale lips not loud was the sorrowful appeal but so full of pain that it touched the listener's heart more deeply than the most passionate burst of louder grief could have done dear love you promised you promised me 
how could i have lived if i had not thought you would come back then the tone changed she was no longer appealing to another but talking to herself hurriedly breathlessly with ever-increasing agitation why not to-night why shouldn't he come back to-night he was always fond of moonlight nights he promised to be true to me and stand by me come what might no harm should ever come to me he swore that swore it with his arms round me his eyes looking into mine no man could be false and yet look as he looked and speak as he spoke silence for a brief space and then a sudden cry a sharp anguish-stricken cry as of a broken heart who said he was dead and gone dead and gone years ago the world wouldn't look as bright as it does if he were dead he loved the moonlight could you shine false moon if he were dead again a pause and then a slower more thoughtful tone as if doubts disturbed that demented brain was it last year he used to come last year when we were so happy together last year when a sudden burst of tears interrupted the sentence the woman's face fell forward on her folded arms and the frail body was shaken by her sobs maurice clissold no longer doubted his visitant's humanity this was real grief perchance real madness for a little while he had fancied it a case of somnambulism but the eyes which he had seen lifted despairingly to that moonlit sky had too much expression for the eyes of a somnambulist for a long time or time that seemed long to clissel's mind the woman knelt by the window now silent motionless as an inanimate figure now talking rapidly to herself anon invoking that absent one whose broken promises were perhaps the cause of her wandering wits never had the young man beheld a more piteous spectacle it was as if one of wordsworth's most pathetic pastorals were here realized his heart ached at the sound of those heartbroken sighs this flesh-and-blood sorrow moved him more deeply than any spectral woe this was no ghostly revisitant of earth who acted over agonies dead and gone but a living loving woman who mourned a loss or a faithless lover at last with one farewell look seaward as if it were a long yon moonlight track across the waves she watched for the return of her lover this new hero turned from the casement closed it carefully and quietly and then slowly left the room maurice heard that slipshod foot going slowly along the passage until the sound dwindled and died in the distance he fancied sleep would have been impossible after such a scene as this but perhaps that overstrained attention of the last hour had exhausted his wakefulness for he fell off presently into a sound slumber from which he was only awakened by a friendly voice outside his door saying six o'clock mr clissold if you want the long round i promised you last night we ought to start at seven all right answered maurice as gaily as if no uncanny visitor had shortened his slumbers i'll be with you in half an hour he kept his word and was down in the hall or family sitting-room just in time to hear the noisy old eight-day clock strike the half-hour with a slow and laborious movement of its inward anatomy as if fast subsiding into dumbness and decrepitude mr trevenard had breakfasted an hour ago and gone forth to his haymakers mrs trevenard was busy about the house but the old blind grandmother sat in her corner plying those never-resting needles just as she had sat just as she had knitted last night with no more apparent share or interest in the active life around her than the old clock had there was a liberal meal ready for the stranger last night's round of beef and a cornish ham archetype of hams adorned the board but were only intended as a reserve force in case of need while the breakfast proper consisted of a dish of broiled ham and eggs and another of trout caught a hundred yards or so from the house that morning home-baked bread white and brown a wedge of golden honeycomb and a plate of strawberries counted for nothing both young men did justice to the breakfast which they ate together making the best use of the half-hour allotted for the meal and not talking so much as they had done last night at the more leisurely evening repast i hope you slept pretty well said martin when he had taken the edge off a healthy appetite and was trifling with a slice of beef not quite so well as i ought to have done in so comfortable a bed my brain was a little overactive i believe ah that's a complaint i don't suffer from father says i haven't any brains i tell him brains don't grow at borsell end one year is so like another that we get to be a kind of clockwork like poor old granny yonder 
we get up every morning at the same hour look out of our windows to see what sort of weather it is eat and drink and walk about the farm and go to bed again without using our minds at all from the beginning to the end of the business father and i brighten up a little on market days but for the rest of our lives we might just as well be a couple of slow-going machines there is nothing drowsy or mechanical about your mother's nature i should think in spite of the quiet life you all lead here no mother's mind is a candle that would burn to waste in a dark cellar her blood isn't poppy juice like the trevenards do you know that my father has never been as far as plymouth one way or as far as penzance the other way in his life he has no call to go he says so he doesn't go he squats here upon his land like a toad and would if his life was to be threescore and ten centuries instead of as many years you would like a different kind of life i dare say suggested maurice the young man's bright eye reminded him of a caged squirrel's a wild free-born creature longing for the liberty of forests and untrodden groves yes if i could have chosen my own life i would have been a soldier like george penwin to die by the hands of savages yes they say he had a hard death that those copper-coloured devils scalped him tied him to a tree tortured him his soldiers went mad with revenge and roasted some of the miscreants alive afterwards i believe but that wouldn't bring the captain to life again do you remember him well he used to come fishing in our water the very stream that trout came out of this morning i was a little chap of eight or nine years old when the captain was last home and used to catch flies for him and carry his basket and loaf about with him half the day through and many a half-crown has he given me for he was an open-handed fellow always and one of the handsomest pleasantest young men i ever remember seeing when i say young i suppose he must have been past thirty at this time for he was the oldest of the three brothers and balfour the youngest had been married ever so many years but here's the trap and we'd better be off good-bye granny the old woman gave a hoarse chuckle of response marvellously like the internal rumbling of the ancient clock good morning ma'am said maurice anxious to be civil but of his salutation the dame took no notice the horse though clumsily built and not unacquainted with the plough was a good goer the two young men had soon left borsal and behind them down in its sleepy hollow and were driving over the fair green hills now to fathom the mystery of last night's adventure thought maurice when they were out of sight of borsal i think i can venture to speak pretty freely to this good-natured young man he meditated a few minutes and then began the attack when you asked me at breakfast how i rested last night i didn't give you quite a straightforward answer he said there was a reason for my not getting a full allowance of sleep which i didn't care to speak of till you and i were alone indeed said martin trevenard looking round at him sharply what was that there was a lurking anxiety in that keen glance of scrutiny maurice clissold thought some one came into my room in the dead of the night a woman he said at first i almost thought she was a ghost i was never so near yielding to superstitious terror in my life but i soon discovered my mistake and that she was only a living suffering fellow-creature i am very sorry such a thing should have happened said martin gravely she ought to be better taken care of the person you saw must have been my unfortunate sister your sister yes she is ten years older than i and not quite right in her mind but she is perfectly harmless has never in her life attempted to injure any one not even herself poor soul though her own existence is dreary enough and neither my father nor my mother will consent to send her away to be taken care of our old doctor sees her now and then and doesn't call her mad she is only considered a little weak in her intellect has she been so from childhood asked maurice oh dear no she went to school at halstone and was quite an accomplished young woman i believe played the piano and painted flowers and was brought up quite like a young lady never put her hand to dairy work or anything of the kind she was a very handsome girl in those days and father and mother were uncommonly proud of her i can just remember her when she left school for good i was always hanging about her and i used to think she was like a beautiful princess in a fairy tale she was very good to me told me fairy stories and sung to me in the twilight 
many a time i've fallen asleep in her lap lulled by her sweet voice when i was a little chap of eight or nine there were only us two and she was very fond of me poor muriel what was it brought about such a change in her well that's a story i've never quite got to the bottom of it's a sore subject even with father who's easy enough to deal with about most things and as to mother you have but to mention muriel's name to make her look like thunder yet she's never unkind to the poor soul i know that does your sister live among you when you are alone no she has a little room over granny's with a little old-fashioned staircase leading up to it a room quite cut off from the rest of the house you can't reach it except by going through granny's bedroom which is on the ground floor you must understand on account of the old lady's weak legs now one of poor muriel's fancies is to roam about the house in the middle of the night especially moonlight nights for the moonlight makes her wakeful so as a rule granny locks her door of a night however i suppose last night the old lady forgot in consequence of the excitement caused by your arrival and that's how you happen to have such an uncomfortable time you haven't told me even the little you do know as to the cause of your sister's state haven't i all i know is what my father told me once she was crossed in love it seems loved someone rather above her in station and never got over it that comes of being constant to one's first fancy you say she lives in a room by herself does she never have air or exercise do you imagine us barbarians yes she roams about the old neglected garden at the back of the house just as she pleases but never goes beyond she has a pretty clear notion that that is her beat poor girl and i've never known her break bounds mother fetches her indoors at sunset and gives her her supper and sees that she's comfortable for the night and tries to keep her clothes decent and tidy but the poor soul tears them sometimes when her melancholy fit is upon her end of volume one chapters twenty and twenty one volume one chapters twenty two and twenty three of a strange world by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty two and i shall be alone until i die the image of that white-robed figure pallid face and ebon hair haunted maurice clissold throughout the day though his day was very pleasant and martin trevenard the most cheerful of companions they halted at various villages explored old parish churches where tarnished and blackened brasses told of mitred abbots and lords of the soil otherwise unrecorded and forgotten clissold was learned in church architecture and not a gargoyle escaped his keen eye martin was pleased to exhibit the interesting features of his native land and listened deferentially to maurice's disquisitions on brasses fonts and piscine they stopped at a wayside inn lunched heartily on bread and cheese and cider and were altogether as companionable as young men can well be martin had read about half a dozen books since he left halstone grammar school but those were of the highest character and he had them in his heart of hearts shakespeare pope and byron were his poets fielding goldsmith and scott his only romances from shakespeare and scott he had learned history from fielding and goldsmith he had caught the flavor of wit and humor that are dead as the latin classics thus clissold found not without a touch of surprise that the farmer's son was no unworthy companion for a man who had made literature his profession on their homeward round they pulled up at penwin church which stood high and dry on the green hillside midway between the village and the manor and looked like a church that had fallen from the sky so completely was it out of everybody's way tradition insisted that in the middle ages there had been a village close to the church but no trace of that vanished settlement remained there stood the temple square towered with crocketed finials at the four angles of the tower there lay its ancient slumberous graveyard on the slope of the hill the dead forever basking in the southern sun which in this midsummer weather seemed to have power enough to warm them back to life again here maurice saw the resting-place of the penwins almost as old as the church itself a vault so large that these lords of the soil seemed to have a whole crypt to themselves very mouldy and cold and dark was this last abode of the squires and their race here he saw also the parish registers which contained a concise synopsis of the history of the penwins since the middle ages how they had been christened married and buried james ought to have been brought down here 
said maurice when they were in the churchyard where the deep soft grass was full of field flowers and the air of sweet homely odours not in that mouldy old crypt with his ancestral dust but here amongst this thymy grass face to face with the sun and the sea and with the skylark singing above his grave it would have been ever so much better than kensal green it was eight o'clock when they drove down into the valley where the old white house and its numerous barns and outbuildings looked like a village nestling in that grassy hollow the scene looked just the same as last night when maurice clissold approached it for the first time the same stillness upon all things the same low yellow light in the western sky the same red glow from the hall fire the same changeless figure of the old grandmother in her high-backed leather-covered armchair half hidden in the shadow of the corner where she sat it wanted an hour to supper and mr trevenard was struggling with some accounts at a table by one of the windows where he had the last of the dying daylight hope you've had a pleasant day sir he said without looking up from his papers or relaxing the frown with which he contemplated a long column of figures take a pull of that cider after your drive it's only just drawn you might give me a hand with these accounts martin i never was a dab at figures all right father we'll soon tot em up martin sat down by his father and took the pen out of his hand maurice refreshed himself with a draught of cider and then went on to the porch i should like to take a look round the place between this and supper-time if you don't mind mr trevenard he said look where you please sir you're free and welcome you'll hear the supper-bell at nine o'clock maurice lighted a cigar as he left the porch and prepared for a contemplative dreamy stroll one calm hour of solitude before the day was done he avoided the stackyard and did not honour the various families of black and white picklings in diverse stages of infancy and adolescence with his attention he made a circuit of the pond and went round to the back of the homestead where lay that neglected garden which he had seen from the distance at this midsummer time it was a wilderness of verdure and flowers ran wild great lavender bushes forests of unpruned roses tall white lilies syringa carnations weeds and blossoms growing as they would moss-grown paths a broken sundial fallen across a bed of heart's ease and mignonette beyond the flower garden there was a still deeper wilderness of hazel quinces and alders which drew their chief sustenance from a shallow pool whose dark shining surface was almost hidden by the spreading branches the grey old trunks the thick screen of leaves through which the light came dimly even at noon a delightful spot for a meditative poet maurice was charmed with garden and wilderness and lighted a second cigar on the strength of his discovery of the alder and quince grove it was not easy walking here by reason of the undergrowth of st john's wort fern and briar which made a dense jungle but after a little exploration mr clissold came upon a narrow footpath evidently well trodden which wound in and out among the old grey trunks and under the hazel boughs till it brought him to the brink of the water the pool was wider than he had thought but so covered with water lilies that the dark water only showed in patches through that thick carpet of shining leaves just such a pool as a stranger might easily walk into unawares maurice pulled up in time and seated himself on the gnarled trunk of an alder whose roots straggled deep down into the water among sedges and innocent harmless cresses here he slowly pulled at his cigar abandoning himself to such thoughts as a poet has in such a scene and such an hour the last yellow gleam of the sun shone faintly behind the low thick trees and through the one break in the wood the distant sea-line showed darkly grey just where ocean merged into sky i should write better verses if i lived here for a year thought maurice musing upon a certain volume which he meant to give the world by and by he hardly knew whether there would be much in it worthy the world's acceptance it was only the outpouring of a strong fresh soul a soul that had known its share of human sorrow and done a brave man's battle with care he was deep in a reverie that had led him very far away from borsal end when he heard a rustling of the branches near him and turned quickly round expecting to see martin trevenard the face that looked at him from between the parted hazel boughs startled him almost as much as that white-robed figure last night it was the face he had seen in the moonlight and which he saw now with peculiar distinctness in the clear grey light a wan white face with large dark eyes a face which once must have been most beautiful the dark eyes the delicate features were still beautiful 
but the complexion was almost ghastly in its pallor and the eyes were unnaturally bright this was muriel trevenard maurice thought she would have been frightened at sight of him and would have hurried away but to his surprise she came a little nearer him cautiously stealthily even those restless eyes glancing right and left as she approached there was a curious intensity in her gaze when her eyes fixed themselves at last upon his face peering at him scrutinizing him with something of her mother's keen look one hand was lifted to her head to push back the wild mass of tangled hair and the loose sleeve of her gown fell back from the white wasted arm face and body seemed alike wasted by the mind's consuming fire you can tell me perhaps she said in a quick eager voice others won't they're too unkind for they must know you can tell me i'm sure when will he come back my poor soul i would gladly tell you if i knew but i don't even know whom you are talking of oh yes you do mother knows she told you i dare say i'm not going to tell his name i promise to keep that secret whatever it cost me to be silent and i'm not going to break my promise when is he coming back she paused looking at him with beseeching expectant eyes as if she waited breathless for his answer is he ever coming back she waited again indeed miss trevenard i know nothing about it how dare you call me miss trevenard that's not my name muriel then that's better he called me muriel her chin dropped on her breast and she stood for a few moments looking down at the water all her face softened by some sweet sad thought he called me muriel she repeated muriel muriel i can hear his voice now hear it yes as plainly as i can see him when i close my eyes again a pause and then an eager question how can he be dead when he is so near me how can he be dead when i hear him and see him and can even feel the touch of his hand upon my head his lips upon my lips he awakes me from my sleep sometimes with a kiss but when i open my eyes he is gone was he always a spirit she seemed unconscious of maurice's presence as she moved a few paces further along the water's edge always looking downward in self-communion my love how can they say that you are dead when i am waiting for you so patiently and will wait for you to the end wait till you come to take me away with you it was to be little more than a year you told me oh god what a long year the anguish in that last ejaculation pierced the listener's heart as it had been pierced by her wild cry of sorrow last night he followed her along the brink of the pool put his arm round her shrunken form protectingly and tried to comfort her as best he might knowing so little of her grief muriel he said gently and her name so spoken seemed to have a softening influence upon her i am almost a stranger to this place and to you but i would gladly be your friend if i could tell me if there is anything i can do to comfort you are you happy in your home with your poor old grandmother or would you rather be somewhere else he wanted to find out if she was suffering from any sense of ill usage if she felt herself a prisoner and an alien in her father's house no she said resolutely i must stay here he will come and fetch me but you speak sometimes as if you knew him to be dead is it not foolish vain to hope for that which cannot happen he is not dead people have told me so on purpose to break my heart i think haven't i told you that i see him very often then why are you so unhappy because he will not stay with me because he does not come to fetch me away as he promised in a little more than a year because he comes and goes like a spirit perhaps they are right and he is really dead would it not be better to make up your mind to that and to leave off watching for him and roaming about the house at night who told you that she asked quickly never mind who told me you see i know how foolish you are wouldn't it be wiser to try and go back to the common business of life to bind up all that loose hair neatly like a lady and try to be a comfort to your father and mother at that last word an angry cry broke from the pale lips mother echoed muriel i have no mother that woman yonder pointing towards the house is my worst enemy mother my mother with a bitter laugh 
ask her what she has done with my child that question came upon maurice clissold like a revelation here was a sadder story than he had dreamt of a story which no word of martin's had hinted at a story of shame as well as of sorrow perchance he remained silent troubled and perplexed by this new turn of affairs his office of consoler his attempt to smooth the tangled threads of a disordered brain came to an end all at once the woman turned from him impatiently muttering to herself as she went away he followed her along the sinuous footpath and across the garden and watched her as she entered by a low half-glass door at the back of the house he passed this door afterwards and stole a glance through the glass into a large low room where there was a fire burning a room which he divined to be the grandmother's chamber an old-fashioned tent bedstead with red and white chintz curtains occupied one side of the room a ponderous old armchair stood near the fireplace a huge wooden chest made at once a seat and a receptacle for all kinds of household stores a corner cupboard filled with crockery ware and a small round table near the hearth completed the catalogue of furniture here on the hearth rug sat muriel her wild hair falling about her face her hands clasped upon her knees her eyes bent gloomily upon the burning log the supper bell rang from the porch on the other side of the homestead while maurice was watching that melancholy figure by the hearth she has taken away my appetite for supper he said to himself and has almost set me against borsal end that last speech of muriel trevenard's troubled him ask her what she has done with my child it set him thinking of dark stories of family pride and hidden crime it took the flavour of enjoyment out of this rustic home and imparted a taint of mystery and suspicion which poisoned the atmosphere twenty three surely most bitter of all sweet things thou art maurice clissold keenly scrutinised bridget trevenard's face as they sat at supper that evening muriel's look of horror at the mention of her mother's name had inspired unpleasant doubts upon the subject of his hostess's character he remembered how elspeth had told him that mrs trevenard was known as a hard woman and he told himself that cruelty or even crime might be consistent with that hard nature which had won for the farmer's wife the reputation of a stern and exacting mistress his closer examination of that face showed him no indication of lurking evil that square unwrinkled brow those dark brown eyes with their keen straight outlook denoted at least an honest nature the firm lips the square jaw gave severity to the countenance a resolute woman a woman not to be turned from her purpose thought maurice but a woman whom he could hardly imagine capable of crime and then why give credence to the rambling assertions of lunacy it is the nature of madness to accuse the sane maurice tried to put the thought of muriel's wild talk out of his mind yet that awful question what has she done with my child haunted him he felt less desire to prolong his stay at borsal the restful tranquillity of the place seemed to have departed muriel's fevered mind had its influence upon the atmosphere he could not forget that she was near wakeful unhappy waiting for the lover who was never to return to her he took good care to lock his door that night and his slumbers were undisturbed the next morning was devoted to a long ramble with martin they walked to a distant hillside where there were some druidic remains well worth inspection came back to the farm in time for the substantial early dinner had a look at the haymakers dining plenteously in a great stone kitchen and then retired to a field where the hay was cocked to lie basking in the sun with their faces seaward dreaming away the summer afternoon here maurice told martin the story of james penwin's death and the brief love story which had come to so pitiful an ending poor child he said musingly recalling his last interview with justina i verily believe she loved him truly and honestly and would have made him a good wife i never saw a nobler countenance than that player girl's i'm sorry i thrust myself between them with so much as one hard word was no one ever suspected of the murder asked martin yes replied maurice without taking his cigar from his lips i was for a little while this was rather startling martin trevenard stared at his new acquaintance with a curious look for a moment or so before he recovered himself you were yes didn't you know my name was in the papers but i believe they did me the favour to spell it wrong perhaps i ought to have mentioned the fact when i was asking mrs trevenard to take me in 
yes i his bosom friend was the only person they could pitch upon when they wanted to find the assassin yes i have been in ebersham jail under suspicion as a murderer the charge broke down at the inquest and i came off with flying cutters i believe still there the fact remains the spinnersbury detectives put the crime down to me it would need pretty strong proof to make me suspect you said martin heartily i was a good many miles away from the spot when that cursed deed was done but it did not suit me to advertise my exact whereabouts to the world why not because to have told the truth would have been to compromise a woman the only one i ever loved as a man loves one chosen woman out of all the world martin threw away his unfinished cigar turned himself about upon the haycock which he had chosen for his couch and settled himself to hear something interesting with a bright eager look in his dark eyes tell me all about it he said bah weak sentimentality muttered maurice i should only bore you no you wouldn't i should like to hear it well naming no names and summing up the matter briefly there will be no harm done it is the story of a dead and buried folly that's all a hackneyed commonplace story enough he sighed as if the recollection hurt him a little dead as this old foolishness might be sighed and looked seaward dreamily as if he were looking back into the past you must know that when i was a year or two younger and life was fresher to me i went a good deal into what people call society didn't set my face against new acquaintances dinner parties dances and so forth as i do now i've a fair income for a bachelor belong to a good family and can hold my own position well in a crowd now amongst the houses i visited in those days there were only two or three where i went from sheer honest regard for the people i visited among these was the house of a certain fashionable physician not a hundred miles from cavendish square he was a widower with three daughters the two elder thorough women of the world and most delightful girls to know we were chums from the outset they drove me about in their barouche made me useful as an escort at flower shows a perambulatory catalogue at picture galleries and we all three comprehended perfectly that i was not to dream of marrying either of them dangerous i should think suggested martin safe as the tarpeian rock my feelings for the dear girls were of a purely fraternal character from the first i would as soon have bought the winner of the last derby for a park hack as had one of these two for my wife i went shopping with them occasionally twiddled my thumbs at peter robinson's while they turned over silks and i knew the amount of millinery required for their sustenance no martin there was no peril here unluckily there was the third daughter a tender slip of a girl hardly out of the schoolroom a child who had her gowns meted out to her by her sisters and wore perpetual white muslin for evening dress and brown holland for morning good heavens i can see her this moment standing by the piano in her holland frock with a blue ribbon twisted through her loose brown hair and those divine hazel eyes looking at me pleadingly as who should say be gentle to me you see what a child i am no worldliness here no ambition here no avid desire of millinery no set purpose of making a great marriage i said to myself only innocence and trustfulness and childlike meekness so i fell over head and ears in love with my friend's third daughter very natural said martin i don't see why it shouldn't have ended pleasantly i didn't act like a sneak make love to the girl behind her sister's backs and bide my time for winning her i went to the doctor at once told him what had happened ventured to add that i thought my darling liked me and asked his permission to offer her my hand he hummed and hawed said there was no one he would like better for a son-in-law but his youngest child was really not out of the nursery any question of an engagement was absurd it seemed only yesterday that he had bought her a shetland pony however he gave me to understand in a general way that i was free to come and go so our intimacy knew no abatement i still did the walking-stick business at flower shows and the catalogue business at exhibitions and made myself generally useful seeing a good deal of my fair blossom-like maiden in the meanwhile we met very often sat together of an evening unnoticed when the room was full and before long we knew that we loved each other and we had sworn that for us two there should be no love but this papa might say what he liked about youth and foolishness and shetland ponies we were not impatient 
we would wait for ever so many years if necessary but in good time we two should be one sweet and tender promises breathed in the twilight from lips too lovely to betray dove-like eyes lifted shyly to mine soft little hand resting so fondly within my arm i laugh when i think of you and how it all ended he did laugh bitterly savagely almost as he flung the stump of his cigar across the haycocks towards the sea martin waited in respectful silence awed by this little gust of passion well we were pledged to each other and happy this went on for a year nobody took any notice of us any more than if we had been children playing at lovers we lived in a foolish paradise of our own at least i did heaven only knows what her thoughts may have been one day when i had been away from town for a week or so i called in cavendish square saw the two elder girls and heard that my betrothed had gone for a long visit to some friends in yorkshire at a place called tilney longford a fine old country seat papa had thought her looking pale and thin and had sent her off at a day's notice she might be away two or three months lady longford was the kindest of women and was always asking them to stay at her place we can't go of course they said with our large circle but that child has no ties and can stay as long as they like to keep her this was hard upon me the privilege of correspondence was denied us for i could not write my darling a clandestine letter i went to the doctor a second time and told him that i had waited a year that i was so much deeper in love by every day of that blessed year and urged him to receive me as his daughter's suitor he treated the question rather more seriously than before repeated his assurance that i was the very man he would have liked for a son-in-law but added that he did not consider my income sufficiently large or my profession sufficiently lucrative to allow of his entrusting his daughter's happiness to my care my girls have been expensively brought up he said you have no notion what they cost me i have been too busy to teach them prudence it has been easier for me to earn money for them to waste than to find leisure to check their extravagance we live in too fast an age for the vulgar virtues i argued the point but vainly and told him that whatever decision he might arrive at his youngest daughter and i had made up our minds to be true to each other against all opposition i am sorry to hear that he replied for it will oblige me to ask you to discontinue your visits here when my little girl comes back a discourtesy which goes very much against the grain i left him in a white heat went straight off to james penwin and arranged a tour which we had been talking about ever so long we were to walk through the north of england and i was to coach poor jim for his last struggle at oxford london was hateful to me now that my darling had left it and james penwin's company the only society i cared for he paused abandoned himself to the memory of that vanished past for a little and then went on more hurriedly it was at ebersham the morning before james penwin's murder that i received the first and last letter i was ever to get from my love she had addressed it at my london lodgings and it had been travelling about after me for the last three weeks her first letter i opened it with such a thrill of joy thinking how divine it was of her to be so daring as to write to me such a broken-hearted letter telling me how a certain rich landowner near lady longford's had proposed to her she broke into a parenthesis a page long to assure me she had never given him the faintest encouragement and how everybody persuaded her to accept him and how her father himself had come down to tilney to lecture her into subjection but it is all useless she said i will marry no one but my own dear love and oh please write and tell me what i am to do think what i must have felt trevenard when i considered that the letter was three weeks old and what persecution the poor little soul might have had to suffer in the interval what did you do can you ask me i started off without a quarter of an hour's delay and got to tilney as soon as the trains could carry me it was an abominable cross-country journey and there i was eating my heart out at dismal junctions for half the day it was past three o'clock when i ended my journey of something less than a hundred miles and found myself at a detestable little station called tilney road eight miles from tilney longford and no conveyance of any kind to be had i did the distance in something under two hours and entered the park gates just as the church clock hard by was striking five you went straight to the house no i didn't want to bring trouble upon that poor child so i prowled about the place like a poacher skirting the carriage roads 
luckily for me there was a right of way through the park so i was able to get pretty close to the house without attracting any one's particular attention i reflected that unless the doctor was still there not a likely thing for a man whose moments were gold there was no one to recognize me except my poor pet as i approached the gardens i heard laughter and fresh young voices and a general hubbub on the other side of the ha-ha which divided the park from a croquet lawn there was a gaily striped marquee on one side of the lawn a group of people taking tea under a gigantic cedar and a double set of croquet players disporting on the level sward my eyes were keen as a hawk's to distinguish my dearest in mauve muslin and an innocent little chip hat trimmed with daisies i observed even details you see busily engaged with her attendant cavalier and with no appearance of being bored by his society her fresh young laugh rang out silver clear that girlish laugh which had been one of her many charms to my mind that hardly sounds like a broken heart i said to myself he sighed and waited for a minute or so and then resumed in a harder voice well i was determined to form no judgment from appearances and i could not stand on the other side of the ha-ha taking observations from the covert of an old hawthorn for ever so i went round to the back of the house waylaid a neat little abigail and asked her if she could find miss blank's maid for me i accompanied my question with a fee which ensured compliance and my pretty one's hand maiden appeared presently at the gate where i was waiting she remembered me among the intimates in cavendish square and consented to give her mistress the note i scribbled on a leaf of my pocket-book i hope i am not doing wrong sir she said but a young lady in my mistress's position cannot be too careful how she acts in what position i asked didn't you know sir my young lady is to be married the day after to-morrow that was a facer exclaimed martin it wasn't a pleasant thing to hear was it with that letter in my pocket vowing eternal fidelity the remembrance of that gay young laughter was hardly pleasant either the man i had seen on the croquet lawn was a good-looking fellow enough and then one man is so like another nowadays a woman may be constant to the type while she jilts the individual i had written to my betrothed asking her to meet me in the park at nine o'clock by a certain obelisk which i had observed on my way by nine she would be free i fancied in that half hour of liberty which the women get after dinner while the men are talking politics and pretending to be very wise about claret did she come yes poor pretty shallow-hearted thing looking very sweet in the moonlight but tearful and trembling as if she thought i should beat her she sobbed out her wretched little story papa had been so kind her elder sisters had badgered her poor reginald the lover had been so good so generous so self-sacrificing and it had ended as such things generally do end i dare say she was to be married to him the day after to-morrow and oh maurice pray give me back my letter she said for i don't know what would become of me if it ever fell into reginald's hands how did you answer her with never a word i tore the lying letter into atoms and threw them away on the summer wind i made my love a respectful bow and left her never i trust in god to see her fair false face again End of volume one chapters twenty two and twenty three volume one chapters twenty four and twenty five of a strange world by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty four we are past the season of divided ills if any one had asked maurice clissold why he had bared old wounds in the dreamy restfulness of that june afternoon in the hayfield and why he had chosen martin trevenard for his father confessor he would have been sorely puzzled to answer so natural a question that inexpressible longing to talk of himself and his own sorrows which seizes upon men now and then had laid hold of him and there had been a kind of bitter pleasure a half cynical enjoyment in going over that story of the dead past there was something sympathetic about martin too a man who might have been crossed in love himself maurice thought or who at least had a latent capacity for sincerest passion friendship had proved a plant of rapid growth in the utter solitude of borcelend maurice felt that he could talk to this young trevenard very much as he had talked to james penwin knowing very well that he might not be always understood when his flights of fancy went widest but very sure of sympathy at all times 
that afternoon was saturday and on the following morning perfect rest reigned at borsal end even the ducks seemed less noisy than usual as if their own voices startled them unpleasantly in the universal silence mr and mrs trevenard came down to the eight o'clock breakfast luxurious sabbath hour in their best clothes the farmer seeming somewhat embarrassed by the burden of respectability involved in sleek new broadcloth and a buff waistcoat starched to desperation mrs trevenard stern and even dignified of aspect in her dark grey silk gown and smart sunday cap would you like to go to church martin asked with some faint hesitation lest his new friend being something of a poet should also be something of an infidel by all means you drive i suppose as it's so far penwin church that lonely church among the hills was the nearest to borsal a good four miles off at least yes we drive to church and back mother says it goes against her to have the horse out on the sabbath but the distance is more than she could manage the morning service began at half-past ten so at half-past nine the dog-cart was at the door for there was a good deal of walking up and down hill to be allowed for driving in this part of the country being not altogether a lazy business the two young men who occupied the back seat were continually getting up and down and had walked about half the distance by the time they came to the quiet old church whose single bell clanged over the green hillside i'm blessed if the squire and mrs penwin haven't come back cried martin descrying a handsome lando and pair in front of them as they drew near the church are you sure that's the penwin carriage they were not expected three days ago said maurice quite sure we've no other gentry hereabouts except the moorgrave park people and they hardly ever are at home there is no doubt about it that is mr penwin's carriage then i'll renew my acquaintance with him after church said maurice the old grey church which he had explored two days ago had quite a gay look in its sunday guise the farmers wives and daughters in their fine bonnets the villagers with their sunburnt faces and sabbath cleanliness the servants from the manor occupying two pews under the low gallery within which dusky recess the livery of churchill penwin's serving-men gleamed gaily while the bonnets of the maids all more or less in the last parisian fashion made the shadowy corner a perfect flower-bed and most important of all in a large square pew in the chancel appeared the manor-house family churchill gentlemanlike and inscrutable with his pale thoughtful face and grave grey eyes madge looking verily the young queen of that western land and viola fair and flower-like a beauty to be worshipped so much the more for that frail loveliness which had a fatal air of evanescence i'm afraid she won't live long whispered martin to his companion in one of the pauses of the service while the purblind old clerk was hunting for the antiquated psalm tate and brady which it was his duty to give out not mrs penwin why she looks the picture of health replied maurice in a similar undertone martin coloured like a schoolboy justly suspected of felonious views in relation to apples i meant the fair one he gasped her sister she ah looks rather consumptive replied maurice heartlessly the borsal end and manor-house families met in the churchyard after the service borsal end respectful and not intrusive the manor-house kindly cordial even with no taint of patronage in sooth michael trevenard was the best tenant a landowner could have a man who was always improving his holding and paid his rent to the hour a man to take the chair at audit dinners and stumble through a proposal of his landlord's help you didn't expect to see us so soon did you mrs trevenard said madge with her bright smile but we all grew tired of town in the middle of the season we're always glad to see you back said michael screwing up his courage and jerking out the words as if they were likely to choke him the place doesn't seem home-like when there's no family at the manor house you see we were accustomed to see the old squire pottering about the place from year's end to year's end and entering into every little bit of improvement we made and as familiar you know as if he was one of ourselves that spoiled us a bit i make no doubt it shall not be my fault if you do not come to consider me one of yourselves in good time mr trevenard said churchill kindly kindly but without that real heartiness which makes a country gentleman popular among his vassals maurice was standing in the background and it was only at this moment that mr penwin recognized him something like a spasm of pain changed his face for a moment as if some unwelcome memory was suddenly brought back to him 
natural enough thought maurice the last time we met was at his cousin's funeral and it is hardly a pleasant idea for any man that he stands in the shoes of the untimely dead that momentary flush of pain passed mr penwin welcomed the stranger in the land with exceeding cordiality how long have you been in cornwall mr clissold he asked you ought not to come to penwin without putting up at the manor house you are very good i have been to the manor house and ventured to put forward my acquaintance with you as a reason why your faithful old housekeeper should let me see your house i dare say she has forgotten to mention the fact there has been scarcely time we only arrived last night let me present you to my wife madge this is mr clissold of whom you have heard me speak mr clissold mrs penwin her sister miss bellingham madge acknowledged the introduction with something less than her accustomed sweetness although churchill was so thoroughly convinced of the man's innocence madge had not quite made up her mind that he was guiltless of his friend's blood he had been suspected and the taint clung to him yet still when she looked at the dark earnest eyes the open brow the firm mouth with its expression of subdued power the countenance on which thought had exercised its reclining influence she began to think that churchill must be right in this opinion as in all other things and that this man was incapable of crime so when after questioning mr clissold as to his whereabouts churchill asked him to go back to the manor house with them for luncheon and to bring his friend martin trevenard madge seconded the invitation if mrs trevenard can spare her son for a few hours she added graciously mrs trevenard curtsied and thanked mrs penwin for her condescension but added that she did not hold with young people keeping company with their superiors and thought that martin would be better at home in his own sphere if i had ever seen good come of it i might think differently said the farmer's wife with a gloomy look but i never have martin looked angry and his father embarrassed i hope you'll excuse my wife for being so free-spoken mr trevenard said in a rather clumsy apology she doesn't mean to be uncivil but there are points here he came aground hopelessly and could only repeat in a feeble tone there are points thanks for your kind invitation mr penwin said martin still flushed with shame and anger but you see i'm not supposed to have a will of my own yet awhile i must do as my mother tells me come along old lady said michael and after making their salaams to the quality the borsaland party retired to the dog-cart the horse had been tethered on the sward near at hand browsing calmly throughout the hour and a half service maurice drove off with the penwins in the lando what a very disagreeable person that mrs trevenard seems said madge i should think it could be hardly pleasant staying in her house mr clissold she is eccentric rather than disagreeable i think replied maurice a woman with a fixed idea which governs all her conduct i had hard work to persuade her to let me stop at the farm but she has been an excellent hostess and her son martin is a capital fellow one of nature's gentlemen yes i liked his manner except when he got so angry with his mother but she was really too provoking with her preachment about equality more especially as these trevenards belong to a good old cornish family do they not churchill yes love by tray pole and pen you may know the cornish men i believe these are some of the original trays admirable tenants too one can hardly make too much of them do you know anything about their daughter asked maurice of mr penwin yes i have heard of her but never seen her a poor half-witted creature i believe not half-witted but deranged her brain has evidently been turned by some great sorrow from what i can gather she must have loved someone superior to her in rank and been ill-treated by him i fancy this is why mrs trevenard says bitter things about inequality of station an all-sufficient reason i shall never feel angry with mrs trevenard again said madge the manor house looked much gayer and brighter to-day with servants passing to and fro great bowls of roses on all the tables banks of flowers in the windows new books scattered on the tables holland covers banished to the limbo of household stores and two pretty women lending the charm of their presence to the scene never had maurice clissold seen husband and wife so completely happy or more entirely suited to each other than these two seemed domestic life at penwin manor house was like an idol 
simple unaffected happiness showed itself in every look in every word and tone there was just that amount of plenteousness and luxury in all things which makes life smooth and pleasant without the faintest ostentation a certain subdued comfort reigned everywhere and churchill in no wise fell into the common errors of men who have suffered a sudden elevation to wealth he neither talked rich nor told his friends with a deprecating shrug of his shoulders that he had just enough for bread and cheese in a word he took things easily as a husband he was in viola's words simply perfect it was impossible to imagine devotedness more thorough yet less obtrusive his face never turned towards his wife without brightening like a landscape in a sudden gleam of sunlight there was nothing that could be condemned as spooning between these married lovers yet no one would fail to understand that they were all the world to each other viola had long since altered her mind about mr penwin from thinking him not quite nice she had grown to consider him adorable to her he had been all generosity and kindness treating her in every way as if she had been his own sister and a sister well beloved she had the prettiest possible suite of rooms at penwin a horse of churchill's own choosing her own piano her own maid and more pocket money than she had ever had in her life before it comes rather hard upon churchill to have two young women to provide for instead of one viola remarked to her sister but he is so divinely good about it she was a young lady who delighted in strong adverbs that i hardly realize what a sponge i am and then came sisterly embracings and protestations thus the penwin manor people were altogether the happiest of families maurice thoroughly enjoyed his day at penwin after luncheon they all rambled about the grounds churchill and his wife always side by side so that the guest had the pretty miss bellingham for his companion it might be dangerous for another man he said to himself but i've had my lesson no more fair soft beauties for me if ever i suffer myself to fall in love again it shall be with a girl who looks as if she could knock me down if i offended her a girl with as much character in her face as the actress poor james was so fond of of the two i think i would rather have clytemnestra than helen i dare say menelaus believed his wife a pattern of innocence and purity till he woke one morning and found she had levanted with paris thus secure from the influence of her attractions mr clissold made himself very much at home with miss bellingham she showed him all the beauties of penwin spots where a glimpse of the sea looked brightest through a break in the pine grove hollows where the ferns grew deepest and greenest and proved a very different guide from elspeth i have been through the grounds before said maurice but on that occasion my companion did not enhance the beauties of nature by the charm of her society who was your companion the granddaughter of the woman at the lodge rather curious people are they not yes i have often wondered how my brother came to pick them up for they are not natives of the soil as almost every one else is at penwin but churchill says the old woman is a very estimable person well worthy of her post so one can say no more about it when maurice wanted to take leave his new friends insisted that he should stay to dinner mr penwin offering to send him home in a dog-cart this favour however the sturdy pedestrian steadfastly declined i am not afraid of a night walk across the hills he said and i'm getting as familiar with the country about here as if i were to the manor born so he stayed and assisted at mrs penwin's kettledrum which was held in the old squire's yew-tree bower on the bowling green an arbour made of dense walls of evergreen cool in summer and comfortably sheltered in winter here they drank tea lazily enjoying the freshening breeze from the great wide sea the sea which counts so many argosies for her spoil the mighty atlantic here they talked of literature and the world and rapidly progressed in friendliness but not one word was said of james penwin who save for that shot fired from behind a hedge would have been master of grounds and bower manor and all thereto belonging that was a thought which flashed more than once across maurice's mind how happy these people seem in the possession of a dead man's goods he thought how placidly they enjoy his belongings how coolly they accept fate's awful decree only human nature i suppose les morts durent bien peu laissons les sous la pierre he stayed till ten o'clock and left charmed with host and hostess 
churchill penwin had been at his best all day a man whose talk was worth hearing and whose opinions were not feeble echoes of saturday's literary journals after dinner they had music as well as conversation and madge played some of mozart's finest church music choice bits culled from the masses how long do you stay in cornwall was the question at parting about a week longer at borsal end i suppose but i am my own master as to time i have no legitimate profession for i believe literature hardly comes under that head and am therefore something of a bohemian not in a bad sense miss bellingham so please don't look alarmed why not come to us instead of staying at borsal end asked churchill you are too good but i could hardly do that when i offered myself to mrs trevenard as a lodger i said i should stay a week or two and she is just the kind of woman to feel wounded if i left her abruptly and then martin and i are great friends he is really one of the best fellows i ever met except except the friend i lost he added quickly and huskily feeling that any allusion of that kind was ill-judged here well you must do just as you please about it but give us as much of your company as you can we shall have a dinner next week i believe saturday said madge you will come to us then of course and as often in the meanwhile as you can thanks the dinner party is out of the question i travel with a knapsack and am three hundred miles from my dress suit but if you will allow me to drop in now and then between this and saturday i shall be delighted twenty five the drowsy night grows on the world the advent of the manor house family made life all the more pleasant to mr clissold at borsal end it imparted variety to his existence and the homely comfort of the farmhouse was agreeably contrasted by the refinement of mr penwin's surroundings he dined at penwin twice during the week and as he became more familiar with the interior of churchill's home only saw fresh proofs of its perfect happiness here were a man and a woman who made the most and the best of wealth and position and shed an atmosphere of contentment around them with martin for his companion maurice saw all that was worth seeing within the reach of borsal end they drove to seacombe the nearest market town and explored the church there which was old and full of interest here in looking over the register for some name of world-wide renown maurice stumbled upon an entry that aroused his curiosity it was in the register of baptisms emily jane daughter of matthew elgood comedian and jane elgood his wife the date was just eighteen years ago matthew elgood that girl's father was matthew thought maurice can it be the same man i wonder yes matthew elgood comedian there would hardly be two men of the same name and calling his daughter must be the age of the child baptized here for i remember james telling me that she was just seventeen the infant was certainly recorded in the register as emily jane and the young actress's name was justina but mr clissold concluded that this was merely a fictitious appellation chosen for euphony he made up his mind that the child entered in these old yellow pages and the girl he had seen weeping for his friend's untimely death were one and the same strange that the sweetheart of james penwin's choice had been born so near the cradle of his own race it was as if there had been some subtle sympathy between these children of the same soil and their hearts had gone forth to each other spontaneously is there a theatre at seacombe asked maurice wondering how that quiet old town could have afforded a field for mr elgood's talents not now replied martin there used to be some years ago the building exists still but it has been converted into a chapel it answers better than the theatre did i believe the week came to an end maurice attended a second service at penwin church and paid a farewell visit to the manor house on sunday afternoon this time he refused mr penwin's hearty invitation to dinner and wished his new friends good-bye shortly after luncheon with cordial expressions of friendship on both sides he walked across the hills ruminating upon all that had happened since he first followed that track with elspeth for his guide he had made acquaintance with the interior of two families since then in both of which he felt considerable interest churchill penwin must be a thoroughly good fellow he said to himself or he would never have behaved so well as he has to me it would have been so natural for him to be prejudiced against me by that business at ebersham but he has not only done me the justice to disbelieve the accusation from the very first 
he has taken pains to let me see i am in no way damaged in his opinion by the suspicion that has attached to me maurice had made up his mind to leave borsal end next day he had thoroughly explored the neighbourhood and thoroughly enjoyed the tranquil pastoral life of the farmhouse and he saw no reason for delaying his departure to fresher scenes mrs trevenard had heard of his resolution with indifference her husband with civil regret martin with actual sorrow i don't know how i shall get on when you are gone he said it has been so nice to have some one to talk to whose ideas rise above threshing machines and surface drainage father's a good old soul but he and i have precious little to say to each other now with you the longest day seems short i think you've taught me more since we've been together than all i learnt at hellstone no martin i haven't taught you anything i've only stirred up the old knowledge that was in you hidden like stagnant water under duckweed answered maurice but we are not going to bid each other good-bye for ever i shall come down to borsal end again you may be very sure if your people will let me and whenever you come to london you must take up your quarters with me and i'll show you some of the pleasantest part of london life maurice really regretted parting from the young man who had been the brightest and most light-hearted of companions and he regretted leaving borsal end without knowing a little more of muriel trevenard's history he had thought a good deal upon this family's secret during the past week though in all his wanderings about the old neglected garden or down in the wilderness of hazel by the pond and he had smoked many a cigar there in the interval he had never again encountered muriel he had no reason to suppose there was any undue restraint placed upon her movements or that she was unkindly treated by any one yet the thought that she was there a part of the family yet divided from it banished from the home circle yet so near cut off from all the simple pleasures of her father's hearth haunted him at all times he was thinking of her this afternoon during his lonely walk across the hills she was more in his thoughts than the people he had left it was past six o'clock when he entered the old hall at borsal end and he was struck at once by the quietude of the place the corner where old mrs trevenard was wont to sit was empty this evening the hearth was newly swept as it always seemed to be and the fire not unacceptable on this dull grey afternoon burned bright and red the table was laid with a composite kind of meal on one side a small tea-tray on the other the ponderous sunday sirloin and a tempting salad a meal prepared for himself maurice felt sure the maid-servant entered from the adjoining kitchen at the sound of his footsteps oh if you please sir they're all gone to tea at limestone farm mr spurcombe at limestone is an old friend of master's and missus said if you should happen to come home before they did would you please to make yourself comfortable and i was to lay tea for you your mistress hardly expected me i suppose i don't think she did sir she said she thought you'd dine up at penwin most likely maurice was not long about his evening meal perhaps he made shorter work of it than he might have done otherwise perceiving that the maid was longing for the moment when she might clear the table and slip away by the back door to her sunday evening tryst maid servants at borsal were kept very close and were almost always under the eye of their mistress yet as a rule the borsal and domestic always had her young man maurice heard the back door shut stealthily and felt sure that the kitchen was deserted he drew his chair nearer to the hearth lighted a cigar and abandoned himself to idle thought end of volume one chapters twenty four and twenty five volume one chapters twenty six and twenty seven of a strange world by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty six good night good rest ah neither be my share maurice clissold sat for some time smoking and musing by the hearth sat till the light faded outside the diamond-paned windows and the shadows deepened within the room he might have sat on longer had he not been surprised by the opening of a door in that angle of the hall which was sacred to age and infirmity in the person of old mrs trevenard it was the door of her room which had opened have they come back yet asked her feeble old voice no ma'am answered maurice not yet can i do anything for you no sir it's the strange gentleman mr mr clissold yes ma'am won't you come to your old place by the fire no 
i've my fire in here thank you kindly but the place seems so lonesome when they're away i'm not much of one to talk myself but i like to hear voices the hours seem so long without them you can come in if you please sir my room is kept tidy i believe i should fret if i thought it wasn't the old woman was standing on the threshold of the door opening between the two rooms maurice had risen to offer her assistance come in and sit down a bit she said pleased at having found some one to talk to for it was a notorious fact at borsal end that old mrs trevenard always had a great deal more to say for herself when her daughter-in-law was out of the way than she had in the somewhat freezing presence of that admirable housewife maurice complied and entered the room which he had observed through the half-glass door a comfortable homely room enough in the light of an excellent fire old mrs trevenard required a great deal of warmth she went back to her armchair and motioned her visitor to a seat on the other side of the hearth. "'It's very kind of you to be troubled with an old woman like me,' she mumbled. "'I dare say you could tell me plenty of interesting stories about Borsolend if you were inclined, Mrs. Trevenard,' said Maurice. "'Ah, there's a few houses without a history. Few women of my age that haven't seen a good deal of family troubles and family secrets.' the best thing an old woman can do is to hold her tongue that's what my daughter-in-law is always telling me least said soonest mended ah thought maurice the dowager has been warned against being over-communicative contemplating the room more at his leisure now that he had done from outside he perceived a picture hanging over the chimney-piece which he had not noticed before it was a commonplace portrait enough by some provincial limner's hand the portrait of a young woman in a gypsy hat and flowered damask gown a picture that was perhaps a century old is that picture over the chimney a portrait of one of your son's family ma'am asked maurice yes that's my husband's mother justina trevenard justina the name startled him so uncommon a name and to find it here in the trevenard family that's a curious name he said and one which recalls a person I met under peculiar circumstances. Have you had many Justinas in the Trevenard family since that day? No, there was never anybody christened after her. I met your granddaughter in the garden the other night, Mrs. Trevenard, said Maurice, determined to find out whether this blind woman was a friend to Muriel. And I was grieved to see her in so sad a condition. Muriel! yes poor girl it's very sad sad for all of us answered the old woman with a sigh saddest of all for her father he was so proud of that girl spared no money to make her a lady and now he can't bear to see her it wounds him too deep to see such a wreck yet he won't have her away from the house he likes to know that she's near him and as well cared for as she can be in her state it must have been a great sorrow that so changed her it was more sorrow than she could bear poor child though others have borne harder things she was crossed in love her brother told me yes yes crossed in love that was it the young man that she loved died young and she was told of it suddenly the shock turned her brain she had a fever and every one thought she was going to die she got the better of the illness but her senses never came back to her she's quite harmless as you've seen i dare say but she has her fancies and one is to think that the young man she was fond of is still alive and that he'll keep his promise and come back to her maurice told mrs trevenard of his first night at borsalend and the intrusion which had shortened his slumbers ah to think that she should have happened to find her way there that night close as we keep her my door is always locked and she can't get out into the house without coming through this room but i suppose that night i must have forgotten to take the key out of the door and put it under my pillow as i do mostly and the poor child went roaming about the house by moonlight that's an old trick of hers the room where you sleep was her room once upon a time and she always goes there if she gets the chance 
it was unlucky that it should have happened the first night of your being here she is very fond of you i suppose said maurice anxious to hear more of one in whom he felt a strong interest yes i think she likes me better than any one else now better even than her own mother why yes she does not get on very well with her mother she has odd fancies about her i thought as much i have heard her speak of a child that was a mere delusion i conclude yes that was one of her fancies has mrs trevenard never consulted any medical man upon the state of her daughter's mind medical man repeated the old woman dubiously you mean a doctor i suppose yes dr mitchell from seacombe has seen the poor child many a time and given her physic for this that and the other but he says her mind will never be any different there's no use worrying about that he gives her stuff for her appetite sometimes for she has but a poor appetite at the best she's sorely wasted away from the figure she was once upon a time she was a very beautiful girl i have heard from martin yes i never saw a handsomer girl than muriel when she came from school it was all along of sending her to boarding-school things went wrong how do you mean oh dear me sir you mustn't listen to my rambling talk i'm a weak old woman and i dare say my mind goes astray sometimes just like muriel's a light step sounded on the narrow stairs a door in the panelling opened and the figure maurice had first seen in the spectral light of the moon came towards the hearth and crouched down at the grandmother's knees a slender figure dressed in a light-coloured gown which looked white in the uncertain flare of the fire a pale worn face a mass of tangled hair muriel took the old woman's withered hand laid her hollow cheek against it and kissed it fondly granny she murmured patient loving granny muriel's only friend mrs trevenard smoothed the dark hair with her tremulous hand how tangled it is muriel why won't you let me brush it and keep it nice for you my poor old hands can do that without the help of eyes why should it be made smooth or nice he isn't coming back yet see here granny you shall dress me the day he comes home all in white with myrtle in my hair like a bride i would have orange blossoms if i knew where to get any there are some orange trees up at the manor house i'll ask him to bring me some i was never dressed like a bride oh muriel muriel so full of fancies ah but there are some of them real too real where is the old cradle that my little brother used to sleep in i don't know darling in the loft perhaps they should have burnt it i peeped into the loft one day and saw it in a corner the old cradle it set me thinking such strange thoughts she remained silent for a few minutes still crouching at her grandmother's knees and with her hollow eyes fixed on the low fire didn't you hear a child cry she asked suddenly looking up with a listening face first at the old woman then at maurice didn't you granny no love i heard nothing didn't you then to maurice no indeed ah you are all of you deaf i hear that crying so often a poor little feeble voice it comes and goes like the wind in the long winter nights but it sounds so distant why doesn't it come nearer why doesn't it come close to us that we may take the child in and comfort it ah muriel muriel so full of fancies repeated the old woman like the burden of an ancient ballad the sound of doors opening and loud voices announced the return of the family you'd better go back to the hall sir bridget won't like to find you here with her said mrs trevenard in a hurried whisper pointing to the figure leaning against her knees maurice obeyed without a word his last look at muriel showed him the great haggard eyes gazing at the fire the wasted hand clasped upon the grandmother's knee he left borsal early next morning martin insisting upon bearing him company for the first few miles of his journey he had paid liberally for his entertainment rewarded the servant and parted upon excellent terms with mr and mrs trevenard and the blind grandmother 
but he saw no more of muriel and it was with her image that borsal end was most associated in his mind when he was parting with martin he ventured to speak of her for the first time since that conversation in the dog-cart martin i am going to say something which will perhaps offend you but it is something i can't help saying i don't think there's much fear of offence between you and me at least not on my side i am not so sure of that some subjects are hazardous even between friends you remember our talk about your sister well i have seen her twice since then never mind how or where and i am more interested at her sad story than i can well express to you it seems to me that there is something in that story which you her only brother ought to know or in a word that she has need of your love and protection do not suppose for a moment that i would insinuate anything against your father and mother they have doubtless done their duty to her according to their lights but it is just possible that she has need of more active friendship more sympathetic affection than they can give she clings to her old grandmother a fading succour when old mrs trevenard dies your sister will lose a natural nurse and protector it will be your duty to lighten that loss for her to interpose your love between her and the sense of desolation that may then arise you are not angry with me for saying so much angry with you no indeed you set me thinking that's all poor muriel i used to be so fond of her when i was a little chap and perhaps i have thought too little about her of late years my mother doesn't like any interference upon that point doesn't even like me to talk of my poor sister and so i've gotten into the way of taking things for granted and holding my tongue honestly if i had thought there was anything to be done for muriel that she could be better off than she is or happier than she is i should have been the first to make the attempt to bring about that improvement but my mother has always told me there was nothing to be done except submit to the will of providence your mother may be right martin it is not for me a stranger in your home to gainsay her but your sister's case seems to me most pitiful and it will be long before i shall get her image out of my mind if ever there should come a time when you may need the advice or the assistance of a man of the world upon that subject be very sure my best services will be at your disposal and whenever you come to london on business or on pleasure remember that you are to make my home yours i shall take you at your word but you are more likely to come back to borsal than i am to come to london for mind i count upon your coming next summer and now you are so thick with the manor-house people you've some inducement for coming added martin with the faintest touch of bitterness there is temptation enough for me at borsal end martin without any question of the manor-house martin shook his head incredulously miss bellingham is too pretty to be left out of the question he said miss bellingham a mere dresden china beauty a very fine specimen of human waxwork i have told you my adventure in that line martin i'm not likely to make a second venture they parted with the friendliest farewell and maurice felt that he was leaving something more than a chance acquaintance behind him at borsal end twenty seven such a lord is love nothing could be more perfect than that serenity which ruled the domestic life of penwin manor the judgment which maurice clissold had formed of that life as seen from the outside was fully confirmed by its inner everyday aspect mr and mrs penwin had no company manners they did not pose themselves before a stranger as model husband and wife and settle their small differences at their leisure in the sanctuary of the ladies dressing-room or the gentlemen's study they had no differences but lived in each other and for each other yet so impossible is perfect happiness to erring mortality even here there was a hitch affection the most devoted peace that knew not so much as a summer cloud across its fair horizon these there were truly but not quite happiness madge penwin had discovered somehow by some subtle power of intuition given to anxious wives that the husband she loved so fondly was not altogether happy that he had his hours of lassitude and depression when the world seemed to him like hamlet's world out of joint his dark moments when even she had no spell that could exorcise his demon vainly she sought a cause for these changeful moods was he tired of her had he mistaken his own feelings when he chose her for his wife no even when perplexed by his fitful spirits she could not doubt his love that revealed itself with true simple force 
she knew him well enough to know that his love for her was the diviner half of his nature once on the eve of an event which was to complete the sacred circle of their home life when her nature was most sensitive and she clung to him with a pathetic dependence madge ventured to speak of her husband's intervals of gloom i'm afraid there is something wanting even in your life churchill she said gently fearful lest she should touch some old wound that you are not quite happy at penwin not happy my dear love if i am not happy here and with you there is no such thing as happiness for me why should i not be happy i have no wish unfulfilled except perhaps some dim half-formed aspiration to make my name famous an idea with which most young men begin life and which i can well afford to let stand over for future consideration while i make the most of the present here with you but churchill you know that i would not stand between you and ambition you must know how more than proud any success of yours would make me yes dearest and by and by i will put up for seacomb and try to make a little character in the house for your sake replied mr penwin with a yawn it's a wonderful thing how ambitious a man feels while he has his living to win and only his own wits to help him then indeed the distant blast of fame's trumpet is a sound that wakes him early in the morning and keeps him at his post in the night watches but then fame means income position the world's esteem all the good things of life the penniless struggler knows he must be caesar or nothing give the same man a comfortable estate like penwin and fame becomes a mere addendum to his life an ornament which vanity may desire but which hardly weighs against the delight of idle days and nights that know not care in short darling since i won fortune and you i have grown somewhat forgetful of the dreams i cherished when i was a struggling bachelor is it regret for those old dreams that makes you so gloomy sometimes churchill i do not regret them i regret nothing i am not gloomy said churchill eagerly never question my happiness madge joy is a spirit too subtle to endure a doubter's analysis god forbid that you and i should be otherwise than utterly happy oh my dear love never doubt me let us live for each other and let me at least be sure that i have made your life all sunshine it has never known a cloud since our betrothal churchill except when i have thought you depressed and despondent neither depressed nor despondent madge only thoughtful a man whose early days have been for the most part given up to thinking must have his hours of thoughtfulness now and then and perhaps my life here has smacked a little too much of the lotus land i must begin to look about me and take more interest in the estate in short follow in the footsteps of my worthy grandfather the old squire as soon as i can add the respectable name of father to my qualifications for the post that time came before the sickle had been put to the last patch of corn upon the uplands above penwin manor the halting bell of penwin church rang out its shrill peal one august morning and the little world within earshot of the manor knew that the squire rejoiced in the coming of his first-born there were almost as many bonfires in the district that summer night out flaring the mellow harvest moon as at penzance on the eve of st john the evangelist the first-born was a son whose advent the newspapers local and metropolitan duly recorded at penwin manor august twenty fifth the wife of churchill penwin esq of a son nugent churchill the newcomers names had been settled beforehand the sweet thing exclaimed lady chesant when she read the announcement in the reading-room of a german kursaal i feel as if she had made me a grandmother and lady chesant wrote straight off to her silversmith and ordered him to make the handsomest thing in christening cups and sent a six-page letter to mrs penwin by the same post requesting in a manner that amounted to a command that she might be represented by proxy as sponsor to the infant the child's coming gave new brightness to the domestic horizon viola was in raptures this young nephew was the first baby that had ever entered into the sum of her daily life she seemed to regard him as a phenomenon very much as grave fellows of the zoological society regarded the first hippopotamus born in regent's park madge saw no more clouds on her husband's brow after that gentle remonstrance of hers indeed he took pains to demonstrate his perfect contentment his naturally energetic character reasserted itself he threw himself heart and soul into that one ambition of the old squire the improvement and aggrandizement of the penwin estate 
he made a fine road across those lonely hills and planted the land on both sides of it with scotch and norwegian firs wherever there was ground available for plantation the young groves arose as if by magic giving a new charm to the face of the landscape and a new source of revenue to the lord of the soil mr penwin also interested himself in the mining property and finding his agent an easy-going incapable sort of person took the collection of the royalty into his own hands much to the improvement of his income people shrugged their shoulders and said that the new squire was just such another as old nick meaning the late nicholas penwin but careful as he was of his own interest churchill did not prove himself an illiberal landlord or a bad paymaster those plantations and new roads of his gave employment enough to use up all the available labor of the district and impart new prosperity to the neighborhood when he suggested an improvement to a tenant he was always ready to assist in carrying it out he renewed leases to good tenants upon the easiest terms but was merciless in the expulsion of bad tenants he was just one of those landlords who do most to improve the condition of an estate and the people on it and in ireland would inevitably have met with a violent death the Celts of western England took matters more quietly, abused him a good deal, owned that he was the right sort of man for the improvement of the soil, and submitted to fate which had given them King Stork rather than King Log for their ruler. When the election came on, Mr. Penwin put himself into nomination for Seacombe and came in with flying colors. All the trading classes voted for him out of self-interest. He had spent more money in the town than any one of his name had ever expended there. Madge's popularity secured the lower classes. Her schools were the admiration of the district, and she was raising up a model village between old Penwin and the manor house. Madge's folly, Mr. Penwin called the pretty cluster of cottages on the slope of the hill, but he allowed his wife to draw upon his balance to any extent she pleased, and never grumbled at the builder's bills or troubled her by suggesting that the money she was laying out was likely to produce something less than two per cent so churchill penwin wrote himself down m p and might be fairly supposed to have conquered all good things which fortune could bestow upon a deserving member of burke's landed gentry he had a fair young wife who won love and honour from all who knew her his infant heir was esteemed a model of all that is most excellent in babyhood his sister-in-law believed in him as the most wonderful and admirable of husbands and men his estate prospered his plantations grew and flourished the vast atlantic itself was as a lake beneath his windows and seemed to call him lord no cloud were it but the bigness of a man's hand obscured the brightness of his sky mr and mrs penwin spent their second season in town with greater distinction than their first more people were anxious to know them more exalted invitation cards showered in upon them and churchill who had been a successful man even in the days of his poverty felt that he had then only tasted the skimmed milk of success and that this which was offered to his lips to-day was the cream there was a subtle difference in the manner of his reception by the same world nowadays if he had been only a country gentleman with the ability to make a furnished house in belgravia the difference might have been slight enough or indeed the advantage might have been on the side of the portionless barrister with his way to make in life and his chances of success before him but churchill's maiden speech had been a success he had developed a special capacity for committees had shown slow-going county members how to get through their work in about one-fifth of the time they had been in the habit of giving to it had proved himself a master of railway and mining economics in a word without noise or bluster or assumption had infused something of transatlantic go-aheadishness into all the business to which he put his hand men in high places marked him as a young man worth cultivating and thus before the session was over churchill penwin had tasted the first fruits of parliamentary success perhaps if ever a man went in danger of being spoiled by a wife churchill penwin was that man madge simply worshipped him to hear him praised to see him honoured was to her of all praise and honour the highest she shaped all the circumstances of her life to suit his interest and his convenience chose her acquaintance at his bidding would have given up the greatest party of the season to sit by his side in the dingy eaton square study copying paragraphs out of a blue book for his use and advantage churchill on his side was careful not to impose upon devotion so unselfish and was never prouder than in assisting at his wife's small social triumphs he chose the colours of her dresses and took as much interest in her toilet as in the state of the mining market 
he never seemed so happy as in those rare evenings which he contrived to spend alone with madge or in hearing some favourite opera with her and going quietly home afterwards to a snug little tete-a-tete -tete supper while viola was dancing to her heart's content under the wing of some good-natured chaperon like lady chesunt that friendly dowager was enraptured with her protege's domestic life my sweet love you renew one's belief in arcadia she exclaimed to madge after her enthusiastic fashion i positively must buy you a crook and a lamb or two to lead about with blue ribbons you are the simplest of darlings to see how you worship that husband of yours puts me in mind of bosses and what's his name and all that kind of thing and to think that i should have taken such trouble to warn you against this very man but then who could imagine that young penwin would have been so good-natured as to die when are you coming to see me at the manor lady chesunt asked madge laughing at her friend's raptures you can form no fair idea of my domestic happiness in london you must see me at home in my arcadia with my crook and flock you dear child i shall certainly come in august i'm so glad you must be sure to come before the twenty-fifth that's nugent's birthday you know and i mean to give a pastoral fete in honour of the occasion and you will see all my cottagers and their children and the rough miners and discover what a curious kingdom we reign over in the west my dearest love i detest poor people and tenants and cottagers but i shall come to see you End of Volume 1, Chapters 26 and 27